The episode starts with one of the top hunter training institutions Valhalla. Every year countless hunters apply so that they carry the name of Valhalla on their backs. For every 500 applicants, only one person gets admitted. In the challenging journey, not even 150 individuals succeed in graduating with the title of Valhalla. The competition begins as soon as the orientation starts. Valhalla's highest ranking compact instructor, Lee Sangchiol, is watching the competition. He thinks there's a heavy workload for a reason. While he is observing, the successor of the Yushin family, Yu Minjun, comes to see him. He belongs to one of the top families in Korea. Lee Sangchiol asks Yu Minjun if he has come here to see his nephew Yu Soyeon. He tells him that in the Yushin family, there is great anticipation regarding Soyeon, with high expectations placed upon her. Yu Soyeon is a smart individual born into the Yushin family, one of the best families in Korea. At the age of 10, she could wield mana comparable to that of high schoolers. At the age of 13, she was able to add mana to her sword. At the age of 16, she competed against Yushin family members and emerged as the winner. Lee asked him if there was anything else to share because everything was already mentioned in her data sheet. Minjun said that she could communicate with the guardian constellation of the Yushin family. Lee is surprised to hear this. Certainly, that's the reason there are high expectations from her. Korea has five families because the guardian constellations are associated with each other, forming a unique bond among them. In the usual course, hunters receive blessings or enter into contracts with a guardian constellation. However, the guardian constellations of the five families were different from other constellations. However, the Yushin family's sword god, the Jangsen family's spear saint, the Choijin family's Dao king, the Osun family's fist king, the Dajin family's bow god, the members of the five families were given blessings from their prospective constellation and were granted more talent and abilities than others. Instructor Lee says she must be a genius to talk to the guardian constellation. Minjun inquires about the well-being of his nephew, noting that it seems she hasn't begun yet. He looks at his nephew and says she's ready to start. Minjun tells him to display it on the screen. The Yushin family's eldest daughter Yu Suyon is currently in a battle against Kim Ju Hayuk. Lee remarks that they seem quite calm. Kim Ju Hayek doesn't seem to have any fighting spirit. Min Jun responds, asking if Kim Ju Hayek admitted defeat, knowing Su Yon's strength. As soon as the war commences, she runs to engage in combat. Lee praises her for possessing a refined sword technique and exceptional control over mana at such a young age. After some time, everyone is astonished to see Kim Jo Hayek defeat her in just one round. He wonders why everyone is so fragile. 300 years ago, Kim Hyun Oh, also known as Martial God, fought against Barch, boss of the Tower of Destruction, to stop the world's destruction, and he killed the God of Destruction, Barch. The screen appears before him and states that he destroys the tower by killing the tower's boss. After seeing this, he ponders whether the tower is being destroyed because he killed the tower's boss. He reflects that he has always lived a busy life, working as a hunter since he was little. Just when he has made some money and gained recognition, something unexpected happens. He wonders if he should have brought his disciples after all. No, if there is one undeniable thing, it is strength. Even if they had come along, they would have met a tragic fate. Undoubtedly, strength is an undeniable attribute in his perspective. 300 years ago, after defeating the boss of the Tower of Destruction, Kim Hyun Oh found himself reincarnated into the body of a 17-year-old, navigating a new chapter in life. He is satisfied with his reincarnation. However, his body is weaker and younger. His knowledge from when he was known as the martial god remains intact. If he can adjust to this body, he believes he will be able to live a life of luxury and leisure until an unexpected translucent window disrupts his expectations. The screen displays a warning. A tower of destruction will emerge in five years. After reading this, he regrets a missed opportunity. He thinks he should have thrown Barch into the lava when he had the chance. Recreating it now will stay the same. In his renewed attempt, his resolve is firm he aims to obliterate the tower entirely and subsequently lead a life of luxury and comfort. Then, the screen states another message asks him to reclaim his weapons and memories in the third floor fifth room to the right of Valhalla. With a clear understanding of the concept of weapons but uncertain about memories, he decides his first task is to locate a place called Valhalla. On the fourth day, the top 10 competition begins, and the announcement is made for those who participated to come to the floor. Hearing the announcement, Kim Hayek ponders whether he should go or not, 
and in the end, he stands in front of his competitor. Lee remarks that today, there are more people than ever because the destinies of all five families converge at this moment. This gathering is also because of the popularity of the newcomer Kim Ju Hyuk. The eldest son of the Osun family, Oh Seuk, stands as Kim Ju Hyuk's opponent. He asks himself if this is the same person who defeated Soyeon on the first day. Then he ponders that he hasn't seen him much before. If he beats him, his prestige and reputation will rise. He says to Ju Hyuk that he will destroy him and the match begins. Seuk isn't very good at literature, strategy, or martial arts. However, he still has a talent above everyone else. He is very powerful and can do what others can't without mana. And even with little training, he becomes exponentially more potent. He is born with a top-tier physique that requires no effort. He is worthy of being called a genius from that alone. And the fight begins. Kim Hayek believes his natural physical strength is impressive and genuine, even if he lacks in other areas. He thinks their body gives them a real advantage in a purely physical fight. It doesn't guarantee he'll win, even if he's more robust. Success depends on more than just physical strength. He is winning through his mastery of martial arts. The skill of keenly observing the opponent is crucial in martial arts. Lack of harmony leads to conflict, and he strikes him down. He recognizes a relative decrease in strength compared to their previous existence. However, he remains confident that this disparity should not hinder their ability to hunt monsters and resume the role of a hunter drawing parallels to their past endeavors. Everyone is surprised, and the news reporters are talking about it. Sayok falls down, and surprisingly, he gets hit again as he falls. It's unexpected because nobody thought such a simple attack beat him. Sayok's dad, the head of the Osun family's first king, O Chulshin, gets really mad when he sees the fight. People say that even if Sayok just focused on getting strong and didn't learn any martial arts, he could easily dodge a punch from any of his friends. But he can't dodge this. Sayuk loses control and impulsively attacks Ju Hayuk. And he uses magic, which he rarely uses, to try and end this quickly. He shifts his center of gravity since he thinks Jo Hayuk will be hit. Observing the situation, his father believes he moves faster than Sayuk's maximum speed. From the moment Sayuk goes in, Ju Hayuk has already formulated a plan, displaying a talent for strategic thinking that is truly exceptional. Regrettably, numerous individuals are well aware of the newcomer's worth. Not everyone remains oblivious to the value he brings. Chulshin declares his determination to get the Hayek into their family at any cost. As the audience chants, Hayek questions the sanity of those who have already undergone military service, referring to a 17-year-old as Nuna. This battle is between Kim Ju Hayek and the Choijin family's second daughter, Choi Aran, and the match starts. Hayek thinks she is waiting for him to attack first and praises her for trying to read the situation better than others. He begins to fight, and she unsheathes her sword. At the age of 17, she has already mastered the Choijin family's element of changeability. This time, all five children from the five families display exceptional talents. He questions the logic of it and does not make it easy to dodge when she shows him where she would attack with her eyes. So, she manages to escape with her sword. He figures out that it doesn't feel like hitting a body. He poses a question, challenging her to elicit a response. He delivers a decisive blow to the sword, causing it to fall, and successfully brings down his opponent. And it's a victory for Kim Jo Hayek. He comes first in the ranking. Media reporters surround him, urging him to share his life story. They are eager to listen and ask. Everyone asks him various questions, with children urging him to join their Chunmyung. Some are urging him to join their group, promising excellent treatment. He becomes frustrated with their questions. The top 10 members are welcomed in Valhalla. Kim Hayek finds all of this quite boring. All the top 10 members are staring at him intently. In front of him is a screen stating that he should collect his weapons and memories from room number 5 on the third floor of Valhalla. He just needs to get in and leave, so it isn't an issue. With that, the entrance ceremony is now over. They are all in a virtual combat simulation room. Their instructor is the former Choijin Guild head of Valhalla, Kim Lee Jun. He is puzzled to see why the class is distributed like this. In the first row, there is the Yushin family, Yu Soyan. Next to her is the Choijin family's Arhan, and in the middle of them, the Osun family, Oseok. Despite the assurance of random class assignments, 
He wonders how it's possible for three out of five family member geniuses to end up in the same class, and why Kim Joo Hyuk is also in this class. This year seems completely doomed. He brings himself down and realizes the need to assert authority in such a situation. He greets everyone and introduces himself as the class instructor, Kim Lee Joon. After the introduction, he presses a button, and suddenly, confusion erupts everywhere. No one can grasp what is happening. After that, they arrive in an open courtyard, and he displays some bloodlust. He has created a protective shell around them, making it impossible for the monsters to sense anything about them. He calls for Kim Ju Hyuk and asks if he can handle those numerous monsters alone. Ju Hyuk confirms that he wants him to fight with these monsters. Lee Jun is confident that his ego will die down a bit and ponders that in the case of students, they have mostly only seen monsters in books or such but never in person. He tells him to stop pretending to configure it and just say no. He has to start the class as soon as his ego dies down. Upon hearing this, Hayek bursts into laughter. Lee Jun asks him why he is laughing and assumes he can care for them. He becomes confident that he can do it and tells him in anger to go ahead and do it. Hayek says that from what he knows, he hasn't heard that they will be doing something like this on the first day and assumes that there is a prize in return. He asks if he will keep their attention and what he will get in return. Li Jun replies if he fights those monsters, he will do what he says. After thinking, he accepts the deal. Li Jun says he doesn't understand the monsters in this system. He ignores him and asks for a sword. Li Jun remarks on how he would fight without weapons. He asks if he is expecting him to fight with his bare hands, and Li Jun hands him the sword. He sets off to fight the monsters. Everyone watches him. He draws the sword and begins to fight. He starts fighting against the monsters with great courage. He is fighting excellently. He thinks that three years have passed since he grasped the sword, yet it seems good. During that time, monsters made it hard for the world to function correctly. People had to use whatever weapons they could to deal with the situation. But the sword remained a well-known and favored weapon among the people. Lost in his thoughts, he suddenly feels a monster lurking behind him, ready to strike. Before the monster could launch its attack, he swiftly brought it down with a strike. He thought the pattern was simple. These are the well-made fake monsters. Li Jun observed the scene with keen interest, pondering how the sword he had lent Kim, devoid of any magical properties, could allow Kim to effortlessly cut through his adversaries. It's as if the sword is sucking the monsters. The three members from the top five families are also engrossed, watching with keen interest. He wants to go down to the room with the constellations. After getting rid of the monsters, he approaches Li Jun and asks if he remembers her promise. Concluding today's class, the instructor, Li Jun, acknowledged the potential fatigue for the students, especially considering it was their first session. Therefore, the suggestion is to head directly to their dorms and rest. Kim Hayek thinks that this class is very lengthy. He just wants to grab what he needs and quickly get out of there. Reflecting on it, he never considers becoming a student, having attended school themselves. Despite finding the class dull, he gains some information, particularly about stories related to constellations. In their past life, constellations don't exist for them. Constellation is the term used to refer to the transformation of those who establish great fortunes into gods. Many constellations are associated with hunters, acting as sacred artifacts that bestow special powers upon them. In Korea, Valhalla is the world's third largest academy, housing numerous relics of constellations. He thinks everything about swordsmanship and how to eradicate monsters is useless. He should head to the dormitory to practice martial arts. His body is weak. While thinking, he feels as if someone is following him. He turns around to see. In the teacher's office, Lee Sangchyo, Valhalla's highest ranking instructor, and Lee Jun talk about Ju Hayak. Sangchyo says to Lee Jun that he has been through a lot. He replies it is more embarrassment than hardship. It doesn't make any sense. He questions how a high school student could achieve such a feat. Sangchyol says he made 120 monsters in the virtual combat simulation room as anticipation this time, and he kills them all, a high school that hasn't met any monster yet. Lee Sangchyol, Valhalla's highest ranking instructor, and Lee Jun discuss Ju Hayek in the teacher's office. Sangchyol remarks on the absence of special qualities in Ju Hayek, finding it peculiar, Li Jun inquires about Ju Hayek's background, to which Sang reveals that Hayek is an orphan from a small orphanage in a highly dangerous area. 
Li Jun speculates that Zhu Hayek might be a forger, but Sanxiu dismisses the idea, stating he conducted his research and found no evidence of forgery. Sanxiu questions the logic of a forger attempting to enter Valhalla and causing a scene at the entrance ceremony. Sanxiu asks Li Jun about Kim Hayek's interest in entering the constellation's room. Li Jun confirms, explaining that his aim is to enter the constellation after the first semester. Sanxiu shares that he has requested the headmaster to allow Hayek access to the first floor basement, taking responsibility for him. Li Jun expresses gratitude for this favor. However, Sanxiu adds that while he is unaware of the restrictions on the fifth floor, accessing the first floor should pose no issue if he moves quickly. Li Jun expresses his concern about the upcoming year because of Zhu Hayek. Even if he doesn't attend Hayek, Li Jun notes the difficulty in managing his class with three students from five families. Sanxiu attempts to reassure him by mentioning an exchange student from the Ventric family in another class. Li Jun inquires about Rockdale Ventric, recalling hearing that he was expelled from the British Academy for causing trouble. He now feels relieved that his situation is better than the neighboring class. Ju Hayek turns around to see who is following him and finds Arin, the daughter of the Choijin family. He asks her what has happened to her, and she requests him to teach her swordsmanship. As he turns away, she persists, asking him to teach her swordsmanship. He refuses, and she asks why. He responds sharply, questioning her persistence. Frustrated, he tells her he has no intention to teach her and leaves. The next day, he sits in the classroom, contemplating his lack of magic power and the difficulty in controlling mana. He realizes that finding a solution to this issue is crucial for his progress. While lost in his thoughts, someone approaches and stands in front of him. It's Rockdale Ventric, accompanied by his attendant, Uria de Felix. Hayek questions their identity, to which Rockdale expresses surprise at his ignorance, introducing himself as a member of the Ventric family. He directly asks Hayek if he desires power. In most families, the branch lineage faces greater challenges in attaining power and wealth compared to the main family line. However, the Ventric family possesses the Beak Mask, serving as the guardian of the constellation. This sets them apart from others. Typically, an S-class or higher guardian in the constellation offers protection to the family, directly selecting members and bestowing them with protection and strength. Contrary to convention, the Ventric family opted to sign contracts with non-constellation members. This unique decision allowed chosen individuals to enter into contracts with the constellation without dispute. As a result, the Ventric family wielded significant influence in Europe. Being a member of the Ventric family granted the authority to select a contractor regardless of lineage, empowering the branch family line to rival the main family line in terms of power. Rockdale Ventric, buoyed by his family's authority, has grown excessively arrogant due to his power. Some time ago, he faced expulsion from the British Academy due to a disturbance. Addressing Hayek, Rockdale dismisses concerns and boasts about his family's ability to resolve any issues he faces. He asserts that being a Ventric ensures he always gets what he wants despite past troubles. Impressed by Hayek's prominence at the entrance ceremony, Rockdale offers him a place by his side, promising to lead him to the Ventric family constellation. Hayek responds unfavorably, provoking Rockdale's fury. The head instructor of Valhalla, Sanxiol, intervenes, instructing Rockdale to return to his seat and reprimanding him for addressing Hayek by his full name. Sanctual emphasizes that despite the Ventric family's stature, they must adhere to the instructor's authority at Valhalla. Rockdale complies and asks if they are Valhalla instructors before returning to his seat. As he leaves, he informs Hayek of their future meeting. After the class ends, Ju Hayek goes to his dorm and reflects on the day, feeling disappointed that he gained nothing related to the constellation room despite his initial plans. He recalls an unexpected encounter with Rockdale earlier in the morning, where he learned that Guild Scouts, external individuals, have been gathering information about him at the school. Lost in thought, he suddenly notices Arin following him again. Questioning her, he receives the same request to teach her swordsmanship, to which he responds with frustration, reminding her that he has already refused once before. In Valhalla's dormitory, Rockdale, consumed by anger, breaks a lantern, he bitterly contemplates Kim Ju Hayek's audacity, viewing him as a lowly orphan who dared to humiliate him. He instructs Yuria to summon Desira. In Valhalla's higher classroom, Rockdale's rage explodes as he shatters a lantern in fury. 
Summoning Yuria, he grabs her by the hair and questions her identity, threatening to expel her from their family. Despite Yuria's denial, Rockdil forcefully slams her to the ground and orders her to contact Disra urgently. Additionally, he instructs her to inform Desira Ventric, a second-grade royal family member, of his desire to meet him. After hearing his commands, Yuria nods in compliance. At night, in the Valhalla dormitory, Kim Hayek sits alone in his room, running his hands over his body and realizing its limitations it cannot perform tasks nor wield magic. Lost in thought, he reflects on his encounter with Arin, who has trailed him to his dorm. Finally, he confronts her, questioning her persistent presence. Arin repeats her request for swordsmanship lessons, provoking Hayek's frustration. He rebukes her, likening her to a parrot, and demands she stop tailing him. In response, she offers him 10 million won for lessons. Surprised, Hayek questions whether the price is only for one lesson, to which she simply stands and watches. Ultimately, he dismisses her offer, stating she cannot afford him, and he is ready to leave. She requests his phone, prompting him to inquire about her intentions with it. She explained that she needed to input her number for easier money transfers. As he observes the mobile screen, he's taken aback by the transfer of 100 million won. Once again, she presses him, asking if he will teach her now. Firmly, he declines, refusing both the offer and the money. Despite acknowledging the significant sum, he remains undeterred, confident in his ability to find it elsewhere. He rises and readies himself before embarking on a quest to explore the secret vault. As he departs, thoughts race through his mind. He recalls scouting the area before attending the school, noting that most of the notes hidden 300 years ago were unfortunately destroyed. Research indicates there should be at least four notes remaining, though it's likely only three remain, most certainly located within the mountains of Valhalla. With determination, he sets out to find them. During his adventure, he discovers the notes by sensing marbles that react to his magic. Despite having only a small amount of magic at his disposal, he skillfully detects these marbles and locates the notes. With success on his side, he begins to excavate the ground, though he can't help but feel a sense of weakness. Reflecting on the task's difficulty, he muses that had he known it would be so arduous, he would have chosen a more accessible location for burial. The necessity for his current task arises from the events of the Tower of Destruction 300 years ago. Without that historical incident, there would be no reason for him to undertake this endeavor. The world teetered on the brink of destruction, leaving no place for his wealth to remain safe. Thus, he inscribed notes and stored them here, hoping they remained intact and undisturbed over time. As he continues to dig, the morning arrives, casting its light upon his efforts. Eventually, he uncovers the object of his search, though he still struggles to locate the keyhole. After some effort, he manages to find it, only to realize that a regular key won't fit into the slot. Undeterred, he channels his magic to fashion a makeshift key from a string. With this improvised tool, he finally succeeds in unlocking the hidden chamber. After much effort, he finally succeeds in opening the vault. Stepping down, he gazes at his wealth and softly asks sarcastically if they have been well. Taking in the sight of his riches, he thinks to himself that now he doesn't have to worry about his finances. His eyes fall upon storage stones, and he recalls infusing them with magic to safeguard his notes. Realizing their significance, he decides to utilize them. As he holds one of the stones, he feels the surge of magic emanating from it. He resolves to deal with the remaining stones first. However, when he sees the heavy gold bars juxtaposed with the delicate jewelry, he ponders whether he should prioritize the lighter items instead. In the Valhalla Institution classroom, he muses over the prospect that he can also create notes in the future. Feeling the strain in his muscles, he ponders if it stems from his recent digging efforts. His contemplation is interrupted by Arin, who approaches and takes a seat nearby, making the request again to teach her the art of the sword. He questions her, wondering why she continues to insert herself into his life. Reminding her of the Chajan family's legacy in swordsmanship, he asks why she insists on seeking instruction from him. Despite his suggestions that she could learn from her own family, she remains adamant, expressing a desire to be taught by him specifically. Perplexed by her persistence, he inquires further, questioning her reasons for choosing him over her own father, who holds a prominent position in the Chajin family. While they continue discussing her father, Li Jun arrives and summons him to the teacher's room, asking him to come and listen. 
Curious about the reason behind the summons, Hayek inquires further, prompting Lee Jun to mention that it concerns a previous question posed by Kim Hayek. Despite initial hesitation, he agrees to accompany Lee Jun to the teacher's room. As he rises to leave, Arin calls out to him from behind. Turning to face her, he notices her puzzled expression. He then invites her to join a training group the following day at 6 am. Surprised by the invitation, Arin hesitates momentarily before agreeing to participate, expressing her willingness to learn. Upon entering the teacher's room, Lee Jun wastes no time conveying the message to Kim Hayek, mindful of his impending class. He swiftly informs him that his request regarding entering the constellation room has been granted. However, there's a restriction. He can only access the basement floor and not any lower levels. Curious about the timing, he queries Lee Jun about when he can visit. Lee Jun responds, suggesting that tonight would be suitable. Pleased with the opportunity, he expresses his readiness to go immediately. Lee Jun, taken aback by his swift acceptance, remarks on the unexpected response, noting his surprise at his lack of resistance. With the matter settled, Lee Jun issues the directive to proceed, to which Hayek readily agrees, affirming his compliance with a respectful yes sir. It's nighttime, and Lee Jun leads him to the Valhalla Academy's treasure, the Constellation Room. Tight security measures are in place outside the room, prompting Ju Hayek to remark on the heightened level of security compared to the main gate. Li Jun explains that it's a testament to the room's importance, significant enough to elevate Valhalla to one of the three great academies. Observing the impressive exterior walls of the building, Ju Hayek comments on their grandeur. Li Jun reveals that these walls are imbued with various forms of magic, encircling the building except for the entrance. Inquisitive, Hayek asks Li Jun how one might gain access to the second floor, pondering if it would require engaging in illicit activities. Li Jun's response is straightforward. Attempting such an act won't label him as a criminal, but will result in expulsion. He adds a cautionary note, reminding Hayek of his already precarious mental state. Perplexed, Hayek probes further, asking how he lost his mind. Li Jun explains the peril of the second floor, where the unbridled magic of the constellation wreaks havoc on the mind, driving individuals to madness upon contact. Observing Hayek's behavior, Li Jun wonders about his intentions, questioning why he inquired about such risks moments before entering. He ponders whether Hayek truly desires to descend, or if he's grappling with an internal conflict. Li Jun warns him about the time limit, urging him to return within 30 minutes. Hayek confidently assures his prompt return and ventures forth, crossing the gate. Upon entering, a familiar screen materializes, directing him to the fifth room on the third floor to retrieve his weapons and memories. Determined, he resolves to heed the instructions, unfazed by the potential consequences of expulsion. His priority lies in reaching the third basement floor. Ascending the stairs, he reflects on the seemingly endless flights within the building. Hindered by limited visibility, he questions the purpose of such a structure. Exiting, he gazes upward, contemplating the existence of a prison within Valhalla. Doubt creeps in as he reassesses the significance of the constellation's room, ponders that he should delve deeper into the academy's depths. He goes forward, and all the while, his mind races. Suddenly, a screen appears before him, bearing the message that he has met the requirements and is being moved to the room. Surprised by this unexpected turn, he tries to discern which room it refers to. Then, he hears a voice saying it's been a while, Kim Hyano. He's taken aback to see Barch standing before him. Barch communicates with him, acknowledging the passage of 300 years since their last encounter. But instead of a warm reunion, Kim Hayek's reacts angrily, delivering a powerful punch. Despite Barch's attempts to reason with him, he continues his assault relentlessly, fueled by rage and resentment. Hayek punches at Barch, who attempts to stop him, but Hayek continues relentlessly, ignoring any attempts at conversation. Barch tries again to restrain him, warning that he will retaliate. He again strikes him, causing him to fall. Despite his actions, Hayek expresses that he is not typically a violent person. He voices his grievances, accusing Barch of destroying his future, wealth, honor, and the time spent training his disciples. Barch then asks him if he's curious about their surroundings. Pausing his assault, he stops beating him and acknowledges his curiosity about the place. Barch reveals that it is an imaginary world, specifically a space within a relic. 
He further explains that the embodiment of Barch he sees before him is merely a representation within this imaginary world, as his real body ceased to exist 300 years ago. Hayek asks if he's suggesting he's always been in the relic. He replies with a simple yes, puzzled, Ju Hayek thinks momentarily and wonders if he is a constellation. He replies affirmatively, stating he became a constellation. Upon hearing this, he angrily launches an attack on him. Meanwhile, Li Jun stands outside waiting for him and wonders why he has yet to come. At that moment, he comes outside and the guards check him. Li Jun inquires him, hoping he hasn't done anything strange there. He normally replies that he just looked around. He couldn't get down because he would have lost his mind if he did. He replied he got him. Now he goes home. He heads towards his room, pondering the conversation with Barch. He tells Barch that he doesn't care about him becoming a constellation. He just wants to know if he created that transparent notification window. Barch denies responsibility, leading him to hit him with a bush, convinced he's lying. Barch insists that he is telling the truth. Since he killed him, he has been stuck here for the past 300 years with no power, and he asks who sent the message. Barch responds that he received the same notification, which prompted him to contact the reincarnated Jew Hayek and regain his memory. Barch reflects on the emergence of a suspicious person thanks to the notifications. Ju Hayek wonders if it was the doing of the individual who made him the owner of the Tower of Destruction. He questions whether this person, who made Barch the Tower's owner, is behind the notifications. Barch admits he doesn't know exactly, his memory of that part is gone. He doubts that the lost memories will return all at once. Barch then inquires about the notifications he received. He explained that the notification instructed him to find a weapon and memories. However, the text below was censored by squares, preventing him from reading it fully. Despite this, he doesn't recall losing any memories and still retains memories of the tower. Barch suggests that the memories haven't resurfaced yet, but since he has already found the weapon, the memories may naturally emerge. Ju Hayek inquires about the weapons. Barch explains that this space is the inner world of the four weapons, village swords that have become sacred relics. He became a constellation because he used the village sword as a relic. He doesn't fully grasp the situation and, frustrated, hits Barch again. He is still on the way, pondering over everything Barch shared. Thinking about how the village sword has turned into a relic and, within it, is a constellation. With contemplation, he extends his hand, magically retrieving the village sword from his grasp. He ponders that he wants to destroy Barch and leave him behind. The sword magically appears in his hands. He thinks that no matter how weak it has become, it's reluctant to leave Barch unattended, who was once called the King of Destruction. He guesses it can only be helped that the new quest that appeared in the notification window is achievable with a village sword. And there is no such thing as a receipt for this sword. As he contemplates all this, some people approach him and say he is the chosen one at the entrance ceremony. They have all come to challenge him and tell him that his seniors are on a trip, so if he is going to introduce himself. In the Valhalla Academy, a significant figure emerges, Rurik Sunrise, the eldest son of the prestigious Sunrise family and a senior within the institution. Hayek's response to Rurik's presence is casual, prompting a discussion about seniority and respect. Hayek, observing the unfolding exchange, remains silent. Suddenly, one of the challengers declares their intention to defeat Hayek. Without hesitation, Hayek swiftly thwarts the advance with a leg sweep, urging his opponent to cease talking and engage in combat. Kim Hayek trips him with a leg sweep. He lifts him and tosses him onto the others, leaving everyone astonished. Seeing this, Rurik becomes furious. He conjures a sword into his hand using magic. They all stood frozen, watching him with fear and awe. He tells them to come, let's fight, and it will be fun. He will crush all of their heads if they all stand like this. Three hours prior, Rockdill summons Rerik, assigning him a simple task, to keep a close watch on a first-year student named Kim Ju Hayak. In exchange, Rockdill promises anonymity, a valuable asset for the Sunrise family. Rerik understands the terms, accepts responsibility, and knows necessary actions will be supported. With the task at hand, Rerik contemplates the hierarchical structure within the academy. Despite Ju Hayek's top rank among first-year students, he remains subject to the rules governing interactions between grades. The contracts enforce this hierarchy Valhalla students make with constellations, a process occurring in the second semester of their first year. 
the students who form contracts with constellations ascend to become contractors and are commonly referred to as second graders. Becoming a contractor grants them access to their constellation's power, which they can draw upon and utilize. Reflecting on this, Ririk feels a sense of satisfaction. He believes that Kim Ju Hayuk, lacking a prestigious family background and without a guardian constellation, would be an easy opponent to defeat. However, as he stands face to face with Kim Ju Hayuk, he begins to realize the fallacy of his assumptions. Everything he had deemed simple turns out to be far more challenging. Dealing with him proves to be a formidable task, contrary to his initial expectations. They attempt to attack him, even wielding weapons, but he defends himself adeptly. Despite their efforts, he swiftly strikes them down with his sword. He lifts and throws Ririk's companions individually, leaving him astonished by the spectacle before him. Lyric wonders how he manages to defeat each second grader with such precision. Second graders as contractors possess advanced martial arts and magic skills compared to first graders. However, their martial arts and magic powers seem ineffective against this particular first grader in the encounter. Ultimately, they are all defeated, lying defeated on the barren ground. Lyric becomes perplexed by the scene unfolding before him, remarking on the peculiar swordsmanship displayed by the opponent. Despite appearing to wield his sword with a moderated swing force, his adversaries stand no chance against him. Hayek addresses the remaining second graders, reminding them of his warning that he would make their heads roll. The youngsters stand there, contemplating whether they should confront him or not, their fear evident. Lyric shouts at them, urging them to fight, emphasizing that Hayek is just a first grader student and they should not fear him. In response, he sarcastically remarks on Lyric's high spirit as the gangster boss. Enraged by his words, Lyric charges him to engage in combat, but he swiftly counterattacks, knocking Lyric down and defeating him. He sits beside him as he lies on the ground, questioning his motives, asking why they gathered and picked a fight with him. Haya questions why a group of senior students armed themselves to confront a first-year student. It's an unusual occurrence. He demands to know who sent them. Lyric responds that their intent was merely to confront the top-ranking first-year student. Upon hearing this, Hayek chuckles sarcastically, questioning the loyalty of the seniors. He gets up, lifts his weapon, and continues forward. As he departs, Lyric warns him about the consequences of his actions, suggesting that expulsion may result if word of the altercation spreads. He challenges them, questioning who would spread such a story and how it would reflect on them. He departs with a sly smile, advising them to consider their actions wisely. Meanwhile, Rockdill anticipates Ririk's imminent call, observing the situation unfold from afar. His phone rings, and it's Ririk on the line. Answering promptly, he asks if a moderate beating was administered. After hearing Ririk's response, he abruptly announces his withdrawal from the task, unable to continue. This unexpected turn of events angers him, prompting him to question Ririk's decision. He instructs him to steer clear of anything related to Kim Ju Hayuk. Puzzled by the sudden change in tone, he reflects on his earlier confidence in handling the situation. As Ririk ends the call, he wonders about the shift in attitude, recalling Ririk's previous assurance. Rockdill urges him to wait and consider his options. Suggesting the possibility of reporting Kim Jo Hayek to the administration, he emphasizes the potential evidence of wounds as proof. Promising full commitment to the cause, he even offers to secure funding from his family. Despite Rockdill's persuasion, he remains resolute, stating that even if the Ventric family offers support, it won't restore their lost honor. Frustrated, Rockdill ends the call without waiting for a response, feeling the anger simmer within. In a fit of frustration, he hurls his phone to the ground, shattering it. Immediately afterward, he asks his assistant Yuria to inquire about Disara's whereabouts, his tone betraying his agitation. The next part of the tale starts in Mexico Arripia Academy where some people fall after being beaten. A person sits above them, reading a message on the phone. It says someone wants him to come to Korea. This person, Desira Ventric, is reading a message on the phone that says that to come to Korea, he has to take care of a boy, Kim Jo Hayek. In return, he will receive a huge reward. Reading this makes him happy. He thinks there wasn't anyone he could borrow money from after getting out of jail. He happily says that it is a positive change in his situation. A voice interrupted his concentration, leaving him to ponder its origin. He wondered if it could be Barch. 
Confirming the familiar tone, he questions himself about where he is speaking from. Barch's voice resonates through the air, though his physical form remains unseen. Barch explains that he is currently confined within a sealed sword. Startled, he admits that he had assumed Barch managed to escape. If Barch had indeed escaped, he would have been obliged to confront and retrieve him forcibly. However, Barch reassures him that there's no need for such action on his part. Speaking to Barchai, he inquires if he is sure everything is okay. Barchai asks if he is talking about my situation. He replies no, he is talking about the sword. The sword has become an artifact and is being kept at Valhalla. They exit the room with the constellation. Barchai reassures him there is no need to be worried about it since he replaced the sword with a replica. He expressed his relief as he was concerned about the same thing. He explains that when he wakes up, he loses all his strength. Surprisingly, he can make a replica right from the start, though he doesn't understand why he has this ability. He is still exercising when Arin arrives and asks her if she has come. She replies affirmatively, stating that she's here for sword technique lessons. With a measured expression, he responds, suggesting they start by improving her stamina first. She questions why, to which he replies that she can leave if she doesn't want to learn. Determined, she insists that she wants to learn, and he agrees, proposing they start with stretching. He explains that by enhancing her stamina, she will find it easier to handle mana and control it effortlessly. Despite finding the training method somewhat peculiar, she continues. Arin believes that everyone, including herself, prioritizes investment in mana over stamina for unexplained reasons. Despite her considerable mana reserves, it's evident that her stamina is limited compared to that of a student wielding the powers of an entire world. She informs him that she has already done the stretching herself. He responds by saying, let's now proceed with the real training. They both perform push-ups, lifting dumbbells. After a few exercises, she gets tired and lies down on the ground. He tells her to get up, stating they've only just begun. He urges her to stop lying on the ground and get up, as they still have to run 20 kilometers. Hearing this, she is astonished, realizing there's more to do. Sitting in the classroom the next day, he contemplates whether she is feeling okay. Despite pushing harder than last time, they did quite well. She has a physique worth developing. At that moment, the teacher enters the classroom and instructs everyone to be silent. She introduces herself as Lilia, Valhalla's upper-tier instructor and subject supervisor of Dimensional Monsters. She briefly mentioned this on the first day, instructing them to engage in self-study on Dimensional Monsters. Today, she announces her intention to test their knowledge of how well they can handle each individual monster. Upon her question, everyone begins to write in their own way. After some time, she checks her watch and declares that the time is up, instructing everyone to stop writing. Beginning from the back, she instructs everyone to pass their test papers forward. In her announcement, she clarified that today's test would not be included in their overall scores. Instead, it would serve as a measure of their capabilities for the upcoming class. Observing the situation, she thinks that all the tests have been collected. She declares that the next class will officially begin in the virtual combat simulation room and exits the room. Barch questions him about his ability to write his answers in that manner. Hearing Barch's voice, Hayek becomes perplexed, wondering if he is observing everything. Barch explains that since he is inside, he has nothing to do. Ju Hayek asks if he can read his thoughts too. Barch clarifies that he can only hear what he thinks regarding him. He confirms that he writes down the answers exactly as they are conveyed to him. In Valhalla's first year teacher's lounge, instructor Lilia becomes visibly furious after reading Kim Joyuk's paper. She strongly criticizes the statements provided, referring to them as unacceptable answers. Lee Jun, holding a cup of tea, passes by instructor Lilia, his gaze falling on her intense anger. Approaching her, he asks if these are the test papers for his class. She explains that to prepare for the next class stimulated fight, she instructed them to inform her about how they can defeat a monster and explain in a written test how they combat. She remarks that, as expected from Class A, which has children from famous families, they all did well. Upon hearing this, Li Jun tells her okay, he will do his work and begins to leave. As he walks away, he hears Lilia's voice again, questioning himself, if he calls this a proper answer. He then turns back and asks if Kim Jo Hayek did not do any work. She informs him that it's not just a lack of effort. 
he is mocking the class at this point. He asks if he has written something that could be better. She responds that this cannot be overlooked. She will show him his paper in the next class and thoroughly educate him. After one week, Klasa gathers in the Valhalla Virtual Fight Simulation Room. Instructor Lilia informs them that she has graded and brought the test they took in the last class. Most of the students did very well. However, she calls Kim Jo Hayek to come forward and keenly observes his reaction. Handing him the test, she reveals that he scored zero marks. She asks him if he is sure he was given the test properly. He responds affirmatively. She then asks him how to take care of rock goblins and what he wrote in response. He observes the response, interpreting it as using a sharp or improvised weapon to stab or thrust into the stomach. Upon hearing this, she bangs her head and poses another question. How he should handle the situation when encountering eight jungle goblins approaching him. His response is to start from the ones charging toward him, stab each of them, and send them to hell. Upon hearing his response, she regains her composure and remarks that he can never be serious. Even if he had acted as if he had studied a bit of strategy, she would have let it go. She repeats his answer about shanking the rock goblins, then clarifies that rock goblins' defense is also be positive, meaning that a normal sword aura won't damage them at all. Yet he suggests using a sword against that type of monster. She questions what he means. His response is that everything could happen in just one strike. She muses to herself that even his ego acknowledges a lack of substance, yet he continues to talk nonsense. Upon hearing his response, she presses a button, forming a protective layer. Outside that layer, a monster appears. She announces that if student Kim jo is confident in his answer, she will give him a chance to fight the monster. She tells him that she will regrade his points if he kills the monster, just like he wrote on his test. Upon hearing this, he casually acknowledges and says he got it. He puts his test aside. Then he takes the sword and prepares to face the monster on the battle mat. Instructor Lilia observes him as he prepares to fight, thinking about the rumors she's heard regarding his talent for dispatching 120 goblins before. She knows that handling a rock goblin requires more than just any random sword. With a single strike, he thrusts his sword into the stomach of the rock goblin, defeating it effortlessly. Turning to Instructor Lilia, he remarks, just shank in the stomach. The onlookers are amazed at how he defeated the rock goblin without visible magic. Instructor Lilia questions him about his method, to which he simply responds that she hasn't seen it. He just stabbed it in the stomach with his sword. Surprised, she acknowledges that dealing with a rock goblin typically requires a strategic strike, but he managed it with just a sword. He asks if his answer is correct, and she responds, no, not yet. Another question awaited, and she pressed a button again. Standing outside the protective layer, he asked what this was. She told him it seemed he hadn't checked his surroundings and instructed him to look in front of him. A giant monster emerged before him. She explains that jungle goblins are goblins with anger issues and dealing with them is very tricky. Mishandling them could lead them to use their howling skills. Usually, these goblins would either engage in a fight with the magician and defeat them all at once or simply flee rather than confront them directly. Though only three goblins were visible in front, five more would rush him as soon as he made a mistake. Even if he is skilled with a sword, it would be challenging. According to what she hears, his sword speed is slow. After hearing this, he systematically attacks each goblin and takes them down. Seeing this, Instructor Lilia's mouth drops open, and he looks toward her, asking if she got the second question right as well. The next day, Hayek and Arin are working out in the playground. After a short while, she often lies down on the ground due to fatigue. He looks at her lying tired on the ground and asks why she didn't practice back at her clan and why she's finding this level of exercise challenging now. She responds that she doesn't normally push herself like this. Surprised by her response, he asks how she plans to go up against those monsters if she doesn't normally train like this. She tells him that she can just use her magic powers by borrowing strength from the constellation members. Upon hearing her response, he considers that rather than prioritizing stamina training, individuals like Arin focus on their magic power since they rely on the constellations. He reflects that even if they neglect physical development, they can still borrow power from a constellation if they train adequately. However, he views the risk as significant. 
he presents a hypothetical scenario, asking what she would do if caught in a labyrinth or dungeon with a magic restriction spell, or if her mana runs out during prolonged combat and the constellation member refuses to lend their power. He asks her if she thinks that these stamina exercises are meaningful to her. She responds affirmatively, mentioning his promise to teach her swordsmanship if she completes them. He questions her response, suggesting that she's only doing the exercises because he told her to. She remains silent as he walks away, declaring that their training session is over for the day and advising her to rest well for their upcoming academy session. She asks if he's going to the academy, to which he replies that he plans to do one more set of exercises. He offers her the opportunity to continue training, but she remains silent. Understanding her reluctance, he tells her to go ahead and leave. Meanwhile, he continues his exercise routine. As he exercises, Barch observes the interaction and inquires if her name is Arin Choi. Confirming her identity, Hayek wonders why he is asking. Barch remarks that it seemed like she was avoiding training despite her complaint, and he questions whether he decided to help her with her training. Hayek explains that he's assisting her because she insisted he teach her his swordsmanship. Barch then asks if he has ever demonstrated his swordsmanship to her. He acknowledges that he hasn't explicitly shown her, but he assumes she probably notices when he uses it in class. He inquires if she understands his strength just by watching him. Hayek explains that he thinks, why not teach her a bit of his skill because he finds it interesting. While he is working out at the gym, Oseok also arrives and starts lifting heavy weights for his workout. He asks him how long he has been working out there and Sayuk responds that he has been there forever, always exercising before attending the academy. After giving this response, Sayuk excuses himself and continues to leave. Seeing him leave, Hayek wonders if it's because of the martial bones he is born with, but it looks like he is able to train for so long because of his talent. Barch asks if he has an interest in this man. Hayek admits that he is impressed by him, noting that he is not bound to be smarter than those who only train their magic power. However, he questions what these constellations even do. Barch replies that he is not sure. Upon hearing Barch's reply, he becomes furious and questions if he is saying the same thing. Barch apologizes, explaining that he too is a constellation, but for 300 years he was isolated there and knows nothing about other constellations. He suggests that he might be able to learn more about them if he finishes the new quest set in his system tab. In response, Hayak asks which quest set. At that moment, a screen appears, displaying the message that says in Valhalla's room of the constellations, the third underground floor, fifth room to the right clear condition Valhalla's eye of the great forest Medigea Rona's house. Caution, heaven's word is required to satisfy the clear condition. Looking at the screen mentioning Valhalla's eye of the great forest, he recalls it as a place he heard about in class, the last survivor place they visited during the first semester. He realizes that he must be sneaky for the time being instead of making a dash for it. Barch inquires about what stealthy means, questioning if he made a lot of noise and started a fight with those troublemakers just a while ago. Hayek explains to him that he thought those guys weren't going to stop anytime soon, and from his point of view, he's been patient for quite a while. If he didn't, his head would have ended up cracked like his. It seems like Barch is having trouble understanding what he's saying. Hayek expresses frustration, stating that until he clears this quest, he won't be able to leave anytime soon. Then, the secret of reincarnation will unfold too. The story shifts to London, United Kingdom, in the house of Bendrick Mansion. There, a girl is sitting on a chair talking to someone. In front of her stands a man with his hands tied. She seems to be asking him what happened, insisting and looking concerned. The girl is Adelia Ventric, the Ventric clan's vice house owner. He tells her that the labyrinth in the outskirts of Reading has been taken care of. She appreciates his work and asks if there is more to tell beyond this. He says he's considering recruiting a few competent men he's found along the way. He mentions there's been a survivor from the ruined robots clan in the labyrinth this time. Adelia asks if the survivor is strong and he confirms that they are. He explains that both survivors he's found are a rank contractors. Adelia approves, stating that if they're at that level, they deserve the Ventric blessings. She instructs him to test their capabilities and send them her way. She then asks if that's all for the day, and he responds with frustration, saying he has something to report about Rockdill. Upon hearing the name Rockdill, Adelia expresses concern and asks if something has happened to them again. 
he confirms that Rockdale called Disara to meet him in South Korea. Next, the story delves into Disara Ventric, known as the problem child of his family and the worst delinquent. He has committed numerous terrible acts, often using the Ventric family's name to do so. At the age of 19, he infamously killed five people in England's academy simply because of an argument. Consequently, by the age of 20, he was completely disowned by the Ventric family, leading him to live in hiding for many years. Adelia questions if Disera is meeting Rockdill, to which she orders him to be placed under surveillance on behalf of Rockdill. He bows his head in acknowledgement, saying he will comply. Additionally, she instructs him to inform Rockdale that any misbehavior will result in his expulsion from the family as well. He nods, stating his understanding, and concludes the report, excusing himself. After he leaves, Adelia reflects on the situation, contemplating the undeserved power held by such individuals. She believes that power should not be in the hands of those who do not deserve it. With determination, she resolves that ultimately, everything, especially power, will come under her control because those individuals do not deserve it. The scene shifts to the classroom, where the teacher elaborates on the meanings of evil and doer, equating them to an evil person. In modern sustainability, the term evildoer refers to individuals who misuse constellation powers for nefarious purposes. While evildoers typically operate alone, they may also organize into groups. Among these organizations, the most notorious is the One God Group, comprised of their respective constellations. Amidst the teacher's lecture, Hayek's thoughts wander to his own body. He ponders the potential correlation between his increasing strength from regular workouts and his talent for utilizing mana, albeit not at the level of a genius. However, he finds it perplexing that his current physique is still subpar. Regardless of his efforts, he questions why his body's condition remains so poor. Recalling his initial attempts at Kai circulation, he remembers struggling due to his lower mana reserves compared to an average person. Even the slightest physical exertion would leave him feeling on the verge of passing out, highlighting the stark inadequacy of his physical state. Continuously disregarding the teacher's lecture, Hayek persists in his thoughts, convinced that his current physical condition shouldn't have deteriorated so drastically. He wonders if something happened to him in the past, but quickly dismisses the notion, reasoning that dwelling on it now serves no purpose. Amidst his contemplation, he is startled by a tapping sound on his table, only to find Yo Soyan handing him a folder. Curious, he opens it to find a message written on a piece of paper. Hey! Irritated by the interruption, he questions its purpose. In the next scene, instructor Lee Jun announces to the students that they will be allowed to leave the premises over the weekend. He instructs those intending to leave to submit their applications separately before concluding the class. Hayek reacts oddly to Lee Jun's announcement, contemplating his own application, which he plans to submit for the purpose of taking a walk outside. Observing his actions, Barchai inquires if he plans to leave and go outside, to which Hayek confirms, stating that he is considering going somewhere. Barchai then inquires about Hayek's destination. Just then, someone calls out to Hayek from behind, when he turns around, it's Yo Soyan who addresses him. She questions him about finding it amusing after her departure, and he asks if he responded politely to her note, which she apparently didn't acknowledge. Listening quietly, she urges her to speak quickly, noting his hurry to submit something. Whatever she had to say, she hurriedly tried to express it, stumbling over her words in the process. In response to Hayek's frustration, he encourages her to speak clearly if she has something to say and accuses her of wasting his time. She then steps forward, attempting to express herself, but gets lost in thought, wondering how he managed to face rock goblins with just a sword and no magic that day. She hasn't read about it anywhere. She just wants to ask him all this, but she questions why her pride hurts so much. She is about to express all this when instructor Lilia arrives and asks him if he can tell her how he defeated the rock goblin that day. He becomes nervous upon seeing instructor Lilia and wonders where she suddenly appeared from. He questions instructor Lilia, asking why she's suddenly getting involved and mentioning that he thought she really disliked him. Instructor Lilia responds to him with a fake smile, questioning why she would hate him. He reminds her that he refuted all her questions to her face and asks if she hated him because he embarrassed her. She acknowledges that she believed there was only one way to kill monsters, but he showed her that there are many other ways too. She then asks him if he wants to become her assistant. Without directly answering her question, he declines, stating that he needs to turn in his leave of absence now. 
As he starts to leave, she stops him and asks again why he doesn't want to become her assistant. Despite her insistence and Soyan standing there watching, he refuses her offer and starts to leave. Soyan speaks up, expressing her disbelief at his actions and offering to personally fund whatever he needs. However, he remains firm in his decision, stating that he doesn't need it. After that, Instructor Lilia doesn't respond further. The next day he would have been standing in a lane looking up observing a market. In his Valhalla dormitory room, Hayek notices Barchai hovering in the air and asks what he's looking for. Barchai replies that he found information about the place he's going to tomorrow and mentions needing to find a trading forum to sell the treasure he finds in the vault. Hayek considers the market, knowing that paying an entrance fee allows people to trade anything freely there. However, he also knows that it's considered a black market due to the evildoers who trade on it. He explains that the market was created and actively maintained by a guardian constellation called the Hidden Ruler, which is why high-ranking people openly use it despite its illegal status. Governments don't crack down on it, making it easy for them to find information on how to enter it. Someone in the comments section provided a detailed explanation, stating that to enter the market, one must click on a link provided in the comments and create a reservation. Then, they'll receive a location within 50 kilometers of their current position. They simply need to go there, enter the door, and they'll have successfully entered the market. As Hayek searches for the link in the comments, a message from the user Choi Aran appears on the screen. He opens the message, sees the emojis she sent, and informs her about what's happened. She replies that she can't make it to tomorrow's training because she has to go out. Considering his own plans, Hayek realizes it would have been difficult for him to attend the training anyway. He simply responds with OK to her message. She sends him a message with a question mark, to which he responds by simply wishing her a good trip. However, she continues to send him emojis, leaving him confused as to why she keeps sending them. Ignoring her, he refocuses on looking at the comments again, reminding himself that the post mentioned opening the link in the comment to make a reservation and get a location. He eventually finds the link and clicks on it. Following the location provided, he arrives at an old cafe. The cafe appears run down and broken. Glancing at the screen, which shows him entering the cafe and heading to the right corner, he reaches the designated location and opens the door. As he does so, he observes the market before him. Strangely, as he opens the door and stands in the lane, he feels a sense of familiarity wash over him. The purple sky and cloudy moon remind him of a night sky he saw 300 years ago. Lost in his thoughts, he is approached by someone who asks if it's his first time there. Recalling the message instructing him to bring 2 million won, he realizes that he's supposed to pay an entrance fee upon entering the market. The message had mentioned that he would see an employee wearing an anachronistic leather suit waiting to collect the fee. Despite the fee, the market is useful, though there's a 5% charge on all earnings from it. He wonders if the person before him is the same one mentioned in the message. Confirming his identity, Hayek asks if he's already familiar with how to use the market and then hands over the money as instructed. As he relinquishes the cash, Hayek reflects that he's now depleted all the money he earned from ranking first in the entrance exams, leaving him with only 30,000 won. However, he reassures himself that he should be fine since he can earn more money here. The man then inquires if there's anything else he wants to know. He mentions his intention to sell some jewels he owns and asks for guidance. The man asks if he wants to auction them, to which Hayek responds that he just wants to sell them quickly. The man suggests heading to the market in the third district, where many merchants buy various items, including jewels and weapons. Hayek further inquires about the most trustworthy person there, to which the man recommends Morris, known for offering the best deals. When he asks for directions to the third district, the man advises him to walk straight ahead and continue when he reaches a split path. As Hayek prepares to leave, the man stops him and advises him to wear a mask, handing one over. He explains that due to the nature of the goods traded in the market, most people wear masks. Considering the mask a complimentary gift, he expresses his gratitude before continuing on his way. In the market's third district, individuals wearing masks can be seen conducting their business. Among them is a man with a machine over his eye, meticulously examining a diamond. Hayek approaches him and inquires if he is Morris. Confirming his identity, the man introduces himself as Morris. Without delay, Hayek presents the goods he intends to sell. 
Morris explains that if the cooldown time for the items is specified, he can manage accordingly. However, for gold and jewelry bags, he can quickly assess them without delay. He then produces a pouch containing several rings and opens it for inspection. Morris selects a ring from his machine and closely examines it. Suddenly, he expresses surprise, noting that it appears to be an artifact from the Era of Destruction. As Morris inspects each item in the pouch, he realizes that they all originate from the same era. Taken aback by this revelation, Hayek questions the value of the artifacts. Morris, intrigued by their origin, hesitates and inquires about their source. Hayek reminds him that such inquiries are not customary in this market. Acknowledging his error, Morris apologizes and admits that he cannot afford to purchase artifacts from the Era of Destruction due to financial constraints. He inquires about where he can sell the artifacts and how he can obtain the money. The person he asks points out a tall building they passed on the way, indicating it as the auction hall. When Hayek asks about the possibility of selling the artifacts at an auction and the expected time frame for the sale, he learns that it could take two to three weeks due to prior bookings. He further inquired if he would need to visit the market in person after that period for verification to receive the payment. The person confirms this possibility. Considering the situation, Hayek asks about the potential value of the artifacts at auction, to which the person suggests they calculate it. Using his mobile device, the person performs some calculations and presents an estimated value, leaving Hayek amazed by the significant figure. Hayek reflects on the artifact's presumed value even in his past life, speculating that their worth may have prompted him to store them away. After observing the estimated value on the mobile screen, Hayek inquires about Morris's available funds. Morris responds by stating that he has calculated an estimated amount, cautioning that the actual auction price may differ. He adds that even with his current funds, he could purchase four or five artifacts if Hayek decides to sell everything. Upon hearing this, Hayek instructs Morris to take four artifacts and provide him with the corresponding amount, surprising Morris. Morris reflects on the significance of artifacts from the Era of Destruction, noting that their value is not only due to their age, but also because of their association with constellations. He recalls how these artifacts facilitated contracts with S-ranked constellations for ordinary individuals. As he examines the artifacts, he recalls the Archimist Zone and its role in forming contracts, deducing that the artifacts likely originate from that era based on the flow of mana through them. He senses traces of the magic released at the end of the Era of Destruction lingering around the artifacts. He reflects to himself that artifacts from that era typically exhibit such distinctive signs. Obtaining eight artifacts from that era with so little effort is quite unexpected. It appears luck is on his side today. Lost in his thoughts, he imagines a masked figure standing before him. Returning to the cafe where he entered the market, he removes his mask, noting its discomfort. Observing the cafe's surroundings, he recalls that he entered the market from here and needs to return to the same original location through the door where he started. Checking his phone while standing in the cafe, he notices a substantial amount of money credited to his account. Astonished by the sum, he reflects on how it could solve all his problems, realizing the unexpected earnings from the eight rings he took from the vault. He reassures himself that even if he runs out, he still has plenty more in storage, ensuring no problems from now on. With that in mind, he exits the cafe. While walking, he receives a call from an unknown number. Curious about the caller's identity, he decides to answer. It's instructor Lilia inviting him to join them for a meal together. Surprised, he asks her where she got his number from. She responds that she obtained his number because she's an instructor in Valhalla, but she quickly moves on, inviting him to join her for a meal. She instructs him to meet her in front of the Valhalla fitness room for lunch. He ponders how she ended the call without giving him a chance to respond, contemplating the abruptness of the conversation. As he walks away, he debates whether he should accept the offer of a free meal. Surprised to see him, Morris asks why he has come. He questions if there has been any previous altercation between them. Hayek counters, asking why he can't come, but Morris explains that a regular merchant can't just approach the market's owner casually. He presses Hayek again, asking why he's there. Hayek explains that he's there to check on an anonymous auction application he submitted. Morris reveals that anonymous applications aren't truly anonymous, as the real owner of the market, the Constellation, can access any information they desire. He then asks if he can inspect the items Hayek listed for auction. 
Upon seeing the jewels, Morris displayed a puzzled expression, finding it strange that the black cat showed such interest in an artifact from the Era of Destruction. It is the first time such a thing had happened. After a moment of thought, he shows him the bag with rings. Upon inspecting its contents, the black cat remarked that they should fetch quite a lot. This troubled Morris, leading him to question the sudden change. Suddenly, a screen appeared in front of the black cat, displaying the message that the constellation of the other side wanted the ring. After reading it, he states that his constellation wants the ring. In the next scene, Hayek and Instructor Lilia are seated at the Valhalla restaurant, enjoying their meal. Instructor Lilia takes a bite of pasta and expresses her delight at its taste. She observes Hayek's absent-minded glances around the room and questions why he isn't eating. Hayek responds, remarking on his fascination with Valhalla having such a place. She smiled and responded that aside from the school cafeteria and staff restaurant, there was also a separate restaurant like the one they were in. She asked if he knew about it. While eating, he showed disinterest in the conversation and asked why she had called him there. She explained that she had invited him to discuss her offer for him to become her assistant. Despite her insistence, he declined the offer once again. She urges him to listen carefully, emphasizing the importance of their lunch meeting. He inquires about the benefits of accepting her proposal. She explains that he would receive a scholarship, various grants, and the opportunity to work on a thesis with her. If the thesis gets published, he could write about the three types of monster attacks, and his name would be listed in the World Monster Research Association. She assures him that glory and wealth will naturally follow. However, he remains unimpressed and asks about additional benefits beyond these. Additionally, she informed him that he could go out twice a week instead of once a month. He then inquired if there was anything else, to which she paused for a moment before mentioning the opportunity to work with her. He expressed that it was an ego thing. She then raised her voice, insisting that he just become her assistant, but he remained firm in his refusal. He pondered that if there were any significant benefits to becoming her assistant, he might consider it. However, at present, he finds nothing particularly tempting about it. His primary goal now is reaching the eye of the Great Forest, and the only access is during the Grade 1 performance assessment. Even as an instructor, gaining entry would be challenging. After some contemplation, he reiterates his disinterest in becoming her assistant or writing any thesis, much to her displeasure. She then asks if he wants to exchange information, offering to share something interesting if he tells her about the monster attacks. Curious, he asks about the type of information she has. She explains that it pertains to a girl who often sticks around him, Choi Ah Rin. Upon hearing this, he wonders about their relationship and thinks about how he is just helping her with training. Before he can express his lack of interest, she begins sharing her thoughts, mentioning rumors that Choi Ah Rin might be disowned by her family. Remaining uninterested in her story, he remains indifferent and starts to walk away. She is about to grab his sleeve and asks him where he is going. He explains that he has finished his meal and doesn't find the benefits appealing, so he feels it is time to leave. She insists that she has shared information with him and suggests he reciprocate. He responds that he isn't interested in sharing, prompting her to point out that he has still listened to her. He questions whether he appears curious after hearing her information and ponders why she is so harsh while teaching someone as childish as him. She explains that, as an instructor teaching mysterious monsters, treating the subject lightly could lead to trouble, as the frequency of attacks is linked to the student's survival. She emphasizes the importance of memorizing basic defense, stating that it is crucial for their safety. He replies, calling it just an ideology, but she clarifies that it is not an ideology but rather an instructor's duty. After hearing this, he leaves, and she follows him, insisting that he should share something with her before leaving. He firmly states that he doesn't want to share anything and walks away. The next day in Sihyun, the guild leader and head of the Choijin family, Choi Jinsiak, is sitting. In front of him is seated the eldest son of the Choijin family, Choi Jinjin, and the second daughter, Choi Aran. He informs them that he has called them both to inquire about their intentions before they participate in the sorting test, to uphold the prestige of their family. He explains that if they pass the sorting test, they will have the opportunity to form a contract via the sacred relics Chingualdo, signifying their legitimacy as successors of the family. Conversely, if they fail, they will be disowned by the family. As both listen silently, he asks them if they are willing to undertake this task. They both respond affirmatively, stating that they will. 
He then informs them that the sorting test will take place three weeks from now, and they are free to leave. As they were leaving, her brother approached and asked if she understood the hint. She responded by questioning what hint he meant. He explained that when she mentioned participating in the sorting test, she didn't notice father's expression, indicating her desire to become the head of the family. Upon hearing this, she became angry and retorted with a comment about being an illegitimate mate. He taunted her, remarking on her menacing demeanor. He then warned her not to delude herself into thinking she could win the sorting test, reminding her that she couldn't even receive a blessing from the constellation. He also mentioned that she couldn't touch him, as he had formed a contract. After hearing this, she lowered her head in defeat. Before he left, he commented that since she had already surrendered, she should just rely on the family's money, and he would make her pay dearly. He concluded by saying they would see each other in three weeks. After he left, she closed her eyes and envisioned someone telling her that she had to become the head of the family in order to be free to do whatever she wanted. The next day in the one a class, Li Jun taught the students while Hayek was lost in thought. After a moment of contemplation, Barchai spoke to him through the air, informing him that midterm season was approaching. Upon hearing this, Hayek wondered if that was the only thing he was worrying about. Barchai responded, suggesting that he could sense his other concerns as well. Hayek then asked if his teacher had informed him about the midterm exams, to which he responded that he didn't pay attention to the class. Li Jun informs them that everyone should understand the importance of exams in Valhalla. He emphasizes that those with the lowest scores will be expelled immediately in both the midterms and finals, so everyone must strive to perform well and stay focused. He advises them to prepare well for both the written and practical tests, noting that the practical test isn't too difficult. Upon hearing this, Hayek contemplates that he has to remain committed to this school until he reaches the eye of the great forest, even though he barely knows how to get there. After pondering over everything, he sighs and asks Barch if he has attended most of these classes. Barch confirms, and then he tells him to take the test instead, promising to review his answers and notify him of any mistakes. Barch responds, expressing concern that using a proxy for the test seems unfair. He frustratedly retorts to Barch, questioning what's unfair about it when he will be taking the test, with Barch telling him the answers as the constellation. At that moment, Li Jun concludes the class and wishes everyone good luck. As the class ends, Hayek begins to leave. However, Aran calls him from behind and asks if they are training today. He questions her motives, to which she replies that she doesn't want to train. He then realizes she wants to learn swordsmanship. Despite doubting her proficiency with a blade due to their shared training, he decides it's time to have a conversation. Though it might not be about swordsmanship or martial arts, he intends to demonstrate the proper way to handle a blade and instructs her to come to the training room next to the gym. In Valhalla's training room, they both stand with their respective swords, and Hayek asks her how much time has passed since she last used her sword, especially for the final strike. She responds that it has been a day and a half. She hasn't touched it since she started strength training with him. Then he inquires if she practices every day before that, to which she answers affirmatively. He instructs her to unsheath her sword, and she complies, drawing her blade. He advises her to put strength into her rings and pinky fingers and grab the hilt firmly. As she follows his instructions, she notes that without even using magic, it feels more secure and stable than holding the blade with both hands. He then instructs her to come at him with everything she has, and he steps forward to engage in the sparring. As she moves forward, she focuses on her footwork. He fights her and advises her not to put more magic into her feet than needed, as she is already too fast. She draws her sword again and charges towards him for another round of sparring. He praises one of her moves and suggests that she rotate her body a little bit more when she stops. He encourages her to continue attacking and not to rest, but she seems tired. Despite this, she performs a move that breaks the floor as she expects. She then attacks him again and reflects that, at that moment, she feels much stronger thanks to his training. The next day at Valhalla Academy, Arin is practicing with the swords and sweat drips from her face. Upon seeing this, Hayek suggests that they stop, as it feels like they've been practicing for an hour. She stumbles and sits on the ground. Watching Hayek exercise nearby, she thinks that her current draftsmanship has improved significantly, though it's incomparable to her skills during her entrance ceremony. She acknowledges that she still can't match Joeyuk's skills. 
Reflecting on this, she calls out to Hayek and asks if they can spar again next time. He replies that he doesn't know, but then he starts to think that practicing with her is helpful and enjoyable because she's talented. Hayek notices her skills in drawing during the entrance ceremony when she uses the huffing technique, but it feels different. He silently thanks her for her abilities, which help him find his senses. Reflecting further, he acknowledges that if it were 300 years ago, she would be considered so talented that he would want to mentor her. However, he laments that he doesn't have the freedom to do so in the present circumstances. He is lost in his thoughts, and she asks again if they will practice sparring. Cheekily, he replies that he doesn't want to. She playfully imitates a sad face, and he comments on why she becomes disheartened so quickly. She tells him it's because he's right and starts thinking that she will definitely become even stronger if she follows Ju Hyuk's words. He tells her that's enough for today and bids her goodbye as she leaves. Two weeks later, students gather in Valhalla Stadium. Yu Soyeon remarks that it's her first time at the stadium since the entrance ceremony. Seok asks if all first-year students are gathered there, expressing surprise at the number. Arun listens quietly, and after observing the situation, Hayek asks why they are gathered there. Barch replies, saying that their class teacher informed him two weeks ago that they needed to gather in the studio two weeks later. Upon hearing Barchai's response, he goes into deep thought and wonders when it was mentioned about gathering two weeks later. Then Valhalla's head instructor Sangchyal, along with instructors Lilia and Lee Jun, arrives and explains Valhalla's midterm exams. He clarifies that the midterm practical evaluation is the dungeon attack, where they'll form teams and venture into an artificial dungeon. They have the freedom to compose their own teams. He suggests an optimal team size of 8, but leaves it to them to decide whether to increase or decrease the number. He states that they will assess students solely based on their level of contribution to the dungeon attack. The criteria for disqualification at this time is that if they cannot pass within the given time it's over. He announces that the dungeon's difficulty is rated as F+. After this statement, he initiates the exam timer, leading to excitement among students as they convince each other to join their teams. Lejon observes the scene and comments that it is as they thought, noticing the students flustered by the unfolding situation. Sanctiol responds affirmatively, stating that it can be done. Soyan remarks that their team dealer is not good enough. Another student offers to handle it. She thinks she doesn't need to pick someone better than her. Five hours is enough time for eight people in an F-plus dungeon. What is important is contribution. With a party of six people, they can choose someone with good skills. It looks easy, but it's difficult to stand out. After considering all this, she instructs her team to move forward. After observing the situation, Sanctual stands and reflects that if they are from the fifth generation, they seem to understand the essence of the exam. He notes that unlike the other students who usually enter in groups of 20 or 8, there is a risk of conflicts if the team is not well balanced, given the three potential scenarios. After contemplating for a while, he announces that all of the students will enter the dungeon after around 30 minutes. He then urges everyone to get ready to score them. Lee Jun's response to him is affirmative. As everyone forms teams, Hayek, standing alone, watches and questions whether the students who entered are being scored immediately. Noticing Arin standing alone, he asks her why she hasn't gone yet, pointing out that everyone else has already left and inquiring about her plans. She replies that she will do as he says. Upon hearing her response, Ju Hyuk finds himself lost in thought, wondering what has happened to her. He ponders silently, reflecting on how she has been diligently following his instructions like a sword since their last training session. Upon observing Arin standing alone, some boys discussed among themselves, questioning why she was alone and if she hadn't formed a team. They approached her and asked if she was teamless, suggesting she join them, as they currently had seven people, and with her, they would be eight. She apologized, stating that she would go alone. One of them insisted that if she went alone, she would be disqualified. She firmly responded that she could do it alone, echoing Ju Hyuk's earlier statement. With that, she confidently walked away alone. It's noted that everyone would have formed their teams and the Valhalla Stadium has turned into a buzzing place. In the Valhalla Monitor Room, all instructors are observed to be observing the activities of the students with keen interest. It's observed that all students are diligently trying to earn points through their efforts. While watching the students, Li Jun reflects on Sangchyal, thinking that despite the seemingly tough grading, Sangchyal quickly and accurately assesses without errors, 
Sangxiao, known as the Clear Master during his time as a duty soldier, holds legendary expertise with a 99% dungeon clearing rate. Li Jun believes Sangxiao's deep understanding of dungeon attacks allows him to give precise scores, and he respects him for this reason. While scoring, Sangxiao reflects that it's a pretty good year overall. He believes the children of the fifth generation are active as a whole, and among them, there are remarkable students like Yu Soyan. He watches Yu Soyan's screen as she instructs her team. Shielded tanks block the initial attacks, archers keep an eye on those jumping out from the sides and shoot them with their bows, ensuring the front line stays strong. She herself fights with great enthusiasm and skillfully takes down challenging dungeons in the game. Sangxiao, watching her, is impressed and remarks that she's truly formidable. He observes that it's like a challenging dungeon attack, noting how she assigned specific roles to her team members, ensuring strategic moves for certain points. Additionally, he notices how she's coordinating with her team in the middle to ensure successful dungeon clearing. Sangxiao further reflects that if she performs well in the midterms, it's only a matter of time before she gets back to the top. He also mentions that if it weren't for Zhu Hayek during the entrance ceremony, her record wouldn't have been tarnished. After thinking, he recalls Kim Zhu Hayek and searches for his screen, only to find nothing, leaving him puzzled about how this could happen, especially since the search machine can find information on all the students who have entered the dungeon. Upon checking the artificial dungeon's clear list, Sangxiao finds Kim Zhu Hayek's name at the top, having cleared all the dungeons first. He is amazed to see how Kim Ju Hayek single-handedly tackled all the dungeons. His gaze falls on the elapsed timer, and upon seeing it, he wonders how Hayek managed to finish all the dungeons in 23 minutes and 32 seconds. He contemplates whether, despite the impressive entrance ceremony, a 17-year-old high schooler could really achieve such a time. He decides to review the recording to verify. As he watches the recording, he sees Hayek standing alone in front of the dungeons, appearing very relaxed. In a single sweep, Hayek defeats all the rock jungle goblins. Sangxiao, instructors Lilia, and Li Jun are astonished and perplexed, wondering how he can take down everyone in one go. Sangxiao believes the golem is a unique one created specifically for the midterm exam. This individual upgraded its capabilities to match the ideal team size of eight people. It seems like Kim Juhyuk is likely to secure first place in this midterm exam. As soon as the midterm exam time concludes, students exit the stadium in various states of exhaustion. Soyan, Sayak, and Aran also exit, having suffered some injuries. However, when Hayek exits the stadium, not a single scratch is found on his body. The midterm exams have come to an end. In the teacher's break room, Li Jun is amazed to see the midterm exam results and also shows Sangxiao. Showing him the results, he says to him that he is not sure if he should say this, but as they expected, Kim Ju Hayek came in first place. Sangxiao responds that it's a bit surprising, expressing his anticipation of Kim Ju Hyuk securing first place. He remarks that witnessing Kim conquer the dungeons alone without sustaining a single injury exceeds his expectations. He speculates that if Kim continues to develop and enters the industry, Korea may regain its title as a leading force. Li Jun remarks about the title given to the world's strongest contractor, which he acknowledges it. He mentions that there haven't been many geniuses for a long time, but he admits he might be too excited to articulate well. Li Jun adds another unexpected element to the exam, mentioning Choi Aran's performance. He notes that while Kim Juhyuk's time is remarkable, no one anticipated that Aran would surpass Yo Soyan for second place. Sangxiao responds by stating that he doesn't know what happened, but Aran challenged the dungeons by herself, similar to Kim Juhyuk, and cleared them in very little time, albeit sustaining numerous injuries. He further explains that although Aran is known as a quiet and hardworking person, he wouldn't have thought she would clear the dungeons alone. He acknowledges that if the exam emphasized teamwork, Yu Si Yeon might have performed better. However, he emphasizes that Kim Jo Hyuk and Choi Aran achieved higher scores because the exam focused on their individual contributions. He concludes by stating that he wouldn't recommend their methods to their students, as they aren't easily replicable by ordinary students. Li Jun agrees with a yes and reflects on Choi Aran, recalling that he definitely saw her when he was an executive at Choi Jin's guild. He remembers her as someone with the aura of a model student dedicated to practicing swordsmanship. He wonders how she got the idea of tackling the dungeon alone and briefly considers if it could be because of Kim Ju Hayek, but quickly dismisses the thought, 
concluding that it can't be the case. He tells himself that he will put his thoughts aside and prepare the grades. The next day at Valhalla Academy, the exam results are announced, and all the students gather to check their results. Kim Ju Hayek is in first place, Choi Aran is in second place, Yu Soyin is in third place, and Seyuk is in fourth position. Upon seeing Kim Ju Hayek's name in the first place, Rockdil freezes in shock and asks his secretary Yuria if Desira has come to Korea. She responds affirmatively, and he orders her to call him as well and get ready to head out. Both Rockdil and his secretary go to Seoul to meet with Desira Vantrik. Upon seeing them, Desira expresses happiness. They sit at the dining table, and Desira asks Rockdil about the boy he mentioned earlier, inquiring about what he does. Rockdil responds that the boy doesn't do anything. He's just a clueless freshman from a lower-tier school. He expresses his disdain for the boy, attributing his humble background to bringing great disgrace upon him, and asserts that Desira must pay him back for his actions. Desira asks Rockdil if he can kill the boy. Rockdil responds that it's up to Desira. Desira then informs Rockdil that the situation is different this time, so he needs to prepare a proper plan before taking any action. Rockdil inquires about the plan, and Desira points toward his secretary, implying that because of her, he had to deal with issues with the palace family in the past. He mentions that he had to eliminate more people because rumors were spreading too widely, which troubles his secretary upon hearing this. While eating, Desira remarks that the people at Valhalla are different, expressing difficulty in causing trouble there despite multiple attempts. Rockdil assures him that he will make the necessary preparations and isn't concerned. After listening to Desira's comments, Rockdil also instructs him to prepare a good reward. One week later, Hayek prepares to submit an application to go outside. Barchai asks if it's an application to leave, to which Hayek confirms. Barchai questions how he plans to go outside again, considering the restriction of leaving only once a month. Hayek responds that he will be granted permission to go outside again. Barchai mentions that performing well on significant exams like midterms or finals could provide another opportunity to leave, as it is the reason for such privileges. Hayek thinks to himself that he won't let this opportunity pass and needs to find his remaining notes. Barchai then asks him where he plans to go. The scene shifts to Suwon, where Hayek locates something on the map, feeling confused and surprised. At that moment, Desira appears before him and greets him. In the next scene, set in Market Area 7, a person wearing a mask stands in front of a screen, displaying a message about the arrival of a ring. The person responds that the ring is on its way and will go through normal procedures to arrive via the portal. The text on the screen once again appears, indicating that the ruler of the other side has declared that they have lost. He finds this intriguing, as he has been researching whether it is an artifact from the Era of Destruction at the request of the former Black Cat. However, it is the first time he has seen this kind of reaction from the constellation. When the ring appears on the portal, he thinks that giving it to them might quiet them down, he informs the constellation that the ring has arrived and mentions that it's here, which surprises him with its unexpected reaction. In Suwon, where Hayek finds something by locating it on the map, he must feel somewhat confused and surprised. At that moment, Desira stands before him and greets him with a nice to meet you. Hayek asks who he is and Desira replies, questioning if it's necessary to know who he is. He assumes there's something Desira wants from him, to which Desira responds affirmatively. When Hayek questions if his intentions or actions are related to removing him from the situation or getting rid of him, Desira replies, acknowledging his good senses. Kim Ju Hayek takes his bag from his shoulder and mentions it's a note about his senses, indicating that his presence is quite noticeable and anyone would recognize him instantly, something he figured out a few days ago. Upon hearing this, Desira becomes angry, telling Hayek that he is the top player in Valhalla, but seems foolish, urging him not to let him down and move forward to punch him. As Desira moves forward to throw a punch, he retreats from his position, causing his punch to hit the wooden wall and shatter the wood. Hayek is amazed at his move and mentions that he is lucky he stepped back. Otherwise, that would have been enough for him. Hayek responds that it's not luck, he dodged that because it was slow. Reflecting on this, he considers that he is definitely a strong guy, feeling similar to or stronger than Oseok. He thinks it's still dangerous for him to stop a fist like that with his frail body and concludes that the strategy is simple. After this thought, he starts running. Desira asks him where he's running and starts running after him as well. 
He informs Desira that it's smart to run away, given his situation, because he would have been severely beaten if he hadn't done anything. Desira adds that he won't let him escape and cuts him from behind, questioning if he's using his brain. Attempting to punch him, Hayek hits him with such force that Desira staggers back. Blood starts flowing from his nose, yet Hayek launches an attack with his leg, causing Desira to fall backward, and the force of the attack creates a deep dent in the earth. He asks him the same question he did before, wondering if it's good luck. This question angers Desira, and he stands up, wiping his nose. Hayek then reminds Desira that he is currently in the first position. He wonders about his strength and what kind of drugs he takes to be so strong and formidable. He recounts how his family, the Ventric family, utilized his talent to elevate their status, even if only slightly. He describes his innate propensity towards elixirs, explaining that he could consume any elixir given to him without issue. He mentions how his parents fed him elixirs worth hundreds of millions per bottle, and by the age of 16, he had already surpassed the strength of an adult. He explains that although his parents wished to leverage his abilities to gain recognition from their family, he refused to live under their control. With his overwhelming power, he saw no reason to seek his family's validation, viewing himself perhaps as a thorn in their side. Eventually, he recounts, he was expelled from the family by a member posing as its head, but he remained indifferent to their actions. He notes that each commission he undertook brought significant financial relief in such a dark world and severing ties with his family only emboldened him further. Interestingly, he adds that when he received a request from Rockdill, the offer of financial compensation deepened his interest in Kim Ju Hayek. He hears that Kim Ju Hayek finished first place in the Valhalla entrance exams. There are rumors about him being a madman who uses abusive language to get all the guild scouts kicked out. He wonders how amusing it would be to toy with him. After fighting with Kim Ju Hayek, he questions himself, wondering who that boy is. Desira inquires about what kind of drugs he takes to become so strong, suggesting that someone like him can't afford expensive elixirs. Hayek becomes angry upon hearing this and asks if he is accusing him of using steroids. Desira calmly asks if he can't become strong without resorting to drugs, to which Hayek denies taking any drugs, attributing his strength to intense training and exercises. He makes a comparison between Desira and Oseok, implying that the latter is naturally muscular, unlike Desira, whom he accuses of being a drug addict. Annoyed by the conversation, he declares that he doesn't have the power to use magic there and draws his sword with magic. Hayek questions if he has magical powers, to which he confirms, stating that he enters power mode when provoked. Desira then warns him that he won't let him go easily. In response, Hayek attacks him questioning why anyone would wait for their opponent to charge up. After that, he punches him, grabs him by the hair, and remarks that he can't go losing his mind just yet, addressing him as a potion-drinking fool. He states that even if he's just picking a fight, he might forgive him. However, since he claimed he would take care of him, he can't let him off easily. He mentions having something to ask him and instructs him to keep his teeth clenched. In the Valhalla dormitory, Rockdil sits in his room contemplating that perhaps Desira has taken good care of Ju Hayak. He thinks from the perspective of Desira's personality, closely wondering if Desira might have even killed him. He thinks that managing all of this after his murder will be difficult, but at least he won't be seen in the school's corridors anymore. He doesn't expect Desira to leave at such a perfect time. He's in a very good mood and tells Yuria to get a car. As soon as Desira's call comes in, he breaks into a big smile, answers the call, and asks if he has taken care of him. Upon hearing the call, his facial expressions change, emotions shift, and beads of sweat start to form. A voice tells him that he probably has no idea what's going on, considering how far his jaw has dropped. He's surprised to hear Kim Juhyok's voice, who tells him that if he tries to translate what his brother is saying if he dies, he wants him to burn two incense sticks for him. Rockdil shouts at him in anger. Kim Ju Hyuk is on a call with Rockdil to talk, but he hangs up without responding. Kim Ju Hyuk gazes at the phone and comments dismissively in a nonchalant manner about how rude he is for ending the call without even responding. He turns towards Desira, who lies sprawled on the untidy ground and questions himself about what he should do with him. Yuria brings the tea and Rockdil is told to take it while he sits angrily. She insists that he take his tea, but he sharply retorts to leave it on the table and leave. 
She complies after placing the tea, and he sits angrily, contemplating thoughts about Kim Ju Hayuk. He never imagined that Hayuk could surpass Desira, especially after the incident with Rarik. Now he realizes that Hayuk is the mastermind. He wonders if Desira messed up and thinks soon the Venturk family will hear about it. He feels that things have gotten too out of hand, and sweat drips from him as he ponders all of this. Then he forcefully puts his mind to it, thinking that it can't be a big issue because Hayek is connected to a lowly background. He believes they may not reach them, but Hayek should not come forward about this for a while. He decides to keep an eye on him. As Kim Ju Hayek is on his way, Barch asks him if the boy he fought with had forgotten to bring his brain when he came here. Lost in his thoughts, Kim Ju Hayek decides that when the time comes, he will report him. For now, he will keep the information to himself since there is nothing more for him to do. Barch then asks if he didn't kill him. Hayek replies that if it had happened in his past, he would have knocked him out, but now he can't do that because he is not Kim Hyun Oh anymore. He is now a high schooler, Kim Ju Hayek. Barch tells him he is right, but is worried about something. Hayek inquires why he is concerned, to which Barch replies that he is talking about the magic that Guy released earlier, as it felt strangely familiar to him. Hayek asks how he is familiar with it. Barch explains that if he had released more magic, he could have confirmed it, but he has detected magical-like threads before. He asks Hayek if he sensed anything, mentioning that 300 years ago, monsters sacrificed dogs and cows to use that kind of black magic. Barch adds that Hayek is not skilled at distinguishing people by their magic, as it's a more delicate skill than he thinks. He suggests that the concealed aspect of the blade mentioned by the guy might be connected to those abilities, to which Hayek responds that perhaps it is. Hayek reflects on the time when he asked Desira, who told him to look for him. He forcefully corrects his jaw, previously dislocated by him with a punch, and asks Desira to tell him who ordered him to follow him. He remains silent prompting Hayek to remark that he readjusted his jaw to let him answer. He insists that staying silent is not the correct thing to do and grabs Desira's hand, forcefully squeezing his fingers. Desira, in pain, asks what he is doing with his hand. Hayek continues to squeeze his fingers tightly, threatening to break the rest of them, unless he tells him the truth. He then informs him that Rockdale Ventric told him to look after him. Hayek expresses surprise, wondering if it's the person who bullied him before, he asks about Desira's identity and affiliation, noting that he doesn't seem like a Valhalla student. Desira responds that they don't know who he is. Hayek asserts that he will find out sooner or later and threatens to break Desira's remaining two fingers if he doesn't introduce himself. Desira reveals that he is a member of the first species and takes care of many commissions as a mercenary. Hayek recalls hearing about the first species before and comments that being a mercenary must be fun, as one can bully and get paid. Desira dismisses everyone as trash in his eyes, branding Hayek as just a guy with good luck. Desira explains that the first species worships the constellation known as the Hidden Side of the Blade, revealing himself to be someone contracted to a constellation as well. He adds that if he could have charged up his magic for 30 more seconds, the outcome of the fight would have been different. He retorts, criticizing his tendency to talk excessively, implying that he would have let him go if he had remained silent and revealed his affiliation accurately. He then punches him in the face again, shaking his jaw, and insists that silence is better. Hayek, while searching on his mobile about the first species, finds information describing them as a group of evil people who worship the hidden side of the blade. This convinces him that they are indeed an evil group. Setting aside his thoughts about them, he expresses frustration that he couldn't find his notes and feels annoyed that Rockdale keeps trying to make him look shady. He then considers how Rockdale could mess up this cover and decides that in this day and age, he needs to use modern techniques. Firstly, he recorded all of Disera's confessions and now needs to find a place to upload this. Instructor Lilia feels happy upon receiving a call from Ju Hayek. After attending the call, she expresses her happiness, mentioning that he's finally ready to become her assistant. Ju Hayek informs her that he didn't call for that purpose, he just wants to ask if she knows any news reporters. The next scene begins with Desira, who is scared to death. In front of him stands a red-eyed man wielding a knife, saying that he should die as the first species does not need a guy like him. Desira screams in fear, crouching with folded knees, the red-eyed man attacks with a knife, striking Desira and bringing him down. 
In the Ventric family, Rockdill Ventric and his father Eden Ventric stand with bowed heads in front of Adelia Ventric. Adelia calls Rockdill and asks him what he is planning to do, noticing sweat dripping from his face. They apologize to her. Adelia asks why they are seeking forgiveness and questions if everything will be okay with their apology. She insists on knowing in detail what compelled them to commit such an evil act and if they want to take care of Kim Ju Hayek. Rockdill replies affirmatively. Upon hearing his response, she becomes furious and exclaims if he is really doing all this for him and if he is providing her with this clarification. She accuses him of acting alone because he believes Kim Ju Hayek insulted the Ventric family but asserts that it is really his own pride that is hurt. Additionally, she points out that due to his actions, it is he who tarnishes the reputation of the Ventric family. He stands before her, bowing down and apologizing. She asks what they should do, and Rockdale replies that he is willing to do anything to restore the honor of his family. She tells him that the only way to recover is by excommunicating him, leaving him stunned. His father adds his perspective, and she responds to her father that he also wants to be expelled. She stands there, lost in thoughts, considering that she would rather have him killed or excommunicated instantly, but that would definitively reveal that it was Rockdill who ordered Desira to attempt the murder. After contemplating, she tells Rockdill that she won't expel him for the moment. She instructs him to return to Valhalla and keep his mouth shut until she has met with Kim Jo Hayek to thoroughly think it through. Rockdill expresses his gratitude and she instructs them to leave. As they walk through the corridor, Rockdill appears to be saying something, but his father advises him to stay quiet and avoid discussing such matters there. Rockdill questions his father, asking if he hasn't heard what the family said, expressing concern that they might excommunicate him now or at any time. He explains that the media is closely watching them, preventing him from taking any immediate action. Rockdill adds that once things settle down, he plans to reveal it when nobody expects it, but he needs to handle something first, and he expects his father to assist him. His father responds, whatever it is, keep it quiet here. Hayek considers that the head of the Ventric family intends to carry out Rockdale's punishment. He wonders if she's coming to see him because she has no other choice, finding the situation annoying. Li Jun mentions that both instructor Li Sangqiao and he are troubled by the incident. Initially, a Valhalla student was attacked, and then the attacker confessed that Rockdale had ordered the attack. However, it's challenging to believe that they are trying to protect their family's reputation by downplaying the recorded confession. In any case, they are busy trying to cover up the truth. But for the safety of their students, either Rockdill or the Ventric family head needs to be expelled. However, not too long ago, the Ventric family donated a large sum of money to the school. It's surprising that most of Valhalla's funding comes from donations from prominent families. Upon hearing this, Hayek remarks that the school might overlook things if they receive sufficient money. He expresses his intention to have a conversation with the so-called family head. Li Jun is astonished at his normal reaction, stating that he always remains composed. Then, there is a knock on the door, and Li Jun mentions that she has arrived, indicating that he will let her in and take his leave, wishing them a good chat. As Li Jun opens the door, he finds himself facing the head of the Ventric family, Adelia Ventric. He greets her with a bow and offers hospitality, to which she expresses gratitude. She then introduces herself as Adelia Ventric, the head of the Ventric family. Hayek responds with a smile, expressing his pleasure to meet her. Adelia Ventric stands before Kim Jo Hayek and apologizes for Desira's actions, bowing her head in apology. Hayek mentions Desira's impending excommunication, to which Adelia acknowledges and expresses regret. However, she shifts the conversation to Rockdill's trouble at school to which Hayek dismisses it as a one-time incident, no longer significant. He then questions her, and she denies Rockdale's involvement in the incident, suggesting that the announcement was premature. She listens to his response in silence, and then proceeds to explain their official statement issued after the attack. However, she admits that neither the media nor the citizens believe it, expressing a desire to end the misunderstanding. Adelia asks for Hayok's help in resolving the situation, promising full support until his graduation and offering assistance with anything he may need. Hayek declines her offer initially, but she insists that he helps them just once, pledging her full support in return. She adds that she could even recommend him to a guild that the Vantic family sponsors so that they can continue to help him even after graduation. 
they will help him strive as a hunter in Korea so that he won't have to struggle ever again. After hearing this he says if he gives a statement, this will be the consequence of it all. He straightforwardly states they will give him all this to close his case, asserting they must be desperate. She gets furious upon hearing this. In frustration, he says to her that she wants to state it as if nothing happened, so why should he have to play along? He tells her he doesn't need any reward. All he wants is to see her live with the dishonor that Rockdale gave her. Upon hearing this, she gets angry and tells him that he even knows who he is talking to. He scoffs, saying now she's showing her true colors, it must have been challenging to hold it in. She expresses that she came to the school to make it more convenient for him, but he dares to be so arrogant she should just kill him right there and then. But she wants to be generous and give him a chance, but he is throwing it away. Kim Ju Hayek said to do whatever she wanted to do, and she mentioned before that the Ventric family had no involvement in the assault against him. They initially invested a significant amount of money and time in him to perpetuate that lie, but now they intend to harm him, that's all they can do, and even if they wanted to kill him, they cannot. She stands up in anger and tells him she will make him regret what he has done that day before leaving. He says she couldn't do anything after all, she is just talking without substance. After she leaves, Barch tells him that he does not think interfering is necessary, but that he needs to do all that. He replies to Barch that those who think they should be worshipped are the ones he hates the most. He knew what she was going to do to those who tried to put leashes on everyone, so he hated Barch as well. As he leaves, he thinks that today there is no other class besides this, so he should head to the training room early. He heads towards Valhalla Stadium, checking his phone, and his gaze falls upon Choi Aran, who is engaged in a conversation with his brother, Choi Jinjin, nearby. His brother tells him to stop thinking he can defeat him in training. No matter how much training he does in Valhalla, it won't make a difference. So if he wants to remain a member of the family, he shouldn't come to this weekend's selection test because his brother wouldn't want him to be humiliated. She denies it, and he responds by giving her one last chance and accusing her of being in denial. She tells him he doesn't understand what he's doing, and he shouts back, asking why she's saying this to him. At that moment, Kim Ju Hayek intervenes and asks him why he is stopping her from taking the test. His brother asks who he is, stating that he doesn't even know him and yet he's cursing at him. Hearing this, Kim Ju Hayek questions why everyone is showing their authority there and asserts that he doesn't care if they're a king or a president. They shouldn't trespass onto school grounds and demand something from a student. He tells them that if they are done talking, they should leave. After saying all this, he looks towards Choi Aran and asks if he said it right. After hearing everything, he informs Choi Aran that he will see her in the test and then departs. Following Choi Jingun's departure, Choi Aran expresses gratitude to Kim Joo Hyuk. He responds, suggesting that if there's no more drama, they should proceed with training. She informs him that when he asked if she agreed, she was considering saying something else. He inquires about her initial response and she begins to explain that instead of telling him to get lost after their conversation, she would have chosen a more offensive reply. He interrupts her, concluding that she's even crazier than he thought, and proposes that they proceed with training since she hasn't had any training for a week. In response, she mentions that she will be on a trip and won't be able to join. However, she suggests that they should work hard today. A few days later, near a hill, Kim Ju Hayek is doing something on his phone. Barch asks him if he is there to find his notes. He replies yes, and then Barch asks again if he has not already found a lot of relics and storage stones in his old notes. Kim Ju Hayek says yes, but he is there because he wants to know how many notes are left that have not been found yet. He believes that if he looks for them, he might discover something amazing hidden in the notes. Barch asks about something amazing, and Kim Ju Hayek expresses that if he could discover something in the notes, he believes he could overcome the major flaws he had as Kim Hyun Oh. He reflects that if he had found this knowledge earlier, maybe he wouldn't have harmed Barch 300 years ago. After saying this, he leaves. The next scene begins with the Choi Jin family reporters covering the news that today is the big day for the Choi Jin family, which is why so many people have gathered there. Choi Jansiak, the head of the Choi Jin family, tells Choi Aran and Choi Jinjin that the selection test should begin. As he said before, if they pass the selection test, they will be recognized as successors, and all those who fail the test shall be removed from the family. He asks them if they are ready, and they reply yes. 
He gives them the task and explains that the person who finds the dual blade and brings it in front of him will be recognized as the winner of this selection test. It doesn't matter how they obtain it, but killing others is strictly forbidden. Now, the task begins. Choi Aran starts to run, and Jinjin, upon seeing her, laughs, thinking that it's not an urgent test and sooner or later she will find the blade, and he will take it away from her. He is deep in thought when a call comes on his phone. As he picks up the call, someone asks him what happened with the dual blade. He explains that he needs to undergo a selection test, which could extend the process a bit. They inquire about which selection test this is. He apologizes and asks if he can somehow obtain the dual blade, will they keep the promise? They respond, stating that it's a promise made in front of the constellation and bound to be fulfilled. They advise him to focus on the target. Upon hearing this, he ends the call and thinks that it's his last chance, and he must find it. Choi Aran is tracing the direction of the dual blade with magic from her tribe, revealing the path. With determination, she mentions that in 15 minutes, she could find the dual blade with her magic. Right then, Jingon arrives and asks her if this is the direction of the dual blade. He questions if she is in the middle of finding it with the magic tracers and asks where she learned these skills. She tells him that Kim Ju Hayek taught her these skills and reflects on when he taught her. He informs her about magic control, mentioning that given her skills, she likely knows the basics. He suggests that mastering changing with thunder constitutes basic control. When she acknowledges this with a yes, he advises her to practice small magic-oriented control, not just with those big chunks. She asks how, and he replies by asking if they didn't teach her that in her family. Without providing a response, he begins teaching her, stating that she only knows how to borrow the power of the constellation and gather magic energy. She acknowledges knowing all of this, and he remarks that he's not good at it either, proceeding to teach her to relax her entire body and use her fingertips and toes to weakly extend the magic. She responds with an okay, and he instructs her to stop responding and just do as he says, following his instructions. He then guides her, telling her to spread it slowly as if she were diagnosing the magic even in every hair. As he instructs her, she continues to follow his guidance precisely. He tells her that in this state, she should try to sense the magic in the air. After sensing the magic and seeing the magical shape around Kim Ju Hayek, she immediately opens her eyes, takes a deep breath, and asks him if she sensed the magic. She informs him that she saw a magical shape around him, and he responds that exactly, that's how she can sense magic. He explains that she can notice even weak magic energy that doesn't leak from the body, and it's one of the things she can do with precise magic control. He mentions that with more training, she'll eventually see the silhouette. Unable to teach her further, he encourages her to continue learning independently. He then asks her who the guy is and suddenly realizes it's the same guy who was with her back then. He asks her if he has such talent despite looking so stupid. Upon hearing this, she feels a sense of irritation and strides towards him, declaring that he is more powerful than him and questioning why he has come here. He unsheathes his sword and asks what she thinks as he begins to strike. However, as she retaliates and pushes him back, he finds himself surprised, pondering where this sudden strength in her came from. The scene starts with Hayuk, who is using his magical skills and searching for his hidden old notes. He thinks that he has hidden many notes and so far he has only found one near Valhalla. Using his magic powers, he discovers that another note is hidden here, and he becomes determined to find it, realizing he has stumbled upon another one. His magic power guides him to the hidden notes. Aran and Jinjin are engaged in a fierce battle showcasing their skills against each other. Aran displays her complete mastery, leaving Jingun astonished. He asks her if she learned all of this from her school, and she becomes physically strong. Aran tells him to give up the dual blade, and upon hearing this, he asks if she has lost her mind. She responds by performing a move on him and says that an illegitimate child like him does not deserve the dual blade. They both engage in a magical battle and Aran unleashes attacks based on Hayek's teachings, targeting him with precision. She executes the move, causing the sword to slip from his hand. Then she thinks about Hayek's training that if the opposition drops the sword, she can take advantage of the opportunity and strike him. Then she delivers a final blow, bringing him down with her last strike. Surprisingly, Aran had harbored a modest hope of landing at least one hit on her opponent, Jinjin. 
The turn of events exceeds her expectations as she manages to strike him and deals a critical blow. Pleased with her unexpected success, she confidently declares that she will take the dual blade. As she starts to leave, Jungin asks her from behind if she has not considered that she might be winning. Turning back, she notices Jingun standing ready with his magical powers prepared for another round of combat. He states that he has told her before that the blessings she possesses are of no use and that she will never be able to defeat him, who has a contract. Jin Jin admits that she got hit while he was off guard and he will give her that. She looks at the digit magic on his sword and asks if he could be a villain. He replies, asking her what she thinks. She runs towards him with full force to strike, but with a single move, he manages to bring her down. Astonished, she realizes that he dodges her swing at such a short range. As she remains pinned, he approaches and taunts her if she will not rise now and continue the fight. She says that it would have been better if he hadn't. She tries to get up but notices a deep cut on her stomach and blood flowing. He mentions that he told her not to get up, warning her that she won't survive if she does. She becomes curious about Jinjin's contract and inquires if he is bound to an evil constellation. He responds, revealing that as the offensive leader of the Jinsa Guild, he entered into a contract within a grade constellation to maintain prestige. However, he clarifies that he has shifted allegiance and now stands with the devotees. She contemplates the devotees, having heard that they are the third most dangerous evil group in the world. Seeking further clarification, she asks him if he has made any contracts with the devotee constellation, and if he has gained any benefits from joining them, questioning if they are better than enjoying life. He questions her sincerity, asking if she is genuinely inquiring about all this, and continues, stating that incredible power, command and deviation from the need for senses are involved. He explains that when he joined the Jinsa Guild, he was only 12 years old and had been working for his family's guild icon since childhood. Despite his desire to play, he is expected to set an example as the eldest son of the Choijin family. He further explains that he is still in the Jinsa Guild because of his father's surveillance. It is never a choice. Filled with desire even into his teenage years, he meets a person from the devotees who encourages him to join them suggesting that he can satisfy the desires within his heart. He suggests that the person might have already known his temperament. When asked about his temperament, he responds that his desire is a lust towards breaking humans. He then emphasizes that he cannot join them straightforwardly. There is a condition he has to acquire the family's relic dual blade. He mentions that if she surrenders earlier, she does not need to initiate a second selection test, and he will simply be granted the dual blade. When asked about the second selection test, he responded by asking if she had heard about the elder daughter of the Choijin family, her older sister Choi Ajin, participating in the first selection test. She inquired about his older sister, asking if she had gotten lost. He informed her that during that selection test, he couldn't control his desires, and before the search for the dual blade, he had murdered her on the mountain. He confessed that despite his efforts, he couldn't locate the dual blade, suffered severe injuries, and ultimately failed the test. Reflecting on the missed opportunity, he acknowledged that he could have joined the devotees a decade ago without this setback. However, he revealed that his father discreetly discovered and hospitalized Choi Ajin to save her. Despite this, he left her there, hoping she would go missing. She asked him where she was now, and he replied that she wanted to go look for her now. He tells her that it's better for her to quit. Her mother is distressed because she sees her daughter's resemblance in her. He tells her that he knows where the dual blade is and she should get ready to meet her sister. Saying this, he starts to wage war against her. At that moment, Hayek arrives and saves her, leaving him astonished. Ju Hayek arrives, catches the flying pole with his hand and asks what they are doing. Jinjin replies that it's their family matter, mind his business. He says what kind of crazy family puts a knife in their sister's throat. Jinjin advances to strike him, but Hayek knocks him back with a single strike. Aran asks Hayek why he came here. He looks at her and thinks that he just came here to find his hidden notes by following the magical directions. He sees that she has a wound in his stomach and blood is oozing out. He then says that he was just passing through that path for his work. He instructs her to stay back and gather magic to heal her wound. She starts using magic to heal her wound. Jinjin stands up and asks if they are the same rude students he encountered in Valhalla, demanding to know how they ended up there. 
Hayek responds that it's their internal matter and instructs him to stay away. Jinjin charges toward him, using his magic to strike him. Despite standing firm, he cannot attack him, astonished at how skillfully he dodges his attacks. Hayek advises him that when stabbing, he shouldn't aim for a stationary target, but rather for someone moving like him. Then, Hayek attacks him, knocking him down. Jingen falls to the ground, pondering whether, amidst pushing him away, Hayek is actually chasing him. He starts beating him with a pole and continues until he is completely helpless. Hayek asks Aaron if she is okay and if she can walk. She replies that she will try. They both look towards Jinjin and notice some magic emanating from within him. Barch asks him if that magic is related to the sword. He responds that he suspected Jinjin wasn't good news. Then Jingun stands up and his sword emits magical vibrations. He tells Hayek that he's just a freshman at Valhalla and questions what makes him think he can defeat a guild offense leader. He attempts to strike, but Hayek once again halts his sword with a counter charm. Hayek wonders how he managed to stop the magic. He tells Jingun that he seems to have adopted a defensive position that suits him. Despite Jingun's attempts to strike, none of his attacks seem to work. He ponders if this 17-year-old boy is really that powerful as he deflects all attacks and counterattacks effortlessly. Jingun realizes he can't do much more and decides to resort to using artificial remains to contract with a constellation despite its side effects. He extracts the remains from his pocket and consumes them, causing magical energy to emanate from him. Meanwhile, reporters at the entrance of the selection test site announce that an earthquake has begun. They also notice something in the sky, a magical power rising in wisps of smoke. Their father, Choi Jansiak, also sees this. He is astonished and thinks that it must be sword magic and that it's unusual for the general public to see dual blade locations. He acknowledges that it's a tradition not to involve himself in the middle of the selection test, but he deems the situation dangerous and decides to go take a look himself. Hayek stands before him and mentions that he is observing his actions, noting that he just boosted his magic. Jinjin explains that it's an extra effect and part of the power he gained from the provisional contract with a constellation and declares that Hayek will die now. At that moment, a dragon constellation appears behind him. A powerful dragon-like being, called a constellation, appears behind Jinjin. This dragon talks about its abilities and how it's drawn to important relics. But suddenly, he gets scared and leaves in a hurry. Jinjin calls out to the dragon, but it says he is breaking their agreement and leaving. This makes Jinjin unleash all his magic powers. Hayuk, seeing this, wonders and hits Jinjin with his pole, knocking him down from far away. The next scene begins with the devotee's leader, the Dragon King Hannibal, who appears to be in trouble. He sees a message on a screen in front of him, which says that the dragon that kills all blames him for getting into massive trouble and asks if he wants to disappear from the mortal plane. Hannibal bows in front of the screen, seeking forgiveness with a lowered posture. The screen tells him that the dragon that kills all warns him not to distribute artificial relics in the future and Hannibal stammers, seeking forgiveness again. The screen replies to him that the dragon that kills all instructs him to behave well. When the screen disappears from his sight, he looks up, contemplating what might have happened to the constellation and why it is so delayed. Then he thinks that from the artificial relic, he can see that the person he planted in the Choijin family has done something wrong and ponders that he got into massive trouble. He wonders if he's scared of something and addresses Sir Constellation, saying he must find out what's happening. In the Valhalla dormitory, Kim Ju Hayek enters his room and takes a book from his bag titled God Art. Barch asks him what it is, and he replies that it's the main thing he's looking for, the reason he's searching for the notes, and explains that it's a breathing technique that can raise magic power to a very high level. Barch asks him if there is a difference between the breathing techniques he used before his reincarnation and those he used before, to which he replies that the breathing technique he used before was garbage. He bought it from the market, mastered it, and used it until the very end when he was a puny little thing. Hearing this, Barch reacts as if not everything makes sense to him. Hayek recalls finding God art 300 years ago and reflects on how he couldn't change his breathing technique because it had become a habit. During a fight with Barch, he was beaten due to his bad breathing and running out of magical power. Now with a new body, he plans to take a break from physical training and focus on learning the God art first. Barch asks him about the fight and questions why he left his injured classmate with the same guy who harmed him. 
Hayek explains that he went there because he heard someone was coming and assumed the situation would be resolved somehow. He then thinks back to the fight where he struck Jinjin for the last time, and he fell lifeless to the ground. Barch asks if he killed him, to which he responds that he couldn't kill him now because he is entangled in another Valhalla issue. He explains that there is still magic left in Jinjin, so it means he will survive. Then he asks Arin if she can get up now, and she confirms. As he hears someone approaching, he speculates that Choi Arin's family might be coming to see them after the sword magic incident. He tells Choi Arin that her family is coming, so she shouldn't do anything and should stay still. He mentions that he has to go to some work, not disclosing anything about the situation, just letting them know that she has taken care of it. He expended a considerable amount of energy, so the final blow proved overwhelming. She responds, saying that they will meet at school. Lying on his bed, he contemplates that now that he has mastered the god's arts, he will retrieve the remaining storage stone. During the last encounter, his limited magic capacity prevented him from absorbing all of their magic power. Today, he will simply take a break. At the Choijin family's press conference, reporters bombard the head of the Choijin family with questions. Choi jin -seok expresses half-hearted gratitude for the press, acknowledging their participation in the selection test and the coverage they provided. He mentions that the articles had gone out and everyone had already read them, portraying the Choi jin family in a highly negative light, stating that they are involved with the world's worst gang of evildoers, the devotees. Choi jin -seok becomes distressed after hearing about the article, stating that he can't believe there is evil within the Choi jin family. In addition, he mentions receiving an official letter from the association. He retorts that when something similar happened with the Ventric family across the sea, it had nothing to do with their work, so they stayed silent. However, he acknowledges that the same approach won't work anymore. His assistant informs him that Choi Jingun has been handed over to the police. Choi Jinseok then inquires about Arin and is told that she has been sent to the family hospital for treatment. He asks about Arin's health and the response is that the wound is sizable, but the bleeding has stopped. None of her organs were damaged, and she just needed minor surgeries. Upon hearing this, he takes a sigh of relief. A reporter mentions that articles about Choi Arin have also been published. He reads the article aloud and explains that she mentioned a genius who beat a member of the devotees as a mere student at Valhalla Academy, following in Kim Ju Hayek's footsteps. Choi Arin wiped out a member of the devotees, he mentions that there are more similar articles. Upon hearing this, Choi jin -seok becomes angry and turns against her family, and the articles are happy about that. One of the reporters mentions that this selection has ended in chaos, but the next family head has been confirmed. These kinds of articles will help her firmly establish her position as the successor. After hearing this, Choi jin -seok thinks that it's a good thing that Arin has a legitimate chance to succeed. However, the circumstances surrounding her defeating Jinjin by herself seem strange. He thinks about the time when everyone confronts Choi Arin. Jinjin and Arin reveal that brother came at her with evil magic, so she knocked him out. He asks her if a lot of magic appeared over the mountains. How did she beat him? So she told him Kim Ju Hyuk had taught her. The articles mentioned that Kim Ju Hyuk openly cursed out guild officers. In Valhalla, Hayek enters the classroom and sees that Choi Arin is already seated there. He thought she would be hospitalized, but she conducted it perfectly. She looks towards him and gestures with her hand. Behind him, two guys pass by. One senses that Choi Arin is looking at him, smiling and waving. The other tells him to stop dreaming during the day. Kim Ju Hayek is studying magic from a book in his room, when he receives a message on his mobile from Choi Arin. She says she doesn't think she will be able to attend the training for a while because the doctor forbade her from participating in any physical activities. He ponders that with how badly she was bleeding, that's to be expected, and he replies that it's okay. He is going to do his own thing for the next few days, so she should do what she pleases. After that, she unknowingly sends a flurry of emojis. He responds annoyingly, saying that she just sends one text at a time. Barch tells him that he needs to know, he asks what that is. He explains black magic to him, and the encounter feels familiar at this time. He asks Barch if he remembers anything about that, and he replies that he doesn't, and it's not that he just forgets about it. It feels like something is preventing him from remembering it. Hayek asks him what is stopping him, whether it's not about the person he mentioned earlier. Barch mentions that it is possible, although he's not completely certain. 
He suggests that satisfying the second condition might help him overcome the mental block, but he acknowledges that it's just a theory. He contemplates the second condition related to the Valhalla Eye of the Great Forest, which is also known as Megadella Rona's house. The Eye of the Great Forest serves as a location for performance assessments and hosts the final practical exam. Those with the lowest combined scores from the midterm and final exams face expulsion. He wonders if he'll have to wait until the final session. However, he decides that he needs some time to get used to Shingong anyway, so he plans to search for the Eye of the Great Forest. While he's contemplating this, instructor Li Jun enters the class and instructs everyone to take their seats. Before conducting the class, he announces a significant announcement. Barch reminds him that they were supposed to announce this after the midterm exam. Li Jun assures them that their school is considering selecting participants based on the highest final exam score. After this announcement, Li Jun asks Kim Ju Hayek to see him in the office, expressing the need to meet in person. In the office, Li Jun mentions that they often meet there, to which Kim Ju Hayek responds that it's because Li Jun keeps summoning him there. Li Jun tells him that he needs to talk to him about his participation in the inter school competition. Kim Ju Hayek denies participating in the competition, to which Li Jun responds by saying that he doesn't know the important matter yet, and that Kim Ju Hayek has already denied it. Kim Ju Hayek then asks what the inter school competition is about. Li Jun explains that he mentioned it in class in great detail, but since Kim Ju Hayek didn't pay attention, he will now explain it. He describes the competition as involving the three largest hunter training institutions in the world, Korea's Valhalla, China's White Lotus, and the USA Heroes. Each school selects several of its first-year students as representatives to participate in the competition, which includes sparring, escaping a labyrinth, and much more. They plan to send those who score the highest in the practical exam. Kim Jo Hayek reacts as if he has no interest in all of this after hearing. Li Jun asks him if he is not interested in this at all. If their school were to get first place, all the participants would not only receive scholarships but also other benefits. He tells him that besides this, they can offer him money and other incentives, but he's still not interested. Li Jun tells him that he must head into the eye of the great forest soon. Upon hearing this, his eyes widened, and he asked about the Eye of the Great Forest. Li Jun further explains that's where the final exam will take place. The inter-school competition will take place in Valhalla, and the final task will be entering the Eye of the Great Forest. It will be the same as the final exam, and of course, those who complete that task will be exempt from having to take the final exam. But if they fail to complete it, they will have to try again during the final season. Hayek replies, saying okay, he got it. He will enter the inter-school competition. In the United Kingdom, Ventric states that the head of the Ventric family, Adelia, asks her assistant about the preparations, to which he replies that they are proceeding smoothly and that the preparations will likely take another month to complete. Then she asks about the Valhalla students Kim Ju Hayek and Rockdale. He responds that there are no irregularities to report regarding their movement. She tells them to inform her immediately when they feel something is amiss. Then he informs her that although it has nothing to do with them, some unsettling news has reached their ears, they are constructing a building made of paper bills in the market. She repeats this and asks them about the building made of paper. He replies that they believe Black Cat is directly responsible for this. She thinks about what she wants to do because she has never done something like that before. Then, a screen appears before her and states that the beak mask orders her to speak in greater detail. She turns toward the screen and calls to Sir Constellation. In the Territory 7 market, a black cat talks to someone, questioning the purpose behind constructing a building entirely out of paper bills, stating that they will do anything that the Constellation asks of them. The reply is that it is a gift for him. When the black cat sees a message on the screen, it asks why it was told to build a money building. The screen replies that Two-Face Ruler called it a gift. The black cat then asks who the gift is for, but there's no answer. Then, another message pops up, asking if they found the person who sold the ring. The black cat responds that it hasn't been determined yet, as all they have is the basic facial structure and voice of the person, and they search through available records for any contact information. Then the screen appears with the message hurry up repeatedly. In the Valhalla staff room, Li Jun is working on something when the main instructor, Li Sangqiao, arrives and asks if they have chosen all the members for the competition. 
Li Jun confirms this, and Sang Jiao asks to see the list, which includes Kim Ju Hyok's name at the top. Li Jun reveals that except for Young Jin, everyone else is from his class. Sang Chiu questions how it would be possible for even Kim Ju Hyok to participate. Li Jun informs him that he initially refused but changed his mind upon learning that the competition was happening in the eye of the Great Forest. Sipping tea, Sang Chiu remarks that it's strange how people get nervous about these competitions and asks Li Jun if Ju Hyok knows that the eye of the Great Forest is a high-level competition. He speculates that Kim Ju Hyok's tendency to sleep during classes could explain his behavior and he wonders if Kim Ju Hayek has a hidden motive for attending the school. He then asks Lee Jun if he could gather the kids for training, to which Lee Jun agrees, saying he will free up their schedules. They wish each other good luck, and Sang Chiao leaves. A few days later, all the participating students are seated in the Valhalla small auditorium. Instructor Sang Chiao enters the auditorium and asks if everyone has gathered there. Then, he stands in front of the students and introduces himself, mentioning that there are five people present. He expresses pleasure in meeting them all and introduces himself as compact instructor Sang Chiu. He then explains that they are gathered there due to their participation in the upcoming inter-school competition. He proceeds to outline the training they will undergo, consisting of three tasks. The first task is a duel between the students, similar to the enrollment test. The second task involves a team fight, where the school's five members will form a team and compete against other schools simultaneously. The leader's situational adaptive ability will be crucial in this task. The third task is related to the Eye of the Great Forest, which instructor Sang Chiu describes as a labyrinth. He provides some information about the Eye of the Great Forest, describing it as a forest full of trees with a heavily guarded gate designed to block unauthorized entry. He mentions that each team will enter the Eye of the Great Forest, but a specific task will be given to them on the day of the competition. Since there isn't much else to cover, he concludes the briefing. After explaining the team fight's specifics and format, instructor Sang Chiu outlines the training plan. Hayek, having some experience working as a team during the dungeon raid, thinks to himself about the complexities of the upcoming tasks and whether he can effectively navigate them. He considers the challenges of the Eye of the Great Forest and ponders if rushing in will be as simple as it appears. Sang Chiu concludes his explanation and proceeds to detail the training regimen. Ju Hayek asks if it would be okay to train alone, to which Sang Chiu responds affirmatively, stating that anyone who wishes to train alone may do so. Similarly, when Aran inquires about training alone, Sang Chiu permits it without hesitation. Following these inquiries, Sang Chiu wraps up the session, expressing his expectation to see everyone during training. After Sang Chiu departs, the students gradually leave the auditorium. After instructor Sang Chiu leaves, the students also start leaving, but Kim Ju Hayek remains seated, lost in deep thought. He thinks that before the competition begins, he will have mastered the technique at the very least. He will absorb all of the mana and be in top condition once it starts, and any time he has left will be spent training his body. When Choi Aran notices Kim Ju Hayek is lost in thought, she asks if she can train with him. He reminds her that she had initially planned to train alone and mentions her inability to engage in strenuous activity due to her injuries. Reflecting on her conversation with Lee Jun regarding her participation, she recalls his awareness of her condition from reading the articles and his decision to ask her directly about her willingness to participate. Lee Jun inquires about her decision, prompting her to ask Kim Ju Hayak if he will participate. He confirms his participation, and she agrees to join as well. When Lee Jun asks how she will manage her unhealed wounds, she assures him that she is fine. In her thoughts, she acknowledges her progress toward becoming the family head. She expresses gratitude to Hayak for helping her discover a new goal to become stronger alongside him and support him in achieving his aspirations, just as he had supported her. While lost in thought, Kim Ju Hayek interrupts her reverie, asking why she suddenly stopped talking and started laughing oddly. He reminds her to avoid strenuous training and suggests focusing on mana control, advising her to stick to light activities such as walking. She agrees, and he promises to assist her further after completing his tasks. During the nighttime, the sound of a person's pleas for mercy and forgiveness echoes as they beg to be spared. Two figures stand before them, with one holding a knife. The wounded person bears severe injuries, marked by deep wounds across their body. 
Lisa, identified as Il Shinya Samsel, questions why they can't expedite the process, while Al, another individual present, dismisses the idea, citing the lack of excitement in doing so. Lisa then inquires about a new assignment, prompting Al to reveal it's an assassination target, specifically a Valhalla student. The scene shifts to Al stabbing the wounded person in the stomach, with a conversation between Al and Lisa continuing. Al questions their motive for targeting a student, to which Lisa suggests it's due to substantial payment from the client. Al seeks clarification on the deadline, leading Lisa to check the mobile screen, indicating they have a month to execute the kill, coinciding with the inter-school competition. Following this, they depart, discussing the possibility of an immediate execution. Lisa highlights the challenges posed by tight school security, magic blocking barriers, and targeting a student within the dormitory. Al expresses concerns about the heightened risks during the inter-school competition due to the presence of other schools. Lisa then reveals details about the competition's third-day assignment at the Eye of the Great Forest, a maze constructed from the forest itself. She explains that the task involves students navigating through this maze. When Al questions the presence of instructors in the forest, Lisa clarifies that there will be none, aside from a small flying surveillance drone. Excluding a few guards stationed at the entrance of the maze, all instructors and teachers are observing from the monitoring room. After grasping the situation, he comments that they'll need to lay low after hearing from Olia, adding that deciding who will infiltrate them isn't enjoyable. She responds that completing the job is more important. One month later, the inter-school competition commences and all the students cheer happily. Rockdill sits quietly in the audience, observing and contemplating. Later in his room, while conversing with his father, he mentions receiving money. His father asks what he intends to do with it, to which he responds that he used it to pay a commission. He explained that he requested Il Shinja to connect with Kim Juhyuk. When his father asks if he paid them a commission, he assures his father that there's no link between him and his actions, but this time he will ensure it. He informs his father that Ilshinja's Samsel accepted the commission. In response to his father's inquiry about Samsel, he mentions having heard of them as Il Shinya's senior assassination team, known for their formidable collaboration as a trio. His father advises him not to draw attention to himself and ends the call. While seated in the audience, he reflects on Il Shinya's response, mentioning that they stated they would handle Kim Juyuk during the competition and concluding that there's no need for him to remain there and watch. After considering all this, he suggests to Yuria that they should leave. The chairman of Valhalla's board, Shim Diakun, introduces himself and expresses gratitude to the students who come to witness the competition. Before the competition, he announces the need for introductions to the representatives from each school. First, it is from China White Lotus, then from the USA Heroes, and finally from South Korea Valhalla. He explains that the competition will last three days, with today's task being an individual sparring match. Then, he instructs the representatives of each school to proceed to their waiting rooms and await the match fixtures. The main combat instructor, Lee Sangxiao, is also present when Heroes senior instructor, Jack Rover, arrives, mentioning that it has been a while since they last met. Sanctiol informs him that they secured third place. In response, Rover insists not to speak to him like that and adds that aside from that, Valhalla didn't come in first place. He asserts that this year will be different because heroes will indeed take first place. Sanctiol questions how he can say it with such confidence and inquires if he knows about the pinnacle of all contractors. The one Rover confirms his knowledge and mentions that the individual called Destroyer is Logan's son, Logan Juar, a freshman in their school who comes as a representative. After this exchange, Sanctual states that he will see if Logan GR is worthy, adding that the boy has already contracted with his father's constellation. Sanctual inquires about the contract and whether he employs the same destruction as the one. He responds that he can use it to some extent, but not as proficiently as his father. Then he laughs and mentions hearing about Valhalla's new students, particularly highlighting Kim Jo Hayek's feat of apprehending a villain. Sanctual confirms this and adds that Choi Aran accomplished something similar to Kim Ju Hayek after that incident. Jack Rover expresses satisfaction, stating that Logan Juar will now have good competition because the kid has already easily defeated prominent contractors. Sanctual doesn't react seriously to Rover's statement, prompting Rover to question his lukewarm reaction. Then, an announcement is made, revealing the participants for the first round. 
At that moment, a screen appears in front of Sanctuol, and he tells Jack Rover that he will understand his lukewarm reaction after this round. Round 1 begins between Valhalla's Kim Jo Hayek and Heroes Logan Juar. Both participants stand face to face in the field. Chairman Shim Diakun explains that the rules are the same for all upcoming matches and details them. He states that the one who defeats their opponent wins, and even if they hit a vital point with a weapon, the stadium system will automatically reduce the damage and send electrical impulses causing pain identical to that of the target. He encourages them to give their all, mentioning that there will be no interference. The protection system will remain active until the next team match, and he advises the participants to keep that in mind. After the countdown, they will begin when he says start. After making this announcement, the chairman initiates the countdown. After hearing the announcement, Kim Ju Hayek thinks to himself that the reason they are using the protection system becomes apparent. Barch advises him to keep fighting in the competition for the first two days so he can properly participate in the task on the third day. As the countdown ends, the chairman instructs them to start the match. He advances to fight, and as he begins to strike, Logan Juer grabs his fist, questioning what makes him think he is strong. In the scene on the field, Logan Ju grabs Kim Ju Hayek's fist and questions him about his strength. Kim Ju Hayek modestly responds that he still has a long way to go. Logan Ju acknowledges his modesty and engages in the fight. However, Kim Ju Hayek grabs his hand, delivers a strong punch, and informs him that he is still improving, questioning how much longer Logan Ju can withstand his blows. He then hits Logan Ju with a punch, knocking him back. Falling to the ground, Logan Jr. acknowledges his strength, admitting that he thought Kim Ju Hayek would be knocked down with one punch. Meanwhile, instructors Lee sang and Jack Rover watch the fight. Lee sang remarks on Logan Jr.'s strength for withstanding Kim Ju Hayek's powerful blow, while Jack Rover mentions having seen Kim Ju Hayek's performance in the admission ranking competition video. He notes that Kim Ju Hayek was not as formidable back then but adds that it's not over yet, as Logan hasn't used destruction yet. In the ensuing fight, Logan gears up again, creating magic on his hands and striking Kim Jo. Using the magic, Kim Ju Hayek's hair gets cut, surprising him, and Logan kicks him, causing him to fall backward. Kim Ju Hayek ponders that his hair wouldn't have been cut if it weren't a clean strike, wondering if it's some kind of smashing ability. On the other hand, after taking another blow, Logan thinks he has only allowed two effective hits to his stomach, but feels like he will faint. He decides that if he can't get a hit with his destruction, there is no point in using it, and he resolves to give it another try. He rises again and tightens the grip on his broomstick with both hands. The floor shatters under the broom's weight, leaving Kim Ju Hayek astonished. He questions what his opponent is doing and why the floor is being destroyed. Meanwhile, Kim Ju Hayek thinks that if his opponent can dodge his attacks by seeing them, he will have to attack from a place his opponent can't see. Attempting to attack from behind, he becomes distressed when Kim Ju Hayek sees it, realizing he was tricked again. However, he continues to attack, but Kim Ju Hayek counters with a punch, noting that his opponent was hiding behind the tiles to attack him and suggesting it would be easier to find him if he used magic. With a powerful punch, Kim Ju Hayek knocks him down. After this, Shim Seokun announces that the round has ended, declaring Kim Ju Hayek from Valhalla Academy as the winner. Lee sang comments on how unfazed Ju Hayek is, describing him as a monster. The next round is between White Lotus High's Lee Hui Anpyeong and Kim Ju Hayek, with Kim Ju Hayek emerging as the winner. The subsequent round features heroes Lee Bella against Kim Ju Hayek, with Kim Ju Hayek winning again. In the individual match between Kim Ju Hayuk and Choi Arin. She acknowledges that they have reached the final round, with both remaining competitors from Valhalla, ensuring the Academy's victory. She expresses her indifference towards winning the scholarship and considers conceding. However, Kim Ju Hayuk states that he also doesn't care who wins but decides not to concede. He emphasizes the importance of demonstrating their combat skills and urges Choi Arin to show him how much she has improved, assuring her that he will account for her injury. Choi Arin agrees and charges forward to attack, engaging in a fierce battle with Kim Ju Hayek. As everyone watches eagerly, Kim Ju Hayek manages to knock her down with a single strike. The chairman then announces the result, declaring Kim Ju Hayek as the winner of the year's individual fighting school competition. 
Barch reminds him of his promise to pay attention to Choi Aran's wound and not attack her. He reflects that he did hold back, avoiding hitting her in the stomach and instead improvising a move to make her face downwards by striking her sword down with his fist. He acknowledges his increased robustness and mana capacity, noting that Choi Aran has also become stronger. In the Valhalla Auditorium, Instructor Sanchial applauds the students for their performance and thanks the protection system for keeping them uninjured. He advises them to check themselves for any scratches and visit the infirmary if needed, to which all students respond affirmatively. Sanchial then informs them about the formation for the next day, prompting Kim Ju Hayuk to feel impatient about waiting for the eye of the forest. When Sanchial suggests concluding the team meeting and getting some rest, Kim Ju Hayuk expresses his desire to proceed with the last assignment immediately. Sanchial agrees, but mentions that such a situation has never occurred before, indicating he needs to check the rulebook. After reviewing the rules, Sanchual mentions there are two relevant rules but does not elaborate further. The inter-school competition committee assigns only one basic task to the students every day, but there are exceptions. If the assignment is completed before the afternoon, students may proceed to the next assignment at the discretion of the teacher. The second rule states that if the venue needs appropriate preparation or if the students are not in suitable condition, they can either prepare to carry out the assignment again or move on to the next assignment if it proves too difficult. Sanchiel repeated the rule to no one, indicating it's at their discretion. Upon hearing this, Hayek expresses happiness and agrees to start the next assignment in the afternoon if he finishes early. He bids Sanchiel farewell and leaves. As he exits, Barch asks if he plans to finish the Eye of the Forest in just one day. Hayek confirms, relieved that he knew about the assignment beforehand. Barch then asks if that means he will try leading the students from the other academies, to which he angrily clarifies that he only mentioned the second assignment, not the first one. Barch acknowledges the misunderstanding, and Ju Hayek thinks to himself that he has no time to lose. The next day, all the participants are once again gathered in the auditorium, and Chairman Shim Diakun greets them, announcing the second assignment of the inner interschool competition. He reveals that the challenge for the day was a team mock battle, where each academy's five participants would compete against each other in a face-off in the mountains. He explained that the game would be played on rough terrain, with the audience watching a live broadcast on a hologram and a drone equipped with a camera capturing the entire trial from above. The students are actively engaging in the exercise. Yu Soyan wonders why Kim Ju Hayuk has not arrived yet, as the game is about to start. Just then, he shows up and apologizes, explaining that he overslept, causing him to be late. She expressed frustration, reminding him of the time and the importance of the event. She scolds him for being 30 minutes late and asks if he has not heard the teacher's announcement. He responds that he is preoccupied with something else at the time and apologizes again, stating that he will take care of everything. Foyan reiterates that this is not an individual game, but a team battle, emphasizing that both heroes and White Lotus will target him, and he can't go alone. She suggests seeking input from the rest of the team. Choi Aran raises her hand and offers to accompany him, but he declines, stating that he is alone enough. Soyan addresses Choi Aran, explaining that her concern is not a complaint. Kim Ju Hayuk tells her to conserve her energy and announces that the battle will begin within five seconds. After hearing the announcement, he mentioned having another game to play in the afternoon and then left. Soyan calls out to him, asking whom he is referring to, and demands an answer. He responds that he has to prepare for the Eye of the Forest. As the game starts, he stands alone to face the four White Lotus team members positioned in front of him. Seeing Kim Juhiak alone, the White Lotus team becomes more fearful, and one of them whispers that he is from the current Valhalla top student, so everyone should be careful. Engaging in battle, he remarks that they reacted faster than he thought. Suddenly, the screen displays that the White Lotus team is eliminated, and Logan Juar is surprised, wondering how the White Lotus got eliminated. It's only been 10 minutes since the battle started, and the students from Valhalla have already defeated them. He reflects that Valhalla students went straight to White Lotus, moving fast because they thought they would be attacked first. Logan stands with his team, and one of them detects magic from Kim Ju Hayek's direction. When asked if it's the guys from Valhalla, Logan clarifies that it's just one person. He instructs his team members to keep up their magic shields and asks Melissa to prepare her enhancement magic while instructing Abella to reinforce their shield. 
Melissa questions why they need to do so much for just one person, but Logan insists that if he is Kim Ju Hyuk, then they need to take these precautions. Abella remarks that Melissa doesn't know about him because she hasn't fought him before, adding that he doesn't have the skills of a high schooler. Logan dismisses the comparison and they sense that the magic has disappeared. They consider leaving with one of them, possibly Abella, suggesting that they may have gone back after taking a peek. At that moment, Kim Ju Hayak starts attacking them from above, and Logan realizes that he's above them as he moves forward with his stick to counterattack. He begins attacking Abella, who starts shouting. Kim Ju Hayak comments to her that she noticed him too slowly. While Melissa creates magic bullets and throws them, he questions her actions, asking if shooting a lump of magic is really appropriate in the situation. He knocks them all down, and the screen displays that the heroes are eliminated. Pleased with the outcome, he remarks that he can now move on to the Eye of the Great Forest. In the Valhalla monitoring room, Chairman Shim Siakun explains how remarkable it is that Kim Ju Hayek concluded the team battle in just 23 minutes, with only 3 minutes spent on the battle itself. He expresses concern that Kim Ju Hayek has disrupted their schedule for the day, turning it into a major issue. Instructor Sangchul suggests that, as per the regulations, they can proceed with the next game on the same day, if there is sufficient time. He expresses his intention to discuss progressing to the next game with the other academy teachers. The chairman agrees and instructs Sangchul to inform him of the result after the discussion. Instructor Sangchul wonders whether Kim Ju Hayek already knew that he would quickly conclude the team battle. Later, instructors Sang Chiol and Jack Rover are walking through the corridor, and Jack mentions that they still need to talk to the teachers of the White Lotus, but the heroes don't mind if they continue with the next game. Placing his hand on Sang Chiol's shoulder, Jack expresses his conviction after watching the team battle, stating that he understands now why they call Kim Ju Hayuk a monster. Sang Chiol agrees, and they decide to talk to the White Lotus first. In the Valhalla resting room, the members of the Valhalla team are sitting comfortably. Yo Soyan looks towards Kim Ju Hayek and reflects on how unexpectedly he finished the battle by himself. She had intended to take the initiative as their teacher had instructed her to be the team leader, but ultimately, she couldn't do anything. Additionally, she recalls losing to Choi Aran in the individual matches the previous day, speculating whether Choi Aran's improvement was due to lessons from Kim Jo Hayek. Concerned about falling behind, she contemplates whether she should sacrifice some pride to ask him for guidance. Then, an announcement is made about the next day's game, Survival in the Maze, being rescheduled to one day earlier, at 1 p.m. Ju Hayek expresses that everything is unfolding as he expected. He informs his team members that he will go to the Eye of the Forest himself, and everyone should survive on their own, with the option to call out to him if they're in trouble. Yo Soyan interprets this as another solo move by him, confident that they've won the previous two games, so as long as they avoid the lowest score, they will win overall. She reassures herself that the survival labyrinth focuses on the environment rather than monsters, so they don't need to worry too much. While contemplating all this, Ju Hayek asks her if she has something to say, addressing her with a nickname. Irritated, she questions why he keeps making up nicknames for her. He playfully responds that she's only proving his point. Choi Aran intervenes, stating that Birdie is a cute nickname. Later, everyone gathers in front of the Labyrinth Gate, where Chairman Shim announces that they have arrived at the last game of the competition, Survival in the Maze, similar to the previous one. He provides information about the Labyrinth's contents and the evaluation criteria before the game begins. The Eye of the Great Forest, where today's game is being held, is described as a maze shaped like a forest with huge trees. Inside, there's a unique environment where rain incessantly falls and the monsters are low level, with rain and thick bushes posing the primary threats to survival. The objective of the game is to survive well, with the students' conditions checked upon entry and their proximity to their original condition after five hours determining their score. Combat between teams is prohibited and the game begins after the announcement. In the abandoned warehouse on site, Il Shinja Lisa and Al are discussing something when Il Shinja Samsel Alia arrives and informs them that the students have entered the Eye of the Forest. Alia suggests they head in, noting a magical blockade at the main gate manned by two individuals. Al proposes removing these two individuals first. Alia then disables all the cameras using her magic eyes, causing confusion in the monitoring room. 
Chairman Siakwoon, noticing the sudden camera outage, expresses concern, instructing the guard to contact the main gate. sang explains that the students in the labyrinth might face issues, prompting all the teachers to gather and prepare to enter the forest. However, upon reaching the gate, they discover it blocked by stones, leaving them surprised and disheartened. Meanwhile, the five hero team members stand in the jungle amidst the rain. Logan observes that Abella doesn't seem well, but she insists she's fine, attributing her condition to the rain. Logan emphasizes the importance of avoiding hypothermia and maintaining positivity, despite the challenging circumstances. He directs the team to build a small shelter, assigning tasks to each member. As he surveys the area, he notices a purple circular pattern on the ground and inquires about it. In the magical circle where Alia, Lisa, and Al stand, covering their heads with their hands to shield themselves from the rain, Lisa questions why it's raining there. Al responds, dismissing the rain's relevance and urging them to quickly finish their task. Mentioning Kim Ju Hayuk's name, Al commands them to die obediently. Seeing Logan standing in front of him, AI shouts that Alia isn't the Kim Jo Hayuk they're searching for. Alia explains that she teleported to a moderately strong magic source as she could only locate him using magic detection. Logan wonders if they intend to harm Kim Ju Hayuk. Observing the black magic surging out of the circle, he ponders if these individuals are the villains. Lisa orders not to leave any witnesses alive, including Logan, which angers Logan. Forming a magical sphere in his hand, he retaliates towards them, stating that the school competition doesn't tolerate people like them. AI advances towards Logan and stabs him from behind, prompting Logan to question how AI appeared behind him. AI clarifies that he was in front of Logan, confusing him. As Logan looks ahead, he sees another AI in front of him, astonished by the existence of two identical individuals simultaneously. Both AI and his identical then stabbed Logan with a dagger, bringing him down. Lisa inquires if Logan is properly dead, and AI responds that he will let him bleed out slowly. When Abella arrives and sees Logan lying on the ground, she starts shouting. Lisa asks Al what he is doing and instructs him to stop witnesses from seeing. Al agrees and decides to take care of them quickly, running towards Abella to attack her. The next scene starts with Kim Ju Hayek running in the forest, pondering about the location of the Metadea Rona's house and recalling the screen that displays its whereabouts. He wonders if there could be a house in the forest, noting only trees and darkness around him. Suddenly, he sees Melissa standing nearby, screaming at the sight of her comrades lying on the ground with Al beside her. Al expresses annoyance at the appearance of another witness, questioning where these people are coming from. Upon spotting Kim Ju Hayuk behind Melissa, Al is surprised and remarks that the target has come to them, speculating that he must have heard the screams and rushed there, explaining why they weren't killed immediately. Kim Ju Hayek then advises Melissa to pacify her comrades while he keeps an eye on Al and Lisa, ensuring no further harm is done to them. He observes that they are still alive, but wonders why they were left to bleed out intentionally. Addressing Al, Kim Ju Hayek demands answers to his questions, questioning if they sneaked into the forest. Al clarifies that they are trapped in the labyrinth, having smashed through the only doorway and disabled the surveillance drones. He asserts that even if the teachers noticed, they wouldn't arrive fast enough as they destroyed the gateway. Al estimates it will take at least an hour to clean up, expressing the challenge of finding the target in the dense forest within the given time frame. Al tells him that he doesn't understand what he is saying and rushes forward to confront him. Suddenly, he disappears, leaving them stunned and wondering where he vanished. Then, he approaches from behind and strikes him with his magic stick, knocking them far away from the attack. Witnessing the scene, Lisa and Olia are astonished at his strength. He then delivers a powerful blow to Lisa and Olia, knocking them down with one stroke. After knocking them down, he instructs Melissa to use her magic to heal their wounds and advises her to call for assistance from Valhalla students if she can't handle them alone, suggesting they might be found in the West. Melissa agrees to try to fix them first. As the AI revives, Kim Ju Hayek comments on his colleague's frailty. As he attempts to pick up the dagger, Kim Ju Hayek demands to know who has sent him there before he kills him. The AI evades the question, prompting Kim Ju Hayek to remark on the odd pattern of his targets revealing their senders. Planning a surprise attack with his duplicate, Kim Ju Hayek attempts to distract him with words and attacks from behind. 
However, he senses the surprise attack and is bewildered, realizing Kim Ju Hayek has used his duplicate to mask his presence. Kim Ju Hayek criticizes him for his cowardice and demands to know who sent him there, but the AI refuses to answer. In response, Kim Ju Hayek delivers a powerful blow to his head. Meanwhile, Instructor Sangchul and the other teachers arrive at the scene. The students of Valhalla are using their magic to heal their injuries, and Jack Rover asks Logan if he is okay. Logan replies that he has difficulty walking, but is overall fine. Sanctiol inquires about the situation, and Logan explains that they were attacked by villains, speculating they might be Samsel. Sanctiol then realizes that Kim Ju Hayek has defeated the attackers, marveling at his strength. The ground surrounding them had been dug up. Logan continued, saying that he had only seen him fight them while he was losing consciousness, but he was really incredible. He completely wiped the floor with the attackers that Logan could not even lay a hand on them. When they were against each other, they did not even see half of his power. Logan thought he was one of the strongest among high schoolers, but it seemed like his arrogance got the best of him. Jack Rover says to cheer up Logan, acknowledging that Kim Juhyuk's power is truly anomalous. The instructor asks him about the third attacker, and Melissa replies that Kim Ju Hayek has gone to fight, attempting to find out who is behind this and what their goal is. At that moment, Kim Hayek arrives, and the instructor assures him that he looks fine. Kim Ju Hayek responds affirmatively, stating he doesn't feel any pain. He then suggests they hear the details when they are back at the academy. The teachers will assist the injured students and take them to the hospital. He assigns the Valhalla students the task of locating the White Lotus and conveying the message to them that the school competition is concluded. In the Valhalla dormitory, Kim Ju Hayek comes to his room after taking a shower, settles on his bed, and reflects that it has been a really hard day. He ponders if it is because there is a lot to do. Barch remarks that it is because he used magic to attack those villains, to which Kim Ju Hayek acknowledges that maybe he used a lot of mana during the attack, but he considers it a great performance. A screen appears in front of him, implying that he retrieved the bead from Maidgala Lona's house. Then he puts his hand in his pocket, takes out a bead, and mentions that it was tight, but he managed to get it. Reflecting on the time he hustled with the bead, he made it happen. He tries to wake up Alia, who is unconscious, making an effort to bring her back. Now that she has regained consciousness, he asks her about her ability, assuming she must be part of Samsel since she mentioned a target. He deduces her position in their formation and speculates about her assassination ability. She responds by telling him to get lost and refuses to disclose her ability. Using magic, she creates a space around her, but he manages to stop it, leaving her astonished. He deduces that her ability involves creating and moving within space. Then he places his hand on her shoulder and asks her to help him find something, assuring her that nothing will happen to her if she cooperates. Reflecting on his actions, he thinks that thanks to her ability, he was able to get the bead. When Barch asks him why he didn't fulfill his promise not to say anything if she helped him, he explains that he knocked her out because she refused to confess about her employer and comrades. He gazes in the direction of the bead, lost in deep thought. Now that he has uncovered that the three attackers are associated with Il Shinja and go by the name Samsel, he suspects their client to be the Rockdale family. He is actively seeking more information about the attackers so that he can respond swiftly. He wonders if he will have to confront the Rockdale family individually if they repeat their actions. In any case, he has obtained the necessary information from the bead. On the screen in front of him, it states that one can retrieve lost memories through sleeping. Upon seeing this, he remarks that he will have to sleep to find the lost memories. Barch responds, suggesting that if memories can be retrieved, some of his might return too, as he received the same notification. Then, he suggests they go to sleep, turns off the lights, and lies down. He thinks to himself that he doesn't believe he has lost any part of his memory. Closing his eyes, he anticipates that something will manifest in his dreams. In his dream, the destruction tower appears before him, and he finds himself lying there injured in a critical condition. Stones were falling on him, and nearby Barchai had also fallen. In front of him, a faint person emerges, saying that they will take good care of his name and the name he protected in this world too, before disappearing. Upon waking up, Kim Ju Hayek wonders about the nature of his dream, questioning whether it really happened or if they were just lost memories. 
He asks Barchai if anything has come back to him, to which Barchai replies that he thinks he was a tiger, although not a cute one. Asking Barch if he remembers what the tiger looked like, Barch responds that he doesn't remember any specifics. Kim Ju Hayek contemplates that Barchai doesn't seem to remember anything strange. Then he asks Barch if he remembers his name being called, to which Barch responds that he doesn't know. Reflecting on this, he concludes that the only things he gained were painful memories with the inability to recall his own name. The screen appears in front of him, stating the office of the Grand Palace of Ahala Alafridi Johnny's secret room, instructing him to watch the truth. After reading this, he thinks about the Grand Palace of Ahala and decides that he should watch the truth, which could be the last thing. He plans to ask Lilia about the Grand Palace of Ahala after today's training is over. The next day in the Valhalla gym room, Kim Ju Hayek and Choi Aran were doing their workout, with Oh Seok also present. When Yu Soyan arrives and asks why he's there, he responds that he comes there every day for exercise, asking her reason for being there. She admits that her reason is similar to his, explaining that despite her strong sense of pride, she feels a bit jealous of Kim Ju Hayek. He responds that his presence in the gym has nothing to do with Kim Jo Hyuk, as he has been diligently weightlifting for a long time. He denies being there out of jealousy towards Kim Jo Hyuk because Choi Aran defeated her. She acknowledges this and reflects on the time when she fought Choi Aran. Using her magic during the fight, she found that Choi Aran could disrupt her magic with a single strike. She attempted to counter with three flying slices of magic, but Choi Aran stopped all three effortlessly leaving her defeated. She wonders about Choi Aran's source of strength and power. Reflecting on Choi Aran's improvement since they last met at the entrance ceremony, she thought it was due to Kim Jo Hayek's guidance. Consequently, she has been training her magic power and swordsmanship continuously, while also noticing Choi Aran's dedication to weight training. She mentions to Seok that no one in Choi Aran's family has ever trained her, wondering if that could be the reason for her explosive growth. Sayak ponders whether Choi Aran's remarkable progress could be attributed to her lack of family training and suggests that she should have conveyed her thoughts to Kim Ju Hayek instead of him. Upon realizing that she can't simply claim she will improve without actually doing so, Yu Soyan feels determined to get answers from Kim Ju Hayek. She approaches him, and he greets her with the nickname Pipsqueak, prompting her to playfully question why he gives her a nickname again. Yu Soyan then asks if he can train her like he does Choi Aran. Instructor Sangchiol intervenes, asking Kim Ju Hayek if he is busy. Kim Ju Hayek replies that he hasn't finished his workout yet, prompting Sangchiol to instruct him to finish quickly and meet someone urgently waiting outside. Yu Soyan, feeling embarrassed by the interruption, watches as Kim Ju Hayek leaves without being able to express herself. Before he leaves, Kim Ju Hayek suggests that if she wants to learn, she should ask Choi Aran about the routine and follow it, hinting that he might consider training her if she does well. Choi Aran assures Yu Soyan that she will teach her in a calm and orderly manner. Following instructor Sang Chiol's instructions, Kim Ju Hayek heads to the small auditorium where someone urgently needs to see him. Meanwhile, Yu Soyan reflects on her missed opportunity to speak up, feeling embarrassed by the situation. In the small auditorium, Kim Ju Hayuk finds Rockdil waiting for him. Rockdil apologizes profusely and begs for forgiveness, visibly agitated and pleading for Kim Ju Hayuk to save him. The instructor explains that Rockdil has hired Il Shinja, who is attempting to assassinate Kim Ju Hayuk for the second time. This revelation prompts media attention and speculation about Rockdil's involvement in the attack on Valhalla. He states that he leaked the information to the press. He questions why he should forgive Rockdill when the Ventric family is likely to protect him, just as they did before to clean up the mess caused by Rockdill. The instructor reveals that the Rockdill family issued an official statement announcing Rockdill's excommunication from the Ventric family, including his father's excommunication. Unlike previous occasions, the Ventric family has not intervened to silence the media. Rockdill realizes he has no protection and the only remaining path is jail. Tearfully, he stammers, expressing hope that Kim Jo Hayek's testimony could still make a difference. He pleads with Kim Jo Hayek to say that nothing happened. However, Kim Jo Hayek refuses to provide any testimony. Rockdill, feeling desperate, kneels down and begs for forgiveness, promising never to harm Kim Jo Hayek again. He implores Kim Jo Hayek to reassure everyone that nothing happened. 
Kim Jo Hyuk remains resolute, refusing to forgive him or comply with his request. Rock Dil then offers money in exchange for forgiveness, but Kim Jo Hyuk declines, stating he doesn't need any money. Rock Dil then turns to his secretary, Yuria, and offers her to Kim Jo Hyuk, presenting her as a valuable asset due to her lineage from the palace family in England. He proposes transferring ownership of the girl to Kim Jo Hyuk. Kim Jo Hyuk rejects the offer, questioning whether people are mere objects. Rock Dil insists that the girl is his possession, pointing out a shining spell on her neck as proof of ownership. The instructor examines the spell on the girl's neck, recognizing it as a magical taboo spell that prevents anyone from acting against the owner or denying her voice. An ordinary person wouldn't have been able to cast such a spell. Did someone else do it for him? Kim Ju Hayek comments that people of Rockdale's ilk have existed for a long time, questioning who puts taboo spells on other people's bodies and sells them for profit. Approaching Yuria, he attempts to remove the spell written on her neck with his magic, successfully breaking the taboo spell seal. Yuria is amazed to see him break the spell. He then asks the instructor if he can punch Rockdale. The instructor questions whether a Valhalla teacher would tolerate violence between students, but he agrees when considering Rockdale's status as a suspected criminal and the strained relationship between Valhalla and the Ventric family. Encouraged by this, Kim Ju Hayek delivers a powerful blow to Rockdale's face, breaking his jaw and causing him to stumble backward in pain. As the evening approaches and Kim Ju Hayek heads to his room, Barch expresses surprise, believing Kim Ju Hayek was going to kill Rockdale. Kim Ju Hayek reflects that if it were 300 years ago, he might have killed him, recalling a similar situation involving a former disciple who was treated like a slave due to a taboo spell. Barch asks if this means Kim Ju Hayek was also a slave before. Just then, Yuria approaches from behind to thank him, but he dismisses her gratitude, telling her to live as she pleases. Yuria starts crying as he walks away. The next day after school in the Valhalla Cafe, Kim Ju Hayek sits with instructor Lilia and asks about the Grand Palace of Ahala. She informs him that it's in China. Contemplating a labyrinth owned by the White Lotus Association, Kim Ju Hayek reflects on the legality of entering labyrinths owned by others, questioning why labyrinths need ownership in the first place. He acknowledges the awkwardness of destroying it himself because it's owned by the Academy. After considering the situation, Kim Ju Hayek asks instructor Lilia if there is a way to gain access to the Grand Palace of Ahala. She thinks about it and mentions that she knows it is accessible to White Lotus students, advising him not to rush because opportunities might arise over time. However, she suddenly stops herself from speaking further when he inquires about her abrupt silence. Curious, Kim Ju Hayek questions why she stopped talking all of a sudden. Lilia admits that she has divulged too much information and demands that he provide her with three pieces of information before she will share more. Despite his confusion, he agrees to her terms, prompting her to begin divulging the supposed secret. Lilia reveals that the Grand Palace Ahala will be one of the stages for the world competition in the second semester, emphasizing that this information has not yet spread to the teachers. Kim Ju Hayek is surprised and questions how she obtains this information, to which she cryptically replies that she has a source known only to her. Upon learning that the world competition resembles the Olympics, Kim Ju Hayek can't help but find it irritating, considering it just a larger version of the school competition. Nonetheless, he realizes he will have the opportunity to enter during the second semester, though he finds the wait too long. Wanting to expedite the process, Kim Ju Hayek asks if there is another way to reach the White Lotus Gate sooner. Lilia admits she doesn't have connections to the White Lotus and can't guarantee a confirmed method to enter. However, she proposes that he accompany her to the World Monster Research Society and One Day event, suggesting it might offer some insight. In North London Tottenham, they both stand before the World Monster Research Society. Kim Jo Hayek asks instructor Lilia what kind of one-day event this is. She replies that they are only here for one day, so they should enjoy it. She mentions that she got permission to extend their excursion until Monday just in case, so they should make the most of it. Kim Jo Hayek remarks that she is abusing her teacher's authority and asks what they are doing there. Inside a room, Kim Jo Hayek stands in front of a monster with a sword while instructor Lilia watches from outside. She tells him that he can help her verify the paper, but in exchange, he will have to kill some monsters. He swings the sword and strikes the monster's head, causing it to fall, 
and then an announcement is made about the completion of the quick bore validation and getting ready for the rock goblin. After some time, Kim Jo Hayek lies on the sofa and questions why he had to kill more monsters than initially stated. Lilia hesitantly responds that she doesn't know why. Kim Jo Hayek then asks about the uncomfortable atmosphere in the building, mentioning that everyone stared at Lilia and seemed to give them the cold shoulder. He asks if she had a fight with them. Lilia takes a sip of tea and confirms that the atmosphere is uncomfortable because they are adamant about their monster hunting theories and a paper contradicting their beliefs dropped out of nowhere. Kim Jo Hayek then questions the old-fashioned verification method of using a sword for hunting. Lilia explains that it's part of the initiation process to assess newcomers' adaptability and decision-making skills in various situations, not just about the actual verification. When Kim Jo Hayek asks why someone else in the association doesn't verify it themselves, Lilia explains that they refuse to do it because they are resistant to having their theories debunked. She describes them as boomers who are focused on maintaining their status and power, noting the prevalence of nepotism and dead weight in the upper echelons of society. Upon hearing the explanation, Kim Jo Hayek expresses his disdain for such people and questions why he needs to continuously submit the paper. While drinking tea, Lilia responds that a paper without society's recognition holds no value, emphasizing that the association members prioritize the perfect hunting strategy above all else, having endured many challenges to develop it. Kim Jo Hayek acknowledges this explanation with an understanding and replies okay. Lilia then states that she needs Kim Jo Hayek's help, explaining that it was a good decision to come to the event because the White Lotus chairwoman is present. She mentions that the chairwoman likely observed Kim Jo Hayek during the verification process and suggests they talk to her before it's too late. They proceed towards the White Lotus chairwoman to engage in a conversation. As they approach, a voice from behind the door inquires if Kim Jo Hayek is present and requests a minute to speak with him. Upon confirming it's a woman's voice, Kim Jo Hayek invites her in, and a beautiful lady named Seolyeon enters. After introducing herself as the chairwoman of the White Lotus Association, she expresses her purpose of seeking Kim Jo Hayek's assistance. Kim Jo Hayek agrees to listen, prompting instructor Lilia to perceive the conversation as turning serious and taking her leave. Kim Jo Hayek then asks Seolyeon to explain in detail what she means. She reveals her background as a member of the Seolt family, the founders of the White Lotus Academy in China. She explains the legacy of her family and mentions a prodigious individual within their lineage, often referred to as a natural disaster. Xiaoyun explains to Kim Jo Hayek about the prodigious individual from her family, who at just 13 years of age, easily defeated ordinary contractors, including their family head, and retreated into seclusion within the White Lotus Palace's training room. Kim Jo Hayek confirms that she wants him to deal with this arrogant person, to which she affirms and explains her reasons. Kim Jo Hayek expresses his confusion, questioning why Seolyeon specifically chose him when there are many other strong individuals available. Seolyeon acknowledges his observation skills, mentioning that the person in question relies solely on physical power, and is also 17 years old, the same age as Kim Jo Hayek. She believes that Kim Jo Hayek defeating this individual would significantly damage their pride, which is why she personally requested his assistance. Understanding the situation, Kim Jo Hayek agrees to help, realizing that Seolyeon won't make such a request for free. However, when Seolyeon offers compensation, Kim Jo Hayek declines money, instead requesting the opportunity to go to a specific place. Seolyeon politely asks for clarification. In China, they stand before the White Lotus Association, where Seolyeon explains the significance of the place. Kim Jo Hayek expresses surprise at being brought there the same day he agreed, especially via a private jet. Seolyeon justifies the haste by reminding him that he was free until Monday, emphasizing the need to expedite matters. They agree to proceed, with Kim Jo Hayek expressing his desire for the right to enter the Great Palace Ahala. Inside a room, Kim Jo Hayek expresses curiosity about something, prompting Seolyeon to ask him what it is. He expresses his concern that Seolyeon didn't pay attention to the competition, but wanted him to deal with Yanlang. She acknowledges his perspective, stating that many individuals have attempted to challenge Yanlang, only to realize their limitations. Seolyeon emphasizes that her primary goal is to rid Yanlang of his arrogance, thereby elevating the White Lotus to the top. Kim Jo Hayek understands her intentions and hopes that Yan Lang will be in good hands. 
Seolyeon provides Kim Jo Hyuk with information, explaining that Yan Lang is located in the Seol family's secret training room. As Kim Jo Hyuk steps onto the magic seal to enter the training room, he realizes he forgot to ask Yan Lang's name. Seolyeon informs him that Yan Lang is the child's name. Inside the training room, Yan Lang confronts Kim Jo Hyuk, questioning his identity and whether he was sent by the Seol family to make him leave. Kim Jo Hyuk smiles at Yan Lang's rudeness and decides to introduce himself. In the ensuing confrontation, Kim Jo Hyuk underestimates Yan Lang's strength and receives a punch from him. Yan Lang is surprised by Kim Jo Hyuk's abilities and wonders how a 17-year-old high school student could be so strong. Despite feeling challenged, she stands up again, ready to face Kim Jo Hyuk. He considers knocking her down but recognizes her remaining pride. The secretary, observing the fight alongside Chairwoman Seolyeon, expresses his confidence that a student from another school wouldn't pose a threat to someone from the Lotus Academy. He wonders if Kim Ju Hayek can truly defeat Lady Yanlang, acknowledging that Seolyeon previously lost to Yanlang without using magic, relying solely on physical techniques. Seolyeon confirms this, mentioning that she once lost to Yanlang, even though the difference in their magic power was minimal at the time. When asked to elaborate, she explains that a few years ago, the gap in their magic power was slim, implying that she may have grown stronger since then. The secretary expresses concern about Kim Ju Hayek's ability to match Seolyeon's strength, but Seolyeon reassures him, stating that Kim Ju Hayek's physical power surpasses Yanlang's, forcing Yanlang to resort to using magic. Yanlang extends her claws with magic to increase her reach, but Kim Ju Hayek swiftly evades her attack, causing Yanlang to grab her knee in pain. Kim Ju Hayek jokingly responds that he simply used his forehead to strike her knee. Despite Yanlang's efforts to bombard him with attacks, Kim Ju Hayek's physical strength remains unmatched. Yanlang decides to unleash all her power, casting her magic staff, while Kim Ju Hayek also gathers his magic. Seolyeon, watching Kim Ju Hayek, acknowledges his impressive magic power and decides to defeat him with a single strike. As Yan Lang advances with her magic, intending to strike Kim Ju Hayek, he shifts his target, causing her punch to miss. Kim Ju Hayek decides to end the fight and unleashes his magic, delivering a powerful blow that sends Yan Lang flying backward. He then brings Yan Lang over to Seolyeon, declaring that he has completed the task by defeating her. Kim Ju Hayek grabs Yan Lang and brings her over to Seolyeon, informing her that he has fulfilled his promise by defeating Yan Lang and bringing her to her. Seolyeon, astonished by Kim Ju Hayek's success, expresses disbelief and concern, asking if he is hurt. Kim Ju Hayek reassures her that he is fine but expresses slight disappointment at the ending of the fight due to the skill gap. Seolyeon, still in disbelief, turns her attention to Yan Lang, who looks at Kim Ju Hayek with anger, commenting that it's been a while since she saw him outside. Seolyeon then discusses Kim Ju Hayek's payment, offering him immediate access to the Grand Palace of Ahala. Kim Ju Hayek expresses his pleasure and agrees to go with her immediately, and they leave together. Yan Lang, angered, watches them leave. The secretary expresses concern for Yan Lang's well-being, suggesting they get her treated first, but Yan Lang ignores him and asks for the name of the person who defeated her. The secretary informs her that his name is Kim Ju Hayek, noting that he is considered one of the strongest individuals alive. Arriving at the Grand Palace of Ahala, Kim Ju Hayek questions whether it is really a maze, recalling the information shared by Seolyeon about its distinctive maze-like structure. Seolyeon informs him that he can stay for around five hours, with the option to return the next day if he wants to stay longer. Kim Ju Hayek agrees that five hours should suffice and prepares to explore. As he begins to walk, he encounters a group of knights with shining swords, realizing that he must defeat them to proceed. He skillfully defends himself against their attacks, then considers where the office might be located, planning to explore more than 20 rooms to find it. After recalling the note on his screen directing him to California Johnny's secret room in the Grand Palace of Ahala, Kim Ju Hayek realizes that the rooms resembling an office were ordinary. At Barch's suggestion, he looks to his right and notices a fancy door that appears to lead to an office. Entering the room, he confirms that it indeed resembles an office. Upon observing a painting on the upper wall, he comments on its similarity to Aleftree's work, questioning if it belonged to someone else. Barch points out a small signature below the painting, confirming it as belonging to Aleftree Johnny. 
Kim Ju Hyatt questions how Barch managed to read the signature, to which Barch admits uncertainty, but suggests it might be part of the information he remembered previously. Determined to search thoroughly, Kim Ju Hyuk decides to expedite the process by breaking everything in the office. As he smashes the wooden furniture, he uncovers a small trapdoor beneath the table and chairs, which Barch identifies as the entrance to the secret room. Opening the door, Kim Ju Hyuk discovers a dark passage leading underground. Frustrated by the darkness, he voices his annoyance before the screen indicates that the conditions are met, confirming the discovery of the secret room. Descending into the room, he encounters a girl with red hair wearing a hat seated at a table with burning candles. He questions her about her identity and the place. The girl introduces herself as Guide, explaining that it's a nickname as her real name was taken away. Kim Ju Hayek recalls a similar experience in his dream where someone took his name. Seeking clarification, he asks if her name was also taken, to which she confirms. Skeptical, he questions how a name can be stolen, to which Guide responds by explaining the power held within names. Guide explains that all creatures derive their life's purpose from the name they are given, as it symbolizes their greatest achievements and influences their power. She mentions the faint person from his dream who steals such powerful names, absorbing the contained power. Kim Ju Hayek inquires about the fate of those whose names are stolen, to which she responds that they become constellations. When asked if she became a constellation after having her name taken, Guide insists it's the truth, noting that he might be an exception due to reincarnation. Kim Ju Hayek realizes that Guide, like Barch, knows about his reincarnation. She challenges his doubts, claiming responsibility for sending the notification window, though she clarifies that it was just one of the many facts she received through it. Impatient for answers, Kim Ju Hayek presses Guide to reveal who promised to take his name in the Tower of Destruction. The guide confirms that the individual's name is Maze Lord, whose goal is to send the Tower of Destruction into the maze to cultivate high-ranking names and steal their powers. Upon learning the Maze Lord's name, Kim Ju Hyatt questions the strangeness of the situation and how the Maze Lord could send the Tower of Destruction to Earth. Guide explains that it's only possible within the maze he controls, leading Kim Ju Hyuk to express confusion. Guide asserts that Earth is a maze, leaving Kim Ju Hyuk skeptical. However, she maintains that it's the truth and sees no reason to lie. He inquires about the reason behind Maze Lord sending the Tower of Destruction, seeking clarification on cultivating a high-ranking name. Guide explains that during a crisis of destruction, such as defeating monsters or saving villages, individuals accumulate karma. Only by stealing names from those who have amassed significant karma can one become a constellation. Upon hearing this, he contemplates whether his disciples might have become constellations as well, given their achievements. He expresses frustration, feeling as though they are unwittingly playing into May's Lord's hands. The guide suggests that he, being reincarnated, could be the variable capable of challenging May's Lord. Intrigued, he considers the possibility that May's Lord may have orchestrated their meeting through the notification window. However, Guide refutes this, indicating that the one who reincarnated him and led them to the notification window is not May's Lord. Confused about the identity of the person related to him, he asks for more information, to which Guide responds that she doesn't know. She suggests that since the person who reincarnated him might be related to him, they shouldn't waste the opportunity. She then conjures magic and creates a ring, handing it to him. When he asks about the ring, she mentions there isn't enough time to explain in detail, but it will be crucial for their counterattack. Despite his insistence on knowing all the details, she reassures him that she can handle being watched by the Maze Lord, and that meeting on her order will facilitate further encounters. She emphasizes the importance of not losing the ring. With a snap of her fingers, they find themselves outside the maze. He comments on the flashy method used to send him to the entrance. Outside, he reflects on how the Tower of Destruction's sender, the Maze Lord, stripped away his name and prevented him from leading a comfortable life. He acknowledges that he doesn't understand the purpose of the ring, but he doesn't believe it will directly strengthen him. Instead, he decides to absorb all the remaining magic power from the storage stone that he hadn't been able to use before the fight. He hopes that this will increase his magic power to its prime level, even though he hasn't fully recovered his strength. Dragon King Hannibal, upon reading the news on his mobile about triple killers, an assassination group linked to Soul Fanatic, being defeated by Valhalla student Kim Jo Hayek, becomes angry and smashes his mobile. 
After learning about constellations, he carefully observes Kim Ju Hayek and discovers that he is the one who defeated Choi Jingun, who has signed a provisional contract with a constellation. Despite Ventric's son commissioning a job that doesn't offer good pay, it still summons the triple killers to ensure the job is completed properly. Frustrated by the situation, Hannibal questions whether he needs to mobilize all Soul Fanatic members and the entire professional association group just to deal with one person. While pondering this, Privilege Pace leader George approaches him and asks about his troubles. Hannibal expresses his frustration, stating that he has also lost a valuable chess piece because of Kim Ju Hyuk. George then inquires if he is referring to Desira, who has appeared in the news. He explains to George that he fails to report to the organization as it's a personal job. In the end, he can't handle it properly and has to reveal his identity to a mere high school student. Though he intends to leave him as an informant for the Ventric family, he has to handle him personally before he can potentially leak information again and reach the prison tower. After hearing this, George asks if he can help him get rid of the triple killers who are being transported. He responds that if that is his commission, he will do it. Then George talks about Kim Jo Hayek, advising Hannibal not to mess with him for now. He explains that Kim Jo Hayek is being targeted by the first cult, which is absolutely crazy. Hannibal acknowledges that they are lunatics, noting that no one knows their motives, but they are the ones who killed Logan's squad. Hannibal responds that he has heard that too and expresses relief that they are targeting Kim Jo Hayek. He then realizes that if they mess with Kim Jo Hayek, they might become targets of the first cult too. In that case, he decides that all they have to do now is wait. In the next scene, Kim Jo Hayek is surrounded by some people. He asks them who they are and what they are doing on the Valhalla campus, questioning if they even know where they are. He wonders if they are fearless or just stupid. They all stare at him, offering no response. Meanwhile, the head of the Ventric family, Adelia, is talking with her secretary, who stands in front of her. The secretary informs her that they have finished their preparations. Adelia acknowledges that it takes quite a while and mentions that a considerable amount of time has passed in preparation. The secretary bows his head, apologizes, and explains that thorough preparation is needed to carry out their mission within Valhalla, where Kim Jo Hayek is located. Adelia then asks if they have found contractors who could create subspace. He replied affirmatively and explained that they had assembled a formation of contractors with space distortion abilities. Since all the members chosen for this task are from the Ventric family, there is no chance of the story being leaked. Adelia becomes pleased upon hearing this and states that it's her time to make a move as well. She orders him to stay in the contact group and lead the disposal group after the subspace is completed. He bows and obeys the command, then asks a question about preparations for the sanctuarization and whether they are planning to call the constellations. Upon hearing this, Adelia becomes angry and questions if he thinks she's going overboard due to fear of a high school student. He vehemently denies this. Adelia further explains that the constellations have never said anything, but recently they reacted suddenly, which is why she wants to call them this time to inquire about it. Meanwhile, the people surrounding Kim Ju Hayek, including one named Deacon, ponder why the quiet constellation suddenly reacted. After contemplating, Deacon shouts and instructs his companions to contact the group and prepare for the space distortion. They all use their magic to create space distortion. Observing this, Kim Ju Hayek questions their actions, stating that attacking a student inside the school is a terrible idea and questioning whose idea it is. He speculates if Patriarch Ventric is involved. Deacon is taken aback by Kim Ju Hayek's knowledge and asks how he found out. Kim Ju Hayek responds that among his enemies, there are two evil groups that use black magic, and since the Ventric family is the only group not using it, it must be them. He then instructs a member of his group to call the disposal team, as they have been caught, and there's no use in hiding it. Then, quite a few more people arrive armed with weapons, surrounding Kim Ju Hayek completely. Kim Ju Hayek sarcastically remarks that they had to call so many people to fight against a high school student, questioning if they are ashamed of themselves. Deacon unsheathes his sword and responds that they follow their leader's orders without question, laughing and mentioning that their leader seems shameless too. Upon hearing this, the leader gets angry and instructs his gang to attack and finish the situation off. Everyone gets ready to fight and launches attacks against Kim Ju Hayek. Using his magic, Kim Ju Hayek defeats them all in one go. 
The leader steps forward attempting to attack with magic, but his aim is off, and he is questioned about his actions as he hands over his magic stick. They all make their best efforts to engage in a fierce battle from all sides. Kim Ju Hyuk strikes them, noting that they aren't even giving him a chance to catch his breath. One of them comes from behind with a sword urging them to attack, but his aim is intercepted by Kim Ju Hyuk. They are left in awe, realizing how skillful a high school student could be. Kim Ju Hyuk attacks the deacon with his magic staff and defeats him. Reflecting on the situation, he thinks he made a mistake, thinking they went overboard with their preparation since their opponent was a high school student. With this realization, he falls down at the feet of the patriarch. Kim Ju Hyuk addresses the patriarch, stating that she finally crawled out, Ventric Patriarch. Seeing her bound and unconscious comrades on the ground, she thinks that most of the disposal team, including the deacon, must be stronger than most contractors, and it's not acceptable for them to end up in this state. She unsheathes her sword and tells him that he should feel proud of himself because he's had the opportunity to witness the sacred relic of their Ventric family, something that ordinary people would never get the chance to see. He responds by questioning if he's expected to take pride in seeing a mere dagger and criticizes the act of a family gathering so many people to confront a high school student with no shame. Upon hearing this, she becomes furious and prepares to attack him. At that moment, the magic storage stone falls from the deacon's hands and magic starts emanating from all the storage stones they have. She is bewildered, wondering how this could happen. Due to the magic storage stones, their bodies and minds are no longer under their control, and they are frozen in place. Even Adelia is immobilized. She ponders how this happened, realizing she can't move. She speculates that maybe the actualization affected others more forcefully than her, but her mind remains intact. All the members of the disposal group are frozen physically and mentally. Seeing Kim Ju Hayek, she wonders how he is still fine. As they stand frozen, Kim Ju Hayek approaches and touches the sword gripped in her hand. After touching it, a screen appears in front of him with Master written on it, leaving him puzzled about who the Master is referring to. Suddenly, a girl with a mask appears with her squad, using magic to arrive. As she removes her mask, Kim Ju Hayek looks at her, triggering memories of events from 300 years ago when he was Kim Hyun Oh. 300 years ago, the girl, bound by a chain, stared at him. He comments on her gaze, remarking that her eyes seem to detest all humans in the world. She responds, telling him not to pretend to understand her and questioning what he knows about her. He replies that although he doesn't know everything, he knows enough because he too was once a slave. He recounts being kidnapped by a slave trader when he was young and living a life of slavery due to the shackles and ban placed on him. He asks her if she doesn't want to be free considering she mentioned being a slave too. She retorts that there's no point in asking something he already knows, expressing her belief that she can't dream of freedom because of the things around her neck. She warns him to stop provoking her and leave before the slave trader arrives. He explains the wicked rule of the ban, stating that only the person who imposed it can remove it, either by doing it themselves or passing away. He suggests that in her case, the ban stays because the person who said it is no longer alive. She expresses concern, realizing there's no one else left now. He assures her that he can remove the ban and grabs it from her neck. He explains that by understanding the magical elements of the ban, he can reverse it and gradually make it disappear. Though removing bans isn't his expertise, he believes it shouldn't be a challenge. He emphasizes the importance of breaking free from a life of servitude. After forcefully removing the ban, she's surprised to see it gone, realizing that the tormenting ban has disappeared. He stands up and tells her that since he has eliminated the annoyance, the rest is up to her. He asks her about her plans now that she has gained freedom, whether she wants to find her family or go home. She replies that she has nothing like that, as the slave trader has already killed her family and burned down her house when he kidnapped her. He listens in astonishment and expresses his condolences, saying he's sorry to hear about her loss. He declares his intention to embark on a journey to confront slave traders, vowing to smash their heads like he did with the one earlier. When she asks if she can accompany him, he agrees, instructing her to follow him and treat him as her master, using honorifics and not speaking informally. Before leaving, she asks how she should address him, and he reveals his name as Kim Hyun Oh. 
Reflecting on the past, Kim Ju Hayek remembers that she became a constellation, realizing that her name has slipped his memory, possibly due to the Maze Lord's interference. Despite this, he fondly recalls her nickname, Moron, and greets her as such. Adelia, still frozen, is shocked by being called a Moron by a constellation. Moron approaches Adelia and touches her sword, surprising her. Moron then attacks Adelia with a sword, knocking her down. Afterward, she asks Kim Ju Hayek how she should deal with the others, suggesting killing them. He disagrees, proposing a better idea. The next day, instructor Lee Jun is astonished in the teacher's room upon seeing something on the screen, wondering about the Valhalla sponsorship statement, which reveals the Ventric family's personal sponsorship of student Kim Ju Hayek. Lee Jun expresses shock upon seeing that the Ventric family personally sponsors student Kim Ju Hayek with a donation of 5 billion ones. He remarks that it's a personal sponsorship for Kim Jo Hayek. Instructor Sang Chul, present in the room, suggests that Lee Jun might be mistaken, but Lee Jun insists it's true, noting that it's unusual for such a donation to come at this time. Lee Jun speculates that the donation might be related to Rockville. He recalls a similar situation in the past when they faced an attack by Deezer Aventric, but it wasn't Rockdale who sent the triple killers that time. He suggests that the Ventric family attempted to conceal something by providing the donation, mentioning that it served to protect dog deals and the family's reputation in the past. However, now that the Ventric family has severed ties with Rockdale, it raises questions about their true intentions behind sponsoring Kim Ju Hayek. He mentions uncertainty about whether Kim Ju Hayek has accepted the sponsorship, speculating that Kim Ju Hayek might reject it while distancing himself from the Ventric family. Sang Chul agrees, suggesting they might find answers as they reflect on the situation. Later, they summon Kim Jo Hayek into the interview room, where Lee Jun asks him if he will accept the sponsorship. Kim Jo Jo responds affirmatively, leaving them in suspense. Lee Jun wonders if there's any reason to reject the offer of 5 million won, to which Kim Jo Jo replies that since he agreed to accept it, he should be allowed to leave. Lee Jun stops him informing him that not only did he receive the sponsorship, but Valhalla Academy also received a donation. He informs Kim Jajo that according to Valhalla's regulations, he can move to a premium dormitory, asking for his thoughts on it. He responds that he doesn't have any discomfort with his current dormitory, so he requests assistance in changing it later. Lee Jun contemplates upon hearing this, noting that Kim Jajo declined the offer when the Patriarch tried to appease him previously, but is accepting it this time. He decides not to pay too much attention to it since the academy is not at a loss. As he walks through the corridor, he recalls the conversations with Moron, who asked him how to handle their captives, questioning if she should kill them. He recalls telling Moron that he has an idea and instructing her to wake Adelia up. Following his instructions, Moron wakes Adelia up, and Kim Ju Hayek tells her that he believes her constellation will overlook whatever he does to them and asks for her opinion on what he should do. Moron adds that she originally created the Ventric family to serve him, so he can do whatever he wants with them. Adelia, addressing Moron as Lord Constellation, inquires if the phrase all for one passed down through generations in their family applies to Kim Ju Hayek. Moron confirms that the phrase was meant for masters and acknowledges Kim Ju Hayek as her master, noting that despite his changed appearance, his magic power is unmistakably that of her master. Kim Ju Hayek redirects the conversation suggesting that they focus on Adelia's situation instead. He thinks about the inconvenience caused by their captives and realizes that merely killing them is not enough. He needs to leverage their prestige and power to live comfortably. He asks Adelia if she has been managing the family well. Adelia, explaining that she has been serving as the vice patriarch for four years, states that they have reclaimed declining power and become the strongest family in Britain within that time frame. He instructs her to continue her work as the family head without explaining the meaning behind his instructions. Then he warns Moron that if things go wrong again, she knows what will happen. Moron assures him that she will personally ensure that such a thing never happens again. He feels a jolt of magic and Kim asks him what's happening and where he's going. She explains that it's time for this space where constellations can manifest directly, which usually requires a huge amount of magic power and dozens of storage stones filled with magic. He understands now why those individuals were carrying many storage stones. Ju Hayek mentions that since the magic power is disappearing and she also uses her abilities, she feels the need to rest a little. 
concerned about her well-being, he asks if constellations have always faced such restrictions. She confirms this, stating that being able to see the reincarnation of her master in person like this is already satisfying. He urges her to rest quickly, but she insists on telling him one last important thing. She reveals that besides her, the other disciples have also become constellations, and he will meet them soon. With that, she disappears. Focused on Moron's constellation matter, he reflects that he already expected this development, but wonders which disciple it could be. He speculates that perhaps all of his disciples have become constellations, but regardless, he knows he will meet them soon. Recalling his meetings with constellations Barch and Moron, he considers that while the meeting with Barch was inevitable due to the notification window, the meeting with Moron was coincidental. He notes the abundance of constellations currently and acknowledges that it makes no sense to meet every single one of them. Meanwhile, Barch approaches him and asks if he remembers them. He responds by questioning what Barch has been doing all this time without saying a word. Barch explains that he was organizing his thoughts, and his memories were cut off the moment Kim Hayek entered the secret room. Ju Hayek asks how his memories could be cut off, and Barch elaborates, saying that in the mental ward, it felt like Kim Hayek came out as soon as he entered the room, and some of his memories returned, albeit slightly. When Ju Hayek asks if Barch remembers how weak he was, Barch responds that he couldn't remember such trivial memories and mentions learning about the concept of a name, which Kim Hayek should know by now. Barch also mentions the Maze Lord, who gave him the name Barch. While conversing with Barch, Kim Hayek arrives at the classroom and ponders whether the one who stole the original name is called the Labyrinth Lord, and the one who gave the name Barch is also called the Labyrinth Lord. Barch confirms this, explaining that he bestowed both a name and power the power of being the owner of the Tower of Destruction. Ju Hayek asks if that power also influences one's personality, and Barch confirms, stating that when he was the Tower Lord in the past, the influence of the received name and power made him somewhat rigid, but his current state of mind is closer to his original personality. Curious about how the Maze Lord gives and takes away names, Ju Hayek asks Barch, who admits he doesn't know why or how the Maze Lord does it but speculates that since the world is a labyrinth that shapes his name, he probably gives and takes away names as he pleases. Barch asks for clarification on Ju Hayek's statement about the world being a labyrinth, to which Kim Hayek responds annoyedly, questioning why Barch is unaware of important things. The next day, on the way to school, Kim Ju Hayek recounts the story of the Grand Palace of Ahala, where he met with a guide. After hearing everything, Barch acknowledges the frustrating reality, but mentions that the guide mentioned an opportunity for a counterattack, so they just have to wait for it. The guide magically brings Kim Ju Hayek in front of him, holding a plate of food. She asks about the silver shining thing in his hand, and he explains that it's just a food tray. He then questions how she could call him during lunchtime, even if they agreed to meet in two days. She apologizes, admitting that she hasn't paid attention to the timing of their meeting. Then she asks about the ring he gave her during their last encounter, inquiring if he has brought it along. He retrieves the ring and shows it to her. She suggests that they use the ring from now on. Observing the ring, he notes that it doesn't seem like a typical enhancing item and questions how it can be used for a counterattack against the Maze Lord. She explains that it's simple. He has to wear the ring and break through the labyrinth. He questions what she means by labyrinth, and if it needs to be any labyrinth. He notes that naturally occurring labyrinths are rare nowadays, and most of the remaining ones are managed. She clarifies that it can't just be any labyrinth. The Labyrinth Lord will soon generate the labyrinth directly. She mentions a term in his language, asking if it's called Dungeon's Break or Disaster. Upon hearing this, he reflects on how monsters will gush out like a torrent as soon as the labyrinth appears, wreaking havoc in the surrounding area. He mentions that before his reincarnation, such incidents were common, making the world unsafe. However, after reincarnation, things have calmed down, making life enjoyable. He inquires about when and where the eruption will happen and how big it will be. She replies that it will occur in about three months, and she's still assessing the scale, mentioning that it will happen in a country called Korea. He expresses concern about the vague location, considering he lives there. She asks for leniency, explaining that she has been providing information while avoiding the eyes of the Labyrinth Lord, but some aspects are restricted. 
Confirming that he's preparing once again to give and take names, she suggests that the Maze Lord probably thinks the time has come before the Tower of Destruction appears, indicating his preparation to adapt to people. He asks if he should wear the ring and break the labyrinth that appears during the Calamity. She affirms that he should. Before that, he explains his usual method of destroying labyrinths by ignoring the boss and destroying the labyrinth stones. However, she informs him that he can't just destroy the labyrinth stones this time. He'll have to wear the ring and defeat the labyrinth boss. He asks if there's a specific reason why he has to wear the ring and defeat the boss. She explains that even though his words create a labyrinth crafted by the labyrinth lord, things like calamities or the Tower of Run can't be easily produced. It is based on the power derived from the name one has acquired. Simply put, labyrinths are created through the power of names. Among the components of labyrinths created in that way, the focal point where the power of names converges is precisely the boss of the labyrinth. Wearing the ring and defeating the boss of the labyrinth allows one to absorb the name bestowed by the labyrinth lord, and that will be the starting point of their counterattack. After hearing this, he asks a question. He wonders if the names absorbed by the fellow are not just one or two, how can they counterattack with just stealing one's name? She replies that it is a very good question. Of course, the Labyrinth Lord won't bat an eye even if he loses just one name. His current goal, as mentioned earlier, is the adaptation before the Tower of Destruction. To be honest, the core of this plan is not just stealing one name, but quickly clearing the Labyrinth. In that case, if the Labyrinth Lord realizes the Labyrinth has disappeared before the adaptation, he will resort to other measures. He might send numerous names into the world, causing various incidents. That would be the opportune moment to absorb names on a massive scale. The names absorbed also become power for them. After hearing this, he asks how it absorbs the name and transforms it into powers. He then asks one more question about what sets them apart from the Labyrinth Lord. She responds, expressing surprise at his sudden interest, as she thought he didn't care about such things. He replies that he needs a legitimate reason to act freely as well. She then explains that for starters, they have not harmed innocent people by cultivating names. If one takes away the name from the Labyrinth Lord, they becomes a holy saint or may be bound to the name without being able to be reincarnated. Regardless of what happens, the body ends up being trapped without existence. Moreover, if one uses the power of the absorbed name when the constraints of the name are released, those individuals can also be liberated from this restraint. But if it bothers him, he can do whatever he wants. Anyway, he will naturally know who the owner of the names was while absorbing them. After hearing this, he understands where's the ring and asks if they just have to wait for the dungeon break. She replies affirmatively, mentioning that she will inform him of the precise location and date in the near future. He further inquires if it's not enough to defeat the boss and break through the labyrinth. She explains that when the labyrinth disappears, the monsters inside will die, but those that have come out will remain. She suggests being prepared to prevent that and bids him farewell, snapping her fingers to make him vanish once again. He reappears at the same spot where he had summoned her and finds himself standing in front of the food. While walking on the road, he's frustrated that she should provide information before disappearing. He reflects on her suggestion to create a team. Even before reincarnation, when dealing with disasters, he went with his disciples. Doing it alone takes time, and there is also the need to prevent collateral damage. He contemplates if he also needs to raise disciples here. As he thinks about all of this, Yanlang appears in front of him, surprising him with her unexpected presence. He questions why she is there, and she responds that after losing to him, she took some time to think. She realized that he was stronger than her, leading to her defeat. He asks her why it took her so long to figure out the obvious, to which she explains that she thought she was quite similar to him. She mentions someone who overwhelmed everyone with talent alone without experiencing defeat, which is rare among adults, and asks if he knows that person. He responds that if she thinks he resembles that aspect, it's a misconception, as he considers himself someone who puts in effort. She acknowledges that her previous thoughts were based on what she had thought earlier, not now. She realized that the moves that struck her were not simple attacks, but rather body movements that came from countless experiences. She admits being furious when she lost, but later realized that her defeat was due to a lack of experience. She expresses her desire to keep fighting with him to become stronger. However, he shows no interest in her words and starts to leave, but she stops him from behind, suggesting they fight. 
he dismisses her suggestion, stating that he finds her logic weird and declares his intention to leave. As he tries to leave, she puts a hand on his shoulder, stopping him, and suggests a fight. She mentions that she came all the way from China to fight him. He responds that it's none of his business and advises her to dedicate her time to mastering the family martial arts instead of making such efforts. She admits that she doesn't know, prompting him to ask what she means. She explains that she received proper training until she was six years old, and after that, it was all self-taught. She mentions that he beat her in the lunar year before he took control of contractors. Confirming if he indeed defeated her during that time, she responded affirmatively, explaining that the contractors were not fond of her, and she took unilateral action by asking for training partners to keep her skills sharp. Consequently, they sent adult contractors to spar with her unexpectedly, leading to her victory. She expresses relief that there weren't many of them. After hearing her story, he reflects that while what the Bikyon Ho leader said overlaps, the nuance is different. He acknowledges her talent and passion for fighting, contrasting it with the leader's implication that she had been defeating everyone she encountered. He then asks her if it is compulsory to be affiliated with the White Lotus Palace. She responds that it's somewhat arbitrary, mentioning that she got stuck there because she was tired of being treated as the family's burden. However, she assures him that she found him much stronger than herself. He questions what's good about it, to which she explains that by fighting him, one can become stronger without relying on family teachings. Despite her explanation, he asserts that he doesn't want to fight her and begins to leave. She follows him and pleads for him to do it for her while starting to cry. Observing her behavior, he thinks she is strange and speculates that she might be an outcast from her family, considering she is confined to the White Lotus Palace. He ponders why Hoju attempted to bring him back considering Yanling's confinement to the White Lotus Palace. He questions whether, from their family's perspective, it would be better for Yanling to remain there. Reflecting on this, he expresses to her saying okay let go of him. She becomes happy upon hearing this and asks if he is fighting for her. He clarifies that doing something in the middle of the school wouldn't be discreet anyway, as they are planning to go to the gym and instructs her to follow him. In the gym, Choi Arin, Yu Soyan, and Seyuk are amazed to see Kim Ju Hayuk with Yanlang. He informs Yanlang that he will be back shortly after changing and asks her to wait there. When Choi Arin inquires about the girl, he describes Yanlang as a person he met at the White Lotus and explains that she has come all the way to fight with him, and he is going to spar with her just once. Yanlang stares at him upon hearing this. Choi Arin expresses surprise that Yan Lang has come all the way from China, judging her by her appearance. Yan Lang, unfazed, questions Arin's judgment and asks if she intends to fight too. Arin clarifies that she isn't planning to fight yet. Meanwhile, Yu Soyan observes Yan Lang talking with Arin and speculates that based on their hair color, they might be related to the Ventric family. She ponders if Yan Lang really traveled from China to challenge Kim Ju Hayuk, finding it impressive. In the Valhalla Stadium, Kim Jo Hayek and Yan Lang stand facing each other ready to fight, while Arin, Soyan and Seok stand by watching. Kim Jo Hayek questions why they are present, and Arin explains that she is keeping an eye on Yan Lang to prevent any strange behavior. Soyan mentions she is following Arin's lead, while Seok asks not to mind him. Yan Lang flexes her muscles, expressing confidence in her strength and challenging Kim Jo Hayek. He responds by stretching his muscles and agreeing to go all out with full power in the match. He then remembers the guide's words about forming a team to stop the disaster. Then he tells her that she had mentioned wanting to become strong. She confirms, and he responds that if he wins, she can be his disciple. Hearing this frustrates her, and she explains that she's striving to be strong to defeat him. He reassures her, suggesting that she could achieve that goal after becoming his student, and proposes they begin. She assumes her fighting stance, expressing her dislike for having a teacher and her determination to win. As she charges at him, he effortlessly counters her attack, commenting on her increasing strength. Unfazed, she declares that he won't be able to stop her this time and engages in combat with him, using all her strength and magic. The impact of her magic surprises Soyan, who notes its similarity to a monster at White Lotus, while Sayak remarks on the immense mana concentration. Despite her powerful magic, she realizes that she's still being pushed back by him, even as he refrains from using his magical power. She acknowledges his strength and doubts whether he's truly the same person as before. 
Despite her efforts, she finds herself outmatched by him. He informs her that he'll take her attack's head on only once, then he'll block and strike on his own. After striking her once, she realizes she couldn't land a valid hit. When she falls to the ground after his final strike, he declares that he has gained one more disciple with this victory. After being hit, she feels dizzy and loses consciousness. When she regains consciousness, she exclaims that she is lost again. Kim Jo Hayek, sitting next to her, asks if she's awake, noting her strength and expressing surprise at her early awakening. She questions whether his comment was a compliment or mockery. He dismisses her concerns, urging her to stop talking nonsense and become his disciple. She suggests fighting purely with their bodies this time, without using magic like last time, but she acknowledges that the outcome might not change. Reluctantly, she agrees to become his disciple and inquires if she is officially his first disciple. He denies it, leading her to become serious and question if he had already been cultivating disciples since middle school. He denies this as well. Choi Aran interrupts, asserting that Kim Ju Hayek is correct because she, having received teaching before Yanlang, is his first disciple Kitty. Upon hearing this, Kim Jo Hayek looks at Aran and thinks that she wasn't the first disciple from the beginning either, but he decides to let it go as it's too bothersome. Upon hearing the nickname Kitty, Yanlang becomes angry and questions why she's being picked on intentionally. Aran teases her, asking what's wrong with the nickname Kitty and if it isn't cute. Yanlang retorts, asking if Aran wants to fight and sarcastically remarking that it's a good nickname, then tells her to go home. Aran questions why she should leave when she hasn't learned anything yet. Aran then tells her she did learn that she's an adorable kitty. Observing their bickering, Kim Jo Hayek reminisces that it oddly brings a sense of nostalgia, as even before reincarnation, single disciples always gave him a similar feeling. He instructs Yanlang to stop and tells her not to call him a kitty. He confirms that it's true that Choi Aran received training before her, making her Yanlang senior. He informed Yanlang not to be unkind to her Sajo, implying that she shouldn't be rude to Aran, who began learning from the same teacher earlier than Yanlang did. Then, Aran conveyed to Yanlang that now that she also had a Sami, she should speak to her respectfully. This indicated that as both Yanlang and Aran were learning from the same teacher, with Yanlang starting later, Yanlang should treat Aran with respect. Upon hearing the term Sajo, Choi Aran thinks to herself that he also acknowledges her as his first disciple. Then she tells Yanlang that as the Sajo, she will endure it. Kim Jo Hayek says to both of them that enough of the banter, considering they are spared and got some bruises that day, they should call it a day and go home. Yanlang says to him that it does not really hurt and asks where she should sleep. Aran asks him if he has not found separate accommodation. She replies that not really, she just comes on a whim because she wants to spar with Kim Ju Hayek. When she asks Seoyeon what she should do to fight with him again, she is just told to go to Valhalla in Korea. He asks if she just comes here after hearing that because there seems to be no concrete plan. Then he says that there is a dorm room that the school decides to give him, so she can stay there for now. They both start fighting again, he tells them to stop before they both lose their vigor. As he walks to his room, he thinks he is tired because of Yanlang and Aran. He gets all worked up and cannot finish his routine properly. Anyway, with things turning out like that, those two seem like they will definitely play the role of disciples. Yu Soyan is currently focused on physical training, and she is still a long way from swordsmanship instructions. And for Sahiak, he has not shown any particular interest and is training on his own. So for now, the ones who will prevent disaster are Yanlang and Aran. While pondering over all this, he receives a call from Adelia Ventric on his phone. When he answers the call, she introduces herself as Adelia Ventric and informs him that she is currently finalizing other matters, including the donation funds he requested, and she wants to report back before reaching out to him. He replies that he has checked the donation and scholarship funds that morning. Then she asks if there is anything else he wants to ask. He replies that she should issue a wanted notice for the contractors. Three months later, there is going to be a disaster. She asks him where he got such news. He responds, telling her not to ask the source and that he doesn't know the scale, but something is going to happen there. She inquires if it is happening in Korea. He confirms it, and she agrees to contact useful contractors from the Ventrigan side and the guilds within Korea. He then requests her to keep it secret if possible. 
She begins asking him if Mr. Kung Kim Ju Hyuk would be able to speak favorably about her efforts when the Guardian Constellation wakes up. He asks about the moron, questioning if she is still asleep, pretending not to notice her efforts. She confirms that she tried to contact her somehow, but she didn't respond. He thinks to himself that she mentioned taking a short break after exerting her abilities directly and that it seems like a day is not enough for a complete recovery. Then he assures her that he will tell her. She expresses her gratitude and ends the call. The next day after school, they were all running in the Valhalla gym. Yan Lang's condition seems to be deteriorating. It feels like she's exhausted. After a while, she collapses on the ground and says she feels like she's going to die and that she almost died. Looking at the two of them, she asks if they are both not tired. Kim Hayek responds, saying she is still keeping up better than he expected and that he thought she might fall behind in the middle. She insists that she is serious about all this and that she is not playing around. He thinks to himself that it seems like her stamina is fine, so they should slow down a bit. While he's thinking about all this, a girl approaches him and asks if Yanlang happened to come to that place. He looks at the girl and wonders what is up with her and why her appearance feels similar to Yanlang and Seolyung. The girl asks Yanlang how she came there without telling her mother. Yanlang answers in an agitated manner, asking why she came there. Kim Ju Hayuk asks if she is Yanlang's mother because he thought Seolyung was her mother. Then she looks towards Ju Hayuk and introduces herself properly, saying her name is Seolyung HWA. She adds that she is the head of the Seol family and Yanlang's new mother while Seolyeon, who is the head of the White Lotus Society, is her younger sister. Seolyeon thinks it's a little strange that she promised to contact her when Yanlang leaves White Lotus Palace, but she didn't reach out and sent Yanlang instead. She decides they will ask about the reason later. Seolyeon then instructs Yanlang to follow her mother back to the White Palace and extends her hand towards Yanlang. Yanlang shouts at her, expressing frustration that she doesn't care whether she's left behind or pushed away before, and now she's telling her to come back. Seolyeon explains that rejecting Yanlang was the constellation's order back then and clarifies that she isn't acting on her own will. Yanlang questions why she didn't tell her all this herself and had to hear it from the maid recently. Seolyeon responds by emphasizing that regardless of how Yanlang found out, the constellation has instructed her to summon Yanlang this time presenting it as an opportunity for recognition. Yanlang, stunned, asks if she wants her to come with her right away, and if that's the reason she has been trying to bring her out all this time, to which Seolyeon replies affirmatively. She then angrily instructs Yanlang to leave, warning her not to disturb the students exercising in Valhalla and emphasizing that this isn't Seoul or White Lotus, forbidding any disturbances. Seolyeon then explains that she came alone without any bodyguards to take Yanlang away unnoticed and casts a spell with magic on her, reiterating that she won't hold back. Yanlang responds that she also doesn't plan to hold back any longer, reminding Seolyeon that she defeated her last time. Seolyeon acknowledges Yanlang's improvement and suggests she go back to Seol and learn properly now. After saying this, Seolyeon strikes Yanlang with a powerful punch, causing her to stagger back. Yanlang wonders about Seolyeon's skills and how she has become so strong. Despite staggering, Yanlang advances towards Seolyeon, who criticizes her for what she deems a barbaric attack, prompting Yanlang to tell her to shut her mouth and express her determination to win. Kim Jo Hayek and Aran watch them fight, and Aran asks him if they should call an instructor to stop them. She wonders what would happen if they told the instructor about the commotion caused by the head of the Seol without any bodyguards, claiming to take her daughter away. He expresses his dislike for that person, even if it's true. Aran agrees, saying she doesn't like her either, considering how she abandoned her daughter and suddenly came to take her back due to some unexpected need. They both observe the fierce confrontation between mother and daughter, and her mother tells Yanlang to stop her pointless rebellion and follow her before she gets hurt. She then starts attacking Yanlang with her staff, stating that this time, she believes it will be Yanlang who gets hurt. Yanlang manages to block her attack, but her leg freezes after Yanlang kicks her hard with much power. Yanlang is surprised to see her leg frozen, and her mother explains that it's the power of their family constellation, the King of the Depth of Snow. She assures Yanlang that once she returns to Seoul, she will likely have the opportunity to exercise this ability through their contract with the constellation. 
Yanlang questions if she was recklessly borrowing the power of the constellation, but her mother dismisses it, stating that it's common for members of a family that houses the constellation. She reminds Yanlang that she didn't yield to his demands based on physical abilities alone last time. She extends her hand towards Yanlang again, asking if she will come back, but Yanlang refuses. Her mother becomes angry and accuses her of being immature and not wanting to go back safely. Yanlang thinks that she can't even fight now as her foot is frozen. Her mother threatens to freeze and shatter Yanlang's right arm, but Kim Ju Hayek intervenes and stops her from grabbing his arm. Kim Jo Hayek pushes her hand aside by hitting his leg and positions himself in front of her. Yanlang is surprised and asks him what he is doing, but Ju Hayek ignores her and directs inquiries to her mother. He questions her seriousness about cutting off her daughter's arm, to which her mother responds that she is currently educating her daughter and considers it none of his business. Ju Hayek asks if such education is trendy now and mentions hearing similar words recently from someone else about their child, something he had never heard of before. Yanlang wonders why there wasn't any effect despite the significant impact of his block and reflects on his ability to hit back with stronger magic despite being surrounded by the constellation's magic. Ju Hayek orders Aaron to leave with Yanlang, to which Yanlang protests, insisting she can fight and that it's her family's business. However, Ju Hayek questions whether she can even feel her leg at that moment, emphasizing that if his disciples get hurt, the master shouldn't stay and watch in silence, instructing her to stay away. Yanlang realizes that as the master, she should do as he says. Her mother questions Ju Hayek's role as a teacher, considering him a high school student, and expresses surprise at his teaching Yanlang. Ju Hayek explains that he wanted to take Yanlang out with him and clarifies that their mutual understanding aligns, though her mother finds it unusual for an ordinary master-disciple relationship. She then prepares herself for the fight, prompting Ju Hayek to think that despite her mother's cold appearance, she is as aggressive as Yanlang. He plans the fight meticulously due to his limited magic powers. When her mother launches her first attack, he decides to dodge to the side and target the joint. As a result, her attack misses, and he is amazed that she caused damage at such a precise level without landing a direct hit. With each strike, the area she targets freezes progressively. He reminds her about reimbursing the school for sports equipment if he wins, to which she replies that she will consider it if he wins. As she advances her hand to strike him, he realizes that avoiding it seems futile and decides to break it directly, striking her with his leg and condensing his magical powers on her hand. She relinquishes control, and Ju Hayek takes advantage of the opportunity to attack her, managing to strike her down. Yanlang is amazed by the sight, and thinks it's overwhelming that he managed to knock her down despite her wielding the power of the constellation. Her mother acknowledges Ju Hayek's feat and expresses an understanding of how he brought up Yanlang and why he calls himself her master. However, she states that regardless of her acknowledgement, she will take Yanlang with her. Ju Hayek asks her to clarify, and she explains that it's what their constellation wants, adding that if she fails, thousands of people who received orders from the constellation will come to retrieve Yanlang. Yanlang is taken aback and asks if her opinion doesn't matter to her. She responds affirmatively, stating that the constellation's purpose comes first, which is the purpose of their existence. Yanlang expresses reluctance to fight someone from her family again and pleads to stop it, expressing her unwillingness to go through it again. Kim Ju Hayek asks his mom what he should do to meet her constellation, suggesting that if he defeats it, wouldn't that solve the problem of them coming endlessly to capture Yanlang? She reacts with disbelief, questioning if he knows what he's saying about defeating the constellations, mentioning that encountering them directly through the sanctuary rarely happens due to the high magical energy consumption. She explains that the sanctification is only triggered for individuals who may bring harm to the family, indicating that their constellation wouldn't initiate it recklessly. Ju Hayek mentions another way, touching the sacred relic and transitioning to the realm of the mind. She is amazed by his knowledge and acknowledges that even though there's an institution for training hunters, he seems to have knowledge about contracts and secured a relic from a young age. She confirms that coming into contact with their family's secured relic would transport him to the constellation's realm, the Deep King's Eye, but warns about the immense pressure in the mental realm, indicating that it's unlikely for him to stand up to the constellation at the moment. She concludes that she cannot unilaterally decide to initiate contact with the sacred relic by an outsider.
They discuss extending an invitation to their constellation in a week, agreeing not to attack Yanlang or Kim Ju Hayek separately until then. Yanlang asks about their plans if Kim Ju Hayek is defeated in the mental realm and returns to the world. She expresses concern that creating an opportunity to meet the constellation without any conditions seems like a loss on their part. Yanlang responds, stating that whether he wins or loses, it should be on his terms only. If he wins, they must leave Yan Lang alone for the rest of her life, as he will take care of her. She thinks he's arrogant but agrees to his terms and leaves for the day. A week later, Kim Ju Hayek stands in front of the constellation. A few days earlier, they entered the fancy room he received through personal sponsorship from the Ventric family. He tells Yan Lang she can stay there as long as she wants. Yan Lang examines the room and wonders if she can really use it by herself. He explains that he originally planned to move to a premium dorm room, but got this one after mentioning he would be using an additional room. Yan Lang questions why he cares about her so deeply, expressing that regardless of Seolyeon Hwa's arrival or the Seol family's attacks, it's still her family's matter and he doesn't need to worry about it. She then asks if he's doing all this for her because she's his disciple. He nods and explains that he believes it's the reason, along with his dislike for people misusing their powers and exerting authority over others, which led him to interfere in her family matters. Yanlang asks if she made him uncomfortable, to which he responds that he doesn't have any issues, but admits that it all feels strange to him because no one has ever cared so much about her before, expressing his surprise and gratitude. He remarks that the training she will receive from him will be so hard that she will feel like dying, implying that her feeling of gratitude will soon disappear. He then tells her that he has something to ask. She asks what it is, and he inquires if her family constellation is the High Mountain Deep King. She corrects him, stating that it is the Deep Snow King. He continues, regardless of the name, asking about the nature of her constellation. She explains that while she knows he uses ice for attacks, she hasn't spent much time with her family and is unsure. She adds that despite his abilities, he doesn't typically interfere in family matters, which is why some family members are unaware of him. He finds this strange, but setting it aside, he mentions that the patriarch said the constellation ordered her to take Yanlang away. She clarifies that she hasn't had any contact with him and has never received his protection like other family members, leaving her even more confused. He decides he must meet him and eliminate him, then heads towards the exit, instructing her to rest and recover before leaving. Later, Kim Jo Hayek sits in his room and calls Adelia Ventric for help. He explains that he fought against the Seol family patriarch, leading Adelia to inquire if the Seol family's descendant is currently in Valhalla. He confirms this and mentions the destruction of equipment in the physical training center, asking if she can handle it. She agrees to handle the equipment replacement and asks if there is anything else he needs. He then asks if she knows anything about the Seol family's constellation. She responds that it's the Deep Snow King, known for not getting involved in family matters, similar to Lord Beak Mask, and that the Seol family itself is passive, so their knowledge is limited. He then changes the topic and asks Moron if she has awakened. She responds negatively, indicating there has been no response similar to last time. Hearing this, he reflects on the risks associated with constellations manifesting, realizing they cannot even see each other. Adelia then poses a question to him, inquiring if he's asking for Moron's status to inform her of Adelia's contribution promptly, mirroring her previous request. He appears frustrated by this and remarks on her audacity, expressing his intention to hang up. After she hastily apologizes, he ends the call and wonders how no one knows about the situation. Barch remarks that his behavior doesn't align with Kim Hyano's, noting that his style isn't typically to fight first and ask questions later. He reflects on his increasing strength compared to his past life, but considers it unwise to confront a constellation without understanding its power to some extent. Ju Hayek adds that in the world of mental imagery, where they'll be fighting, constellations can exert their full power. He then questions why Barch seemed weak when they fought in the world of mental imagery, expecting him to be as powerful as any other constellation. Barch explains that strength in the mental imagery world is tied to one's knowledge rather than physical strength, emphasizing that the rules differ for ordinary people inside and outside the mental imagery world. After contemplating for a moment, Ju Hayek concludes that there's only one thing left to do, confront the constellation of the Seol family and defeat it. A week later, Kim Ju Hayek and Yanlang travel to China. 
Upon their arrival, Yan Lang's mother expresses surprise that they actually came, admitting she thought they might run away. Zhu Hayek assures her that he won't leave without informing her and questions if she obtained permission for him to touch the holy relic. She instructs him to follow her. Before departing, Zhu Hayek places his hand on Yan Lang's shoulder and promises to return, urging her to wait for him. Yan Lang's mother watches them leave with concern. Upon entering the room, Zhu Hayek is amazed to find snow and a large chunk of snow behind the door, wondering about the room's nature. He sits down, digs his hand into the snow, and retrieves a wooden box. Yan Lang's mother warns him about the consequences if he's lost to the constellation, suggesting he could become a servant in their family. He responds indifferently, requesting the glove quickly. Once he wears the gloves, he stands before the deep snow king. The constellation inquires about his identity, but Zhu Hayek deflects the question, demanding the constellation reveal their identity first. Observing him, the constellation finds him familiar, but can't recall where they've met. The constellation then hurls chunks of ice toward Zhu Hayek, who manages to dodge them without magic, surprising the constellation. Afterward, the constellation introduces himself as the Deep Snow King and initiates a snowstorm. The constellation reveals another aspect of himself, known as the Chaos God or Snow Demon. Zhu Hayek introduces himself and they engage in combat. Zhu Hayek uses his magic to summon ice pillars and the constellation attacks him with icicles. Zhu Hayek breaks the icicles with his bare hands and counters with his magic stick. The constellation questions Zhu Hayek's choice of counterattack, boasting about his control over ice and snow. Zhu Hayek rushes toward him, but the constellation seizes his magic stick, revealing Zhu Hayek's strategy to use icicles to obscure his sight. Zhu Hayek retrieves his stick and challenges the constellation, who responds with a forceful magical attack, causing Zhu Hayek to stagger. After the attack, Zhu Hayek identifies the constellation as the martial god Kim Hyano, acknowledging his power despite not knowing him well. He reflects on witnessing Kim Hyano's power firsthand 300 years ago. 300 years ago, he recalls an instance when a large number of monsters attacked him. Despite his efforts, he couldn't handle the massive army of monsters alone, and he contemplated taking down as many monsters as possible with him. That's when he remembers the martial god appearing. He wanted to inquire why the martial god stood before the monsters, but as the martial god wielded his ink-colored sword, his questions faded, leaving only awe. In the present, Kim Ju Hayek asks the martial god if he isn't joining the fight, expressing his desire for a proper battle. Meanwhile, Yan Lang waits for Kim Ju Hayek in the reception room, observed by people through the windows and doors glass panes. Feeling uncomfortable with the attention, Yan Lang reflects on Zhu Hayek's suggestion to rest before heading to the Seol family. Two girls, Seol Yiren and Seol Pei, approach Yan Lang, explaining they came to see her and to apologize for past misunderstandings. Yan Lang questions their intentions, suspecting they're only apologizing out of fear. However, Seol Yiren explains that they were prevented from seeing her earlier by their mother's orders and apologized for leaving her out of the training. Yan Lang is surprised by this revelation, having previously believed they excluded her out of jealousy. Xiao Pei admits to some jealousy but emphasizes their pride in having a strong member like Yan Lang in the Seoul family. They mention their mother's recent calls, which omitted Yan Lang from the training sessions. Fiol Yiren explains to Yan Lang that they lack interest in her, and it would be more accurate to say they shouldn't have any interest in her. Confused, Yan Lang asks for clarification, prompting Seolyeon to intervene, suggesting she could explain. Meanwhile, Kim Jo Hayek and the Deep Snow King engage in a fierce confrontation. As the constellation repeatedly launches ice balls, Kim Jo Hayek finds it annoying and asks if the attacks will continue or if a real attack is coming. The Deep Snow King responds by launching a large ice attack, intending to freeze Kim Jo Hayek completely. Kim Jo Hayek taunts him, but is impressed by the Deep Snow King's strength, realizing he must have been training and breaking through perceptions of strength. Kim Jo Hayek acknowledges the Deep Snow King's strength, but the Deep Snow King replies, cautioning him not to praise insincerely. He reflects that the Deep Snow King must have become stronger through training in the perception of strength, which explains his enhanced abilities compared to their previous encounter. Kim Jo Hayek expresses his regret at not meeting the Deep Snow King sooner, praising him for his increased strength. The Deep Snow King responds by transforming his hand into a large ice hand, declaring that he will overcome Kim Jo Hayek. 
In response, Kim Jo Hyuk launches an attack, but quickly realizes his attempt is futile, admitting defeat and fleeing from the confrontation. Returning to where Seolyeon had given him the glove, she is bewildered by its presence, thinking it's taking longer than expected and considering if the constellation is toying with Kim Jo Hyuk intentionally. Despite knowing that only his mind would suffer damage in the mental realm, he appears unharmed, leaving Seolyeon puzzled. When Kim Jo Hyuk claims victory against her constellation, Seolyeon expresses disbelief, but her doubts are dispelled when a screen displays a message from the deep, Snow King acknowledging Kim Jo Hyuk's victory. Amazed, she still finds it hard to believe that a mere high school student could defeat the guardian constellation of the Seol family. Kim Jo Hyuk suggests she confirm with her constellation again and hints at changing their arrangement regarding Yanlang. Later, Kim Jo Hyuk enters the reception area and approaches Yanlang and the others, expressing surprise at seeing Seoyeon there and confirming her identity as the leader of the White Lotus Association. Yanlang inquires if Kim Jo Hyuk has finished his business, to which he suggests they leave due to the intense gazes in the room, promising to explain on the way, and they depart together. As they walk along the path, Yanlang speaks to him with a heavy heart, expressing her concern that he returned much faster than expected, implying that he must have lost and endured hardship, especially without divine protection and facing a constellation alone. He chooses not to disclose anything and continues to listen to her. She then inquires if Seolyeon HWA mentioned any conditions in case of his loss. He affirms, admitting that she did mention that he would become the servant of the Seol family if he lost. Troubled, Yan Lang questions what he means by becoming the servant of the Seol family. He smiles at her words, finds her reaction amusing, and ponders what her response would be if he were to reveal the truth. Yan Lang expresses regret, stating that she should have stopped him, having heard about Seol Yon Hwa's ambitions and recklessness from her elder sisters and aunt. She explains how Seol Yon Hwa's obsession with maintaining her position as patriarch led her to view even her own children as threats, resulting in strict supervision and isolation for Yan Long due to her talent. She remarks on the irony of even the family's guardian constellation sharing Seol Yon Hwa's mindset. Yan Lang clarifies that she never intended to become the family patriarch, but he interrupts her, deciding to end the speculation and reveal the truth. He won against her constellation. She expresses disbelief, stating that he must be joking. He insists that he doesn't joke about serious matters like this. Explaining the situation, he reveals that the entire issue began because her constellation summoned her after she left the White Lotus Palace, indicating that the constellation seemed uninterested in managing the family. Recounting his conversation with the Deep Snow King, he mentions asking the king why he summoned Yanlang, to which the king responds that it is upon the request of the current patriarch of the Seol family. According to the king, the patriarch wants her youngest daughter to receive divine protection, although she keeps refusing, hence seeking the constellation's intervention. Kim Ju Hayek questions if that is all, mentioning that he heard the king abandoned Yanlang before. Surprised, the king denies any such action, claiming it to be his first time hearing about it and expressing shock. Kim Ju Hayek accuses the constellation of being manipulated by the patriarch for her own greed, stating that she uses confusing and deceptive tactics to serve her selfish desires. Yan Lang, astonished, listens with her mouth hanging open. He clarifies that the patriarch deceives both the soul family and the constellation for her own benefit, ultimately ruining Yan Lang's life in her pursuit of becoming the family patriarch. He then reveals that he instructs the king to annul the contract made between the constellation and the family patriarch. Seol Yon HWA, unaware of the contract's dissolution, is informed through a screen that the contact with the Deep Snow King is terminated. He informs her that she won't amount to anything anymore, especially not as a family patriarch, so there is no need for her to get her hands dirty. Upon hearing this, she expresses her gratitude for his efforts. He then states that with no remaining issues concerning her Seol family, she can focus on her physical training. A man in a black mask asks if he should continue following them, to which he replies in the negative, instructing him to instead search for that person's enemy. In the Grand Cult's hideout, there are four people wearing masks seated around the table. Among them, a girl with purple hair questions the reason for their gathering and the matter at hand. A white-haired boy responds, stating they are present for Lord Constellation's summon. The girl asks him why Lord Constellation is now searching for Kim Ju Hayek's enemies, considering that the initial order is to kill him. 
He responds, suggesting that perhaps Constellation has changed his plan. She then inquires about the first person to move after receiving the order, and one of them admits it's him. She further questions what Kim Jo Hyuk, their target, does. He explains that Kim Jo Hyuk is a very strange individual and shares that he has investigated. According to him, he can't find anything special, only that Kim Jo Hyuk is raised in an orphanage without the knowledge of his parents. This information is obtained from a trusted investigation company, ensuring its reliability. Afterward, he follows Kim Jo Hyuk and awaits Lord Constellation's order to eliminate him. However, he clarifies that Kim Jo Hyuk manages to defeat both the Seoul family's descendants and the patriarch. They are shocked by this revelation, and he informs them that his elimination order is suspended. Upon defeating the Seoul family's guardian constellation, Lord Constellation directs him to search for Kim Jong Hyuk's enemy instead. Astonished by this turn of events, they confirm with him if he has indeed defeated the guardian constellation. Subsequently, a screen appears in front of him with the message stating belligerent devil asks if the storage stone is ready. He confirms that the storage stone is prepared, and they present a purple stone. Then he asks them if they have found the enemies of that person. They confirm that there are three organizations in a hostile relationship with Kim Jong Hyuk. The Ventric family, the Seoul fanatic family, and the superior race are mentioned. The Seoul fanatic family and the superior race are both classified as evil organizations, while the Ventric family is considered a prestigious family in England. Regarding the Ventric family, they suddenly adopt a friendly stance towards him. One of them adds that maybe they made some kind of deal after the Ventric family raid, but it cannot be said they are his enemy now. The Purple Head girls further add that although they have not shown any hostile movement yet, there is a rumor that an evil organization called Complete Burial is targeting Kim Ju Hyuk. The white-headed person asks him if those people are trying to raise the name value, she replies, saying maybe. After hearing all this, their Lord Constellation announces that he will issue an order to slay his enemies. When Kim jo Yuk is going for a training exercise, he receives messages from Choi Aran telling him she needs to go back to her house to get something. He starts pondering over why she wants to bring something important from her house, hoping it could be a holy relic or something valuable. Since the Choijin family's constellation may be his disciple after fighting against the Seol family's constellation, he also checked the relics that the Seol family had collected, but none of them were special. While stretching with Yu Soyan and Yanlang, he thinks that the catastrophe is imminent, and considering the Tower of Destruction, each of his disciples is crucial, but time is running out. He contemplates whether he should also check the White Lotus Association, as he heard they possess several holy relics. Just then, someone calls him from behind, addressing him as Sir Kim Ju Hayuk. He turns around to see the person with a black mask standing there. Zhu Hayuk asks him what he has to say, to which he replies that due to many eyes watching, they should step outside to talk. He walks with him and tells them both that before he returns, they can spar between themselves. Hearing this, they both start arguing with each other. Yanlang expresses confidence in winning easily, while Yu Soyan responds by asking if he knows who she is. She states that since he doesn't know her identity, they should fight first. They both stand in the corridor, and the person wearing a mask introduces himself, saying he is from Market. The other person responds that he figured that out after looking at his mask and costume. However, he questions if the Market, a place where anonymity was granted, should maintain its credibility when users are called out like this at the Academy. He urges the person to take responsibility for potential damage. The masked person tries to calm him down, stating that he has something to give. He hands her a letter, and she informs him that it is from the true owner of the market. Hayat clarifies that the true owner is a constellation known as the master behind the scenes, the one who created the market. The masked person confirms and requests them to read the letter's content. If they can respond, he suggests coming to the market since their constellation will be waiting. He then excuses himself and leaves. Arch asks him if the letter came from the constellation, and he confirms it, opening the letter to see its contents. Unable to understand it, Barch asks for clarification. He explains that he needs to go to the market because he is the one who made the characters written in the letter. While looking at his mobile, he walks towards the road that leads to the black market. Barch remarks that he seems to have been going out quite frequently lately without needing permission. He explains that he has already made a deal with the instructor Lilia. Barch then inquires if he is the one who created the character used in the letter. 
he confirms that he is. When asked why, he replies that it is part of his training, adding that it is embarrassing and suggesting to forget about it unless they want him to enter the mental world or crush them. Afterward, he enters the cafe where inside, he stands looking at a door before opening it and walking into the market. Lost in thought, he reflects on the purple sky, attributing its appearance to the person he is about to meet, reminiscent of the sky he remembers from 300 years ago. As he ponders, someone calls out to him, addressing him as Sir Kim Jo Hayek and inquiring if he is there because of the letter. He confirms this and asks where he should go next. The person offers to guide him, noting his lack of a mask. However, he assures them not to worry as he will lead them through their secret passageway. They proceed to the Market District 7 building, where a man stands facing the window, prompting him to wonder if the man is a black cat. Barch directs his attention to the building outside the window, pointing out that the yellow parts of the buildings are band notes. When asked if there was a building there when he first came, he admits he can't remember. The man facing the window turns his head and greets him, asking if he has brought the answer to the letter. He responds that there is no fixed answer to the letter, prompting the man to inquire further about his statement. He informs him that he doesn't believe he comprehends the situation and requests a pen and paper. Bringing them closer, he inwardly anticipates another potential failure. There are suspicions surrounding five individuals selling the ring, and among those, the three who responded to the letter were deemed impostors, incurring the wrath of the constellation. Kim Jo Hayek writes something on the paper and presents it to him. Observing it, he perceives a resemblance to the characters in the letter. He inquires about the content and its significance. Ju Hayek responds that it translates to no. Subsequently, a screen displays the message that the master behind the scenes said no. Interpreting this, he conveys that confirmation has been obtained, emphasizing the urgency of meeting with the constellation promptly. He then provides him with a stick containing a purple stone, advising him to grasp it for transportation to the Lord Constellation's world of mental images. Determinedly, he seizes the purple stick and finds himself transported to the world of mental images, where he encounters a woman with long hair standing before him. She recognizes him by his magic power and remarks that despite his altered appearance, she can discern his identity through his magic power. Upon seeing Ju Hayuk, he acknowledges their reunion with a smile, addressing him as a lunatic. The woman expresses her joy and enthusiasm, respectfully bowing down to greet him as her master, stating her eagerness for his presence. He reassures her that there is no need for formalities and invites her to stand. She inquires if he still recalls the characters to which he affirms, stating his role in their creation and reminiscing about their encounter 300 years ago. She embarked on a journey down memory lane, reliving the events of her incarceration three centuries prior. In her recollection, she depicted herself as a young girl, her eyes shrouded by cascading locks of hair. Hayono, whom she affectionately dubbed a moron, emerged as her unlikely savior, liberating her from the confines of imprisonment and subsequently pledging his loyalty as her disciple. Initially, he observed her struggle with communication, noting her reliance on gestures rather than language or script. Despite his persistent attempts to impart knowledge, she adamantly resisted the acquisition of even the most rudimentary characters. Undeterred by her resistance, Hyun Oh harbored hopes that igniting her interest in writing would serve as a gateway to mastering language and characters, laying the groundwork for future instruction in martial arts and other disciplines. Upon learning of his aspirations, she responds with a mixture of laughter and gratitude, acknowledging her indebtedness to him for unlocking the world of speech and writing. In a heartfelt letter, she bears her emotions, expressing her longing for him and proposing marriage upon their eventual reunion. However, his response is swift and unequivocal with no. When pressed for an explanation, he cites the turbulent state of the world, deeming it an inopportune time for such discussions. Despite her understanding, frustration simmers beneath the surface at the postponement of their plans. She gestures towards the structure outside, revealing it to be a testament to her devotion, a sanctuary meticulously crafted for his benefit. Yet, he politely declines her offer, citing a reluctance to take up residence there. Her frustration reaches a boiling point at his refusal, demanding an explanation. He reluctantly reveals that circumstances have only worsened during their time apart, prompting him to remain cautious. She inquires why he declines to inhabit the building and expresses her frustration with him. He looks at her and explains that her anger is the reason he affectionately nicknamed her lunatic. 
She repeatedly asks why he cannot stay, prompting him to tap her on the head and advise her to calm down. Saddened, she questions whether he appreciates her gift and reminds him that she crafted it according to his preferences. Surprised, he asks when he requested a building filled with money. She recalls a conversation from three years ago where he expressed a desire to live in such a building. She asks if it was his dream and he confirms it, explaining his wish to be buried in money when there is peace. He urges her to start training if she understands. She resolves to make her dream come true and reveals that she constructed the building as a first step toward fulfilling his dream. When asked if she knew he was coming, she explained that she received a notification informing her of his reincarnation. He thinks she is already quite eccentric and reminds her that peace has not yet arrived. She becomes saddened by the prospect of the Tower of Destruction reappearing and expresses frustration at his newfound comfort while she remains unsettled. He explains that he also cannot stay due to his own reasons and mentions he is currently residing in the Valhalla dormitory. She expresses her understanding to the master and then asks him to extend his hand. He complies, and she presents him with a ring, explaining that it is the grand owner ring of the market. She informs him that with the ring, he holds all the rights of the market, enabling him to engage in trading and manage market funds more easily. She assures him that the ring will be ready to assist him whenever needed and encourages him to use it without hesitation. He expresses gratitude while holding the ring and reflects on how he seems to be receiving rings frequently lately. After thanking her, he leaves the place. The person with the mask remains, and a screen appears in front of him with a message that states the master behind the scene inquires if the person has left. He responds affirmatively, mentioning that the person went to the Valhalla Academy. Another message appears on the screen titled Master Behind Scene says she needs to buy Valhalla Academy. After reading the message, he wonders if it pertains to Kim Jo Hayek. Additionally, he contemplates how Lord Constellation bestowed the market's grand honor ring upon Kim Jo Hayek, a 17-year-old high school student. He questions the strong relationship between Kim Jo Hayek and Lord Constellation. And after a moment of thought, he asks what kind of relationship Sir Kim Jo Hayek has with Lord Constellation. She responds by saying that he is her heaven. Destroyer Logan expresses his fury at the Soul Fanatics for harming his son, Logan Jr. declaring that everyone will perish. The girl with purple hair and her companion observe the situation, noting that Logan is seeking revenge for his son's attack. They decide to leave the minor threat to him and focus on targeting their leader instead. Dragon King Hannibal, leader of the Soul Fanatics, finds himself in an unfamiliar space after hearing an explosion and someone breaking in. He realizes he's not in an office and wonders if he has been transferred to some sort of space. Suddenly, someone magically attacks his heart, expressing annoyance at the sound of his heartbeat. 